System check, system check. Are you able to hear me? We are receiving you in Salt Lake. Uh, we're confirming again that audio is present on YouTube. Please stand by. Salt Lake, could you please let us know? Please stand by. Yes, we are looking for confirmation now. We did have caption service on YouTube. Uh, so We're getting major echo now. Checking system. Ogden, are you hearing echo just when Salt Lake addresses the body or... Are you hearing echo? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Please stand by. Internal check, internal check. Checking YouTube audio pathway. This is just a check. Please stand by. In Salt Lake. I mean, in Ogden. Ogden, could you please confirm the audio pathway on the second laptop that's joined? See if it's injecting sound. We believe audio has been restored to YouTube. We are still hearing an echo coming from you. We are hearing ourselves back to the meeting now. Please stand by. Salt Lake is still verifying circuits. Yeah, it's still echo present. System check, system check. We got you. It's sounding a little better, but still light echo. Still hearing ourselves coming through the
Thank you for your patience. Audio check, audio check. It's still sounding echoey. Uh, stand by one minute, I'm checking. Uh, negative. I was able to copy through the cell phone connection, but no audio was transmitted into Google Meet. Signal check, testing one, two, check, check. Jody, your laptop has the audio muted and everything. Testing one, two. Carmen, if you could please send me a text confirmation that Echo has dissipated. Again, Carmen, please send me a QC report. Testing one, two. Check, check, check. Thank you, Carmen, for the confirmation. We are still checking auxiliary systems. We appreciate everyone standing by. Testing one, two, check, check.
We appreciate everyone's patience. There's about a 30 second delay before the audio hits YouTube. We're still tracking down where the duplication is occurring. System check, testing one, two. Ogden, could we please get a sound sample, an audio check from Ogden? Ogden, this is Carmen on a remote. Can you give us an audio check?
Signal path check, signal check. Audio check, audio check. Thank you for your patience and standing by. We are resetting some gear in Ogden. We're still under a technical hold resolving our technology issue this evening. Thanks for your patience.
thank you for your patience. We're still working through an equipment issue. Uh, we will report back in another minute. Technicians are remotely assisting us. Um, please stand by. Ogden, we copied the chimes. It appears there is some type of connection, but we're uh, unable to uh, hear your audio, Chairman.
We are still trying to restore audio service with our Ogden location. All right, well, we'll just keep moving along. Um, the process will go as far as, so as we get to each of our agenda items, we'll first ask if there's any questions for members of the room. That is annoying. Members of Iraq. After the, the questions from the members of the RAC, we'll then turn time over to members of the audience. If you have questions for the vision personnel that is presenting, you have that opportunity to, to ask them questions. After that, we'll then go into comment period. Um, um, after the, we'll first do the, uh, I got it's been so long since we went, we'll first do the public comment period and then we'll go to co comments from the RAC. We'll then at that time move towards motions. Um, again, everyone's had the opportunity. So as our di division employees come up, they will not be presenting the agenda item. Everyone's had an opportunity to watch that online, I hope, and have that explained. There will, again, you will have some time maybe to ask questions to clarify a few things. Um, so with that, I'm first, first going to call for an approval to, for the agenda. Let's do both the minute, I'll call, we've already began the meeting, we'll call for uh, a motion to, well, does anyone have an opportunity to look at the minutes? I guess I should ask from last meeting. Was there any questions or anything on, on our minutes from our last RAC meeting that would have taken place in December? So with that, I'd move to look for a, a, a motion to approve both today's agenda and the minutes from our last meeting. I'll move to approve the agenda and the minutes. I'll second. I'll second. Okay. So we have a, a motion from Randy to approve the minutes and the agenda and a second. Um, I'll put Mike on this one. All right, I'm also gonna ask that we speak into the mic or try to pull those microphones towards you. It seems like we have to get fairly close. If, if for any reason, if you're not able to hear us out there, if someone might mention that, that would be great. Okay. Um, this time I'm going to turn the time over to Ben Nadowski to go over the wildlife board meeting update. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, it's been a while since we've been here. We were, uh, Rewind back in time, we had our December RAC meeting, so we'll review the, <clears throat> excuse me, the January uh, board meeting. Um, in our December RAC, we uh, heard about the Utah Prairie Dog uh, Conservation Strategy and Rule Amendments. Uh, that passed as presented uh, unanimously with Wade, he Wade Heaton excused. Um, for the uh, bear recommendations, there was a motion to ask the division to remove the mandatory orientation course to apply and instead make it mandatory for those who draw a permit, uh, similar to the archery ethics course, and that it should become effective in 2024. That motion passed unanimously with Wade Heaton excused. Um, there were a couple small fixes in the uh, plan at the time asking that we remove the barrel allowance and ask the division to work with land management agencies on some issues that also passed unanimously and we need an excuse on that one. Uh, there was a motion that asked Kyle Maynard, who's our uh, attorney general's office representative to work with the division to strengthen the rule language and bring the new language back through the rack and board uh, process that also passed unanimously with we heat and excused. And then, uh, Motion to accept the remaining recommendations as presented with the inclusion of a mid-year plan review. Also passed unanimously with Wade Heaton excused. Um, for the fur bear and bobcat season dates, uh, motion was to ask the division to look into a trap fee increase for non-residents for 2024 and place that item on the action log. That passed unanimously. And then a motion to approve the 2023 fur bear and bobcat season dates as presented passed unanimously. And oh, also uh, finally move to accept the cougar update as presented and that passed unanimously. Thanks. All right, thank you. Any questions from members of the RAC about that update? Ben, we'll let you continue to have the mic if you'd give us our regional update at this time. Okay, I'm glad there were no questions because that was a long time ago. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Okay, so I'll try to make my regional update rather quick uh, since we've been here for a while already. Mike, if you'll advance to the next slide. 
Um, the main point that I want to make tonight, and I hope to, I was really hoping to kind of set a tone other than the tone of frustration and fear that everything wouldn't work tonight, um, is that we know, we all know, obviously, we've had a really hard winter, a really long winter. Speaking on behalf of our staff, um, we've never had an experience like this. And I just really want to take an opportunity to thank the people that work for the division and the volunteers that help support the division throughout the winter. Um, this was a winter like nothing else. And we couldn't have done it without having people that are 100% committed to the work that we do, 100% committed to the resource and to each other. So I really want to thank everybody that's been involved in our wildlife team. Um, a big lift for the region was obviously deer feeding. We ended up putting 49 sites together. It was amazing how quickly it comes together when you have incredibly talented staff and incredibly passionate and talented um, support from volunteers. We were able to feed 5,800 5, deer and distribute 475 tons of feed so far. Um, we do still have uh, spring deer classification starting in Box Elder and soon we'll be doing it in other units. It's kind of based on conditions and we'll also be starting our sharp tail and sage grouse so that counts. Um, we've already been counting in Box Elder where access allows, but we'll soon be doing it in other areas and other units as well. Um, We'll, um, we're complete with the box elder uh, pronghorn surveys and we'll complete the Rich County pronghorn surveys soon too. Next slide. Um, so beyond just feeding, um, we also have had an, an, an immense amount of workload for nuisance um, and mortality and uh, depredation calls. This time of year, um, over the last four years, we average about 1400 calls a year for calls for service. And we have a small team of employees that are dedicated to, to answering those calls. Um, this year we're at 2,400 calls. And just so far this, this month, I think we're at like 400 calls already. So that's, each one of these calls is more than just picking up an animal that's on the side of the highway. It's also a lot of times they're responding to public safety concerns, um, taking care of injured or dying wildlife and uh, they require an immediate response. They don't happen from nine to five, Monday through Friday either. So we've had employees working seven days a week, 24 hours a day on call. And um, in addition to that level of workload um, and still working to help support feed sites, um, still working to make sure that we have recommendations for tonight, still making sure that we've got all of our administrative um, responsibilities in place we also have a lot of depredation happening and <clears throat> it's been a hard winter not only for wildlife but for producers around the state and we've been working really hard to get everything that we possibly can for those uh, producers and it's been a really hard winter because it's 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 hard on the wildlife but it's hard on their livelihood for those folks and um, a lot of emotion comes with a lot of those phone calls so i commend our staff for the professionalism that they've shown in the face of all of that pressure and conflict throughout the year um next slide if you would mike uh, we're also were able to track 319 turkeys and, re and relocate them mainly out of the ogden valley and cache valley areas uh taken them out to the northeast region and the hardware wma as you know we've had a lot of mortality that's all built into our recommendations tonight that you'll see and for each one of the mortalities uh our biologists have gone out found the mortality location evaluated um, cause specific mortality and uh, and they got to make sure they get there immediately so that you know all of the evidence for lack of a better term is, is preserved and they can get a better evaluation so our people are just running ragged all over the place and um, just super impressed with them rosie finch banding is wrapping up this week as well uh, for our non-game biologists uh, <clears throat> so all of the feeding and nuisance um, depredation still doing our biology work. Um, it's not just our wildlife section, it's a region-wide effort and it wouldn't be possible without our support from every other section, especially law enforcement right now. Um, we are welcoming in some new officers. We've got some new employees in the region and they're probably wondering what they got themselves into with this being their first year, but um, we are super excited to have Cash Hancock. If you don't know Cash, he's a Weber County boy. Worked for us in waterfowl management for a number of years. Just a really hard worker, um, really blue collar, got a great instinct on him. Uh, he just bleeds brown. He is just a, a division kind of a guy and we're really excited to welcome here. 
Um, when we had our shed antler closure and our um, we've got our seasonal WMA closures and we've got feed sites that are congregating deer, there's a lot of public and a lot of eyes on those animals. And we got a lot of requests that we would make sure that we put a lot of diligence on top of all of that through our law enforcement officers. And we put over 2000 hours on our shed antler action plan since February. Every spare minute of time uh, has been put into uh, patrols by our officers to make sure that people are following the law. We know there's exceptions, but they've done a really good job. Um, they've talked with 1700 people, um, issued 73 violations and wrote 278 reports as well. So a lot of uh, enforcement to ensure that the decisions that we make are uh, protecting our, our herds the way that they're intended. So hats off to those guys. And still finding a way to make it all the way up to the uh, Highline Trail in the Uintas and remove snow from the tops of our cabins so they aren't crushed. This is just a picture of 14 feet of snow on the top of our cabin that our officers dug us out of last week. This is the case for most of our facilities that are uh, at high elevation. So we got to make sure we visit those and make sure they're, they're still with us this summer. Next. Our Quags team uh, finished a pretty big project up in Cache Valley on the Blacksmith Fork to ensure fish passage uh, at the Nibley Diversion, but also to ensure efficient water delivery infrastructure. Um, they just wrapped up their walleye spawn, which is an annual effort and it has statewide impacts, but they, they shoot for around 8 million eggs to collect and they got 13 and a half million this year, just four days time. And that will equate to about five to seven million fry that will be stocked back into Willard Bay and the balance will be used for waters around the state. And we're about to fire up our Swan Creek fish trap so we can collect eggs at the Bear Lake Cutthroat Trout, uh, from Bear Lake Cutthroat Trout. Next slide. And speaking of Bear Lake, we're really excited to welcome Emily Wright to the team. Um, Emily comes to us with an awesome background, um, a BS in wildlife management for Utah State. She's currently at Utah State finishing her master's degree. She worked at Bear Lake for about five years, um, learned a ton from Scott Tolentino, for those of you that know him. And so we were kind of able to hit the ground running by having Emily on the team. She's got a really broad experience and skills, really passionate about um, geographic information systems and mapping, um, really good at the fisheries analysis and aquatic ecosystem restoration. So we're super excited to have her and making matters even better. She's a Garden City local, so she's got a lot of contacts with uh, local officials and local uh, constituents. In our outreach section, we reported the last meeting that the sleigh rides were back at hardware. Um, Havlin's Old West Adventures was our uh, concessionaire that, that won the bid for the RFP. They were able to get more than 24,000 people through uh, those sleigh rides. That is a, a, a record attendance. So big, big props to those guys for the work that they did. It was incredible. Um, they gave a lot of people that unique chance to, to learn about our operation, but we were also able to come up with a new script and teach people about the importance of wildlife management areas uh, in Utah. Next slide. We're also implementing a, a camping season at Hardware Ranch. Um, the changes are, are intended to make habitat better for wildlife. That's exactly what the wildlife, the management area is for. This is a picture of what camping areas look like when traditionally in the uh, early spring when the camping areas opened up. Uh, this year we're protecting those areas so that uh, they can dry out. Right now they're still under snow, but the normal year will give an opportunity to dry out before we allow people to use those areas. So a camping season is gonna protect a lot of habitats and and limit a lot of damage in those areas. Uh, next slide. Uh, of course, you're probably aware that we did extend our uh, WMA closure to, uh, to, match the, uh, to match the shed antler closure. So our WMAs will remain closed through April 30th. The intent and purpose of those properties is to protect big game for winter range. And uh, so we're gonna, while those animals still need access to that winter range, they still need to be uh, resting and protected. We're gonna extend that uh, closure through April, April 30th. Next. Uh, one of the things that has been kind of back burner because we've all been hopping 24 seven on so many emergency things is the Cinnamon Creek Wildlife Management Area. Uh, we're still intending to convene a management planning committee. Uh, Daniel Olson on our team, our habitat manager will be sending those invitations out uh, shortly if they haven't already gone out today. Next slide. We still do have vacancies on the team. Our assistant manager position in the habitat section is still open. And we lost one employee over the winter to a higher paying position. So we still need an assistant maintenance specialist and we've got seasonal employees that we're gonna have to hire shortly. 
Great Salt Lake International News. Um, we've started our spring water bird surveys and we're coordinating a regional shorebird survey for the Pacific Flyway. The good news is the lake is already up three feet. Um, they've built that coffer dam under the causeway and so water's filling in the south arm quite quickly and we're already up three feet on the south side. Uh, I don't know what the current salinity level is, but the intent is to reduce salinity by doing that. So if we aren't already, we should be shortly. 15%. 15%, perfect, thank you. It was 19 and some change? Yeah, the uh, things started dying at 19% and it was at 19% at the end of the year. Yep. So we were at our biological threshold. And so we're thankful we have a biological control measure to put that coffer dam under the, uh, under the trestle there. So the lake is up three feet, salinity is down, water's starting to spill into the north arm, I hope. If it isn't now, it will be soon. Um, but we still haven't had the runoff and we still have a lot of water to fill the lake. So that's great news. Um, Brian shrimp are already starting, are having a delayed hatch, but I'm told that that hatch timing will start to normalize. Hogden Bay Waterfowl Management Area, um, massive preparations for massive flows. So all of the water that goes to the Great Salt Lake has to pass through Farmington Bay and Ogden Bay and all of our other waterfowl management areas. So we've been coordinating really closely with um, a number of emergency management teams throughout uh, the Davis and Weber County and Box Elder County areas. Um, our head gates have been wide open for months, but we've got log jams that we're removing on the hourly basis. And here's just some pictures of the log jams that gather within about an hour. That's how fast the water's coming to us now. Um, we've done tons of channel clearing and preparation ahead of this over the winter and, and preparing for this runoff period. And we certainly couldn't have done it without partnership from Ducks Unlimited. Um, they've been really helpful in securing some federal grants, some NACA grants. And we've got a $660,000 project that came just in time. Um, it's still gonna have to be finished after the runoff, but with that grant, we were able to shore up a number of our levees and those levees have um, a critical role to play to, to route water to the lake. And they also protect um, electrical infrastructure that allows us to operate our head gates. So huge thanks to Ducks Unlimited for helping us um, protect some critical infrastructure that we're really hopeful holds. And the area at Ogden Bay, where the South Run is, is currently closed all public access, one for the construction, but two for all of the high flows. So things are getting real. It's an emergency situation. So uh, we're keeping people out of that area. Same circumstances at Farmington Bay, although uh, different timing and different pressures, um, but we're well into the emergency flood preparation stages there. We've lowered water levels in all of our impoundments and we're ready to receive water. Working closely with Davis County and Farmington City, and we're clearing debris at the Burnham Dam site. Um, closely coordinating with private uh, waterfowl clubs in the Jordan River on the expected flows and trail closures there are imminent. We'll be removing footbridges and closing foot traffic for uh, flows to come through. We expect there to be some pretty significant uh, discharge there. All of this doesn't happen without support at the office from our administrative team. Um, the big game draw is underway until Thursday the 27th. Um, we're doing all of this during a regional office remodel. Most people don't know that the Northern Region Office was the first regional office in the state. And we were there, so we're working in the original bones and uh, we were well overdue for a remodel. So we started that remodel before the winter hit us and all of our team are, are shoved into the old fisheries trailer in the back of the office. Um, they're making do and they're pretty happy, but it's been a really um, chaotic experience to have everybody spread out and in new, new places while we've been dealing with 24 seven um, emergencies, but they're doing a really good job of making do. They're still training new licensed vendors and getting all of our out, um, hunter ed instructors outfitted for the year. And one thing that is really important to mention with all of the service that our employees have been providing, it doesn't happen without our front desk providing the customer service. We're, our front desk phones are ringing off the hook. And if you just sit in the office for a little while, you hear the nature of the conversations and it's just one after another after another. And we've got three or four people on the phone just fielding all of these calls for services. But oftentimes there's, they're just taking so much, um, so much abuse and there's just so much conflict coming from some of these calls. And it's, it's not fair, it's not okay. Um, our people are professionals and they deserve to be treated like professionals and with, um, with, with some kindness. But uh, those guys have done an incredible job fielding all of the calls for services. As always, I'll just end it with rack member opportunities. We've got the postseason deer classifications coming up. 
um, the big game aerial captures um, continuing and fisheries will be firing up with electric fishing and gillnet surveys at reservoirs. So if any of those things interest any of you guys, um, you're always welcome. Okay, sorry, I tried to cruise through that as fast as I could. We got a long night ahead. If there's questions, I'm happy to answer. Does anyone have any questions for, for Ben on that? All right, thank you very much. So we'll go ahead and move forward on our First agenda item or action item of the evening, which is uh, agenda item number five, the deer permit recommendations for 2023. I will ask if Dax Mangus, our big game coordinator, if he could come forward, please. And again, everyone's had the opportunity to watch his presentation. Just as he's coming up here, hopefully if, if you weren't aware, yesterday a working session took place and those are very, very helpful you have an opportunity to, to watch those and, and get a chance to hear a little bit of, you know, where the information that uh, the division employees are using to make the recommendations that they do. And so even after tonight, if you have questions or anything, I, I recommend that some of you go and it's on YouTube, you can watch that and it'll really help clarify. And you'll hear a lot of questions also asked by the wildlife board members and others that really clarified a lot of things, questions that I had be, coming into tonight. So anyway, with that, I'll turn the time over to Iraq. Any questions that you may have for Dax concerning these recommendations for, yep. for Mule Deer? Mr. Chairman? Yes. If it's all right, maybe just in, Please. Just, just begin by, by uh, <clears throat> saying um, at, at a certain point in time, we, we had to move forward, make recommendations and, and submit those and, and move forward into the public process. And this winter has been very unusual. You know, we're, we're in uncharted territory and uh, we do not want to diminish the input or role from the racks. But one of the commitments that, that we've made and, that, and uh, the direction we wanna move forward on this is if we continue to monitor survival, uh, our biologists have been monitoring that closely, um, looking at what's happening with deer specifically and, and have anticipated where we would be based on kind of the trajectory of the data and comparing to previous years. And this year is very unusual. It's hard to compare a year like this with, with previous years. So uh, you know, I already have a meeting scheduled with all the biologists uh, uh, right before the board meeting, uh, just a few days before the board meeting. And if we see that survival estimates, you know, survival has, has ended up worse than we anticipated, we, we plan to go to the board with adjusted recommendations. And our recommendations are are designed to meet the objectives in the management plans. So, you know, we're not trying to pull a fast one. We don't want to diminish input from the racks, but I just want to be upfront with you and tell you that that we we're we're hoping to reserve the right to make adjustments if we see that survival ends up being worse than we had anticipated. And April can be a tough month, especially in a year where winter hangs on as long as it has this year. So. Okay. I just recognized or just realized that we are back online. So I just wanted to recognize that we do have Emily Jensko and also Matthew Clar from our RAC that are now be joining us. Um, Matthew, are you able to, to hear that? Yes, I'm here. Okay, and Emily as well? Yep. Okay, thank you. So I didn't realize they, they were here and so I wanna welcome them to the, to the meeting, so. Well, that, that, that's great, great, great that they're with, just <laughs> <laughs> We could have had you entertaining us this whole time we were waiting if we'd have known you were a comedian. <laughs> Sorry, we're going to have to take another 20 minute break. No. I heard a comment of where your head was usually at in a meeting <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> so, no. Thank you. I guess for those, those who are joining us online, also, we are now in our first agenda item. So, welcome those online who are joining the meeting. So, with that, um, We'll turn some time over for some questions, yes. Dax, will you go, can you explain in the modeling that we use what factors and inputs there are when we're looking at, it's not just buck to doe ratios, what else is in that model? Yeah, so just quick overview. We, we manage bucks well within some pretty wide biological sideboards. You know, you, you do have to have a certain number of bucks, you know, on, on the minimum end to make sure that all your does get bred. Um, on the top end, if you're dealing with a resource limited population, carrying a whole bunch of extra buck can actually start to impede herd productivity, impact it. So there are some biological sideboards. 
all the buck to doe ratios that we've managed to, which are a post season. So after the hunts, biologists go out and classify and see, you know, uh, this ratio of, of bucks per, per hundred does. You know, those are, like I said, they're, they're between these wide biological sideboards. So those buck to doe ratios at, that, at this point are more of a, a social consideration where we're managing a buck to doe ratio is a good way to, it's a good surrogate for availability of bucks and, uh, and a surrogate for kind of the quality of the hunt, to, to, to use that word. Um, when, when we make recommendations, we're making recommendations to manage to those buck to doe ratios, the objectives that we have set in our management plans. Um, we have better data available now than any time ever before in the Division of Wildlife. With all the GPS collar studies that we have across the state, we have over a thousand adult deer, several hundred um, uh, fawns that we track survival on those animals. And so we have really good data. We keep a close look on that to, to see what's happening with our populations and fawn recruitment. And so our biologists collect the buck to doe ratio information, they collect that data. And then when it comes time to make recommendations for the permits for the, for the upcoming year, we look at what is the composition of our population? What, uh, what did we have for fawn production and what do we anticipate for fawn recruitment and adult survival? So what deer do we anticipate will be there and will be harvested in the coming year? And by using those numbers, we, we essentially model or, or anticipate what's, what's gonna survive and what will get harvested in the coming year. And then we set permit numbers so that after the coming year's harvest, um, we'll come in at that buck to doe ratio. And in the past, the division used, uh, we looked at like three year trends in buck to doe ratio. And it was more of a reactive recommendation. When we saw the buck to doe ratios going up, we would recommend an increase in permit. And a lot of times those increases were kind of an arbitrary number, like 10%. Why 10%? Well, 10% sounds like a nice even number. You know? So, but, but now uh, it's not perfect. It, it's still, you know, we're anticipating what things will be, but we're trying to use this really high quality data to manage specifically to these objectives and to manage proactively rather than reactively. Instead of waiting for a buck to the ratio to increase and then increasing permits or waiting for a buck to the ratio to decrease and then decreasing permits, we can anticipate where we're gonna be and then make that recommendation. And it's not perfect, but we've been doing this for a few years now and it's pretty close. It's pretty, you know, it tracks pretty close. We've been coming really close to hitting those targets. And as we continue to collect more data and, and refine this model, it, it's, it's, it's proven to be a pretty good, a pretty good tool it does result in, in more dramatic swings in permit numbers sometimes. If we have a really bad survival year or a really good survival year, you know, we might see permit numbers go up or down more than they have in the past. But that's, that's what we're doing and our biologists are looking at all these different pieces of data when they formulate a recommendation. Does that, does that answer your question, Brad? Yeah, that was part of it. And then I'm, I'm just curious, do we go back I guess, and validate the accuracy of the model when we take our next count. Does yeah. that make sense? Like yeah. To say the model was 85% right or something like that. I mean, we have an idea of what that might look like on average. So I, I, I don't have that for the whole state, but I, I know I looked at it really closely these last few weeks for the Southern region, because there's been a lot of questions about permits in Southern region. Um, and this region's a little different because you have some of these units that are dominated by private land. And so we end up with a higher buck to the ratio on some of these units, typically just because of limited access. Southern region, it's more of a you know, public land, that type of thing, um, where there's a lot of good access. And so, you know, one, one to look at, I think a good example, the Pine Valley unit um, a couple of years ago, it was at 4,100 permits. We saw that due to drought, we were not recruiting um, animals into the population and we were gonna come up short on bucks if we kept permit numbers high. So we recommended a huge cut from 4,100 to 1,700 permits, which is way more dramatic than the kind of cuts we've ever made in the past. Uh, the next, that next fall after the, after the big permit cut down to 1,700, our biologist uh, for that unit put in a huge effort, classified over 2,000 deer um, during the rut on the winter range, and the buck to the ratio came in at 19. So right there in between that 18 to 20, which is the objective for that unit. I looked through all the ones in the southern region and uh, I think they have eight or nine general season deer units on that region. And we were within or above the buck to doe ratio on uh, seven, seven of the nine. We had two that we were just, we were within one buck 
to dough in that ratio just below all the other ones we were at or above. So it's not perfect, but it's better data. It's a better tool than anything we've ever had before in the past. Uh, when you look at the condition of the herd, especially after this winter, I just my own personal curiosity is the biologists, are the biologists able to determine what, how many does are not even going to deliver because of their poor uh, condition and, and not have a, a fawn? So we, our biologists, when they respond to the cause specific mortality, um, a very high percentage of them are, are pregnant and are carrying, you know, they've got Davida, develop, fairly developed fetuses in the carcass. So, you know, are looking at that. At this point, it doesn't look like we're gonna see, um, you know, that we're gonna see a bunch of does that don't, don't deliver. So you mentioned the proposal, you know, in your introduction, we, with their proposals, they were done maybe three weeks ago. Um, today, compared to three weeks ago, I'd like to really discuss Northern Utah, where we're at. I feel like we are, you know, it said ground zero, whatever, so we are where the problem is, other than any other place in the state with, with mortality. Um, could you give us what, with the collared animals that we have, what our, uh, more, what our mortality rate is and where, what it's looking at as of today, or your latest, yeah, so we we, uh, we we scraped data yesterday before that board work session. So I have survival survival data as of yesterday was presented in the board work session yesterday. Um, let's see, I've got some of those units right here. Can go through. Um, Fox elder unit was a ninety percent dose survival. Um, Morgan Southrich twenty seven percent dose survival. That, that's the worst, the box elder unit, or sorry, the Morgan Southridge and the Wallsburg area on the Wasatch back are our two worst in the state for adult dose survival. And that's very, that is very low. It's low adult dose survival. Um, Chalk Creek Camas, 58% adult dose survival. Um, let's see, we got, where's my other paper? I figured you'd ask this, so I printed some of these out so I could have them. Bear with me here. Cash, uh, so these are our deer survival units where we have both adult does and fawns collared. Um, we, we, these are units that we chose strategically because we felt like they were pretty representative of some of the neighboring surrounding units. But we have supplemented these with some of those other units too that I just mentioned. Um, but here's our deer survival units. Uh, the cash is 78% adult doe survival. Uh, no, no collared fawns are still alive, except for the few that were from the feed, feed grounds. Um, yeah, so. That, what about uh, East Canyon? Um, we don't have callers on East Canyon that I know of. Hang on East Canyon. But it's gonna... Okay, it's a small sample size, 56%. At 27% in Morgan Southridge is scary. And when we made the recommendations, we had anticipated 40%. We, we thought it was gonna be bad. We had anticipated 40% adult dose survival. So it, it is worse. That is one where I think when we get to the end of the month, we'll take another look at, that's one where I think we'll come to the board with a revised recommendation lower than what is currently in the rack packet. That was my next question. Do you feel that we've hit, I mean, we're still, we haven't passed the, it, it's, it's not, not looking over, up, I guess I should say. It's not over yet. It's not over yet. I, I think, um, yeah, we'll see what, what things, it is starting to melt, you know, thank, thank goodness we, we are finally seeing some snow melt, um, but it's not over yet. We're still feeding deer it's on several of the feed sites. I talked to the, to the biologists, they said they're, they are finally starting to have some natural food sources to move to, starting to dissipate a little bit in those, those feed areas. And yeah, this winter has held on longer than usual we will still see some mortality. I think by the end of this month, we'll be, we'll be through the bulk of it. But unfortunately with this timing and, and when we have to have recommendations ready to send out, on a more normal year, I think we're a lot closer to the end by the time we, we move forward in this process. This year is, 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 is outside the norm. I have another question. I don't mean to dominate, so. No, no, no. 
Quick question, this may, may make some people explode, but I hope not. But going off Ben's number on the deer fed was, was like 5,800, something like that. We have a state population of deer, approximately 340,000 come in. Is it worth the money and effort or is it just feel good? You know, we're looking at it really closely. If we hit those conditions where, um, you know, where we anticipate we're gonna see huge losses, if we're gonna feed, we want it to be as effective as possible. And so I think in certain areas, um, it can be helpful. And it's very expensive, very labor intensive, and just realistically, financially, logistically, I don't think it's something we can do on a large, on a, on a large scale on an annual basis. And I know as soon as it snows, the first snowstorm of the year next year, we're gonna get calls, it's time to start feeding again. And uh, it, it, it's a tricky proposition. You know, we care about deer, our, the public cares about deer, and, and in some ways it can be a feel good thing. And there are some drawbacks to feeding. It can, it can change animal behavior. It can have localized impacts on important winter ranges to, to the vegetative communities. Um, it can interrupt migration patterns. Uh, and uh, if you have disease issues, you know, if you have chronic wasting disease, especially, it can get to the point where I think the bad outweighs the good. Um, but we're, we're open, if we're gonna do it, we wanna do the best job we can with it. And we, we've been studying it. Um, Kent Hershey gave a presentation yesterday in that board work session where he talked about, uh, we, we collared some animals, does and fawns at feed sites and compared those with animals at sites where they were not fed. And there does appear to be a pretty significant difference in fawn survival uh, on the places where they were fed. And we were probably about at logistical capacity for what we could do and we only fed about 12% of the deer on those units. So it, I think it can make a difference. It is very labor intensive and whether what you do is worth what it costs and what it takes to do it. I mean, it, to some degree that's gonna depend on who you ask. If, if you're the person watching deer die in your yard, it's probably worth it. And if you're you know, the, the guy who has to figure out how we're gonna pay all the bills and and Ben's trying to figure out how he's gonna align everyone out in the region to handle this, you know, all the work and the labor logistically. And I, and I'm, I can't stress enough how much time and effort and labor went into feeding deer by sportsmen, by landowners, just donated equipment, thousands of hours, bl blood, sweat and tears. So it, it's a huge project. I think it can do some good, whether or not it's something that we want to expand and do at large scale on a regular basis. I think that's a, a really hard question still. Yeah, with the 340, I know it's a comment, with 340,000 deer, it's only these three, a few units up north that we're really feeding. And I would say to those deer that it's, that, that it saved, it meant a whole lot to them. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, I think it's definitely worth time. So that leads to another question I have. So we look at box elder, 90%. Su survival rate, uh, the cash, 78. Their snowpack isn't much different than what we have up here. Why are we seeing such a high mortality in the Morgan South Rich and some of these here with the same, nearly the same snowpack, if you were to guess? So I, I don't know definitively, I don't know if I can give you a definitive answer. Um, you know, we definitely saw a gradient across the state as you move from south to north, places where it was warmer and we got better snow melt in between storms. You know, some parts of southern Utah, this actually stuff looks as good as it's maybe ever looked. Um, and, th and then that, that changes as you move, as you move further north. Um, the, the, the worst hit areas in the state seem to be, I started calling them kind of the icebox units. It's these higher elevation valleys that have higher elevation winter ranges. You know, the closer you get to Wyoming, the colder it seems to be. And, you know, that Wasatch back where we just had deep snow and it didn't melt much in between storms. Um, you look at units like, like Morgan South Ridge, which is probably, you know, one of the, you know, low lights of what we're looking at for deer survival. And uh, I think it's very possible that we maybe have too many mouths on the landscape. There might be some carrying capacity issues there as well. That was my another question. And I, I don't know that I can tell you that definitively, but it looks that way. Is there a correlation between our elk herds being so far over objective and in these particular units versus the other ones? 
Yeah, I don't know. We've, we haven't conducted a scientific study in that regard, but it, it looks that way. I don't even know if it needs science, in my opinion, it's common sense would say, but okay. I'd like to address that when we get to another agenda item, but anyway. Other... So um, Morgan South Ridge, when we came through with the recommendation we're seeing now, we were predicting 40% adult survival for the cash. What was our predicted survivability when we came up with that recommendation? 70. 70, How about Chalk Creek. Chalk Creek, 60. Was what was what we predicted when when the biologists were going through and formulating ranks. Any other questions from members of the rack? Matt. So my understanding of this is that there's there's kind of a, a safety valve that they're going to make a new recommendation before the board? I mean, do we really want to get into kind of like nitpicking these numbers or just are we going to trust the division to adjust the numbers down at the board meeting? I realize this puts you guys in kind of a weird spot where we're asking you to vote on something that we're pretty much telling you we're going to change again in three weeks. I recognize that puts you in a weird spot. This is just a weird winter and we feel like we're in a weird spot. Do we want to make the most responsible recommendation we can to manage to the objectives and the plans. So. I, I was thinking, I guess, I was thinking about, about that same question, Matt, and I thought it's hard to give an exact number if we were to make a motion here when the time comes to come with an exact, with exact number, but I would hope that we could make a motion to, that the wildlife board would see as far as to how would I word that too? As we see the numbers to, yeah, err on the conservative side and also to try to match those numbers more. We just heard that we based them on a, what would you say the Morgan Southridge was when you made the? When we made the recommendation at that point in time, you know, we anticipated that we would have 40%, 40%, which, which is very low. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, and it, it mm -hmm. it's, you know, we're at 27%. So I'd like to see it and maybe an emotion that it'd be proportionate to our survivability um, percentage when we get to the to the board meeting, but that's my thoughts. So. I mean, I think that's the fairest way to do it is to like, if so we're, we have to uh, entertain this proposal based on this 40% survival, and we have to trust that they're gonna scale that down to what the actual survival ends up looking like. I don't think we can just pick a number out of the air and say, this is what we want it to be. I mean, I think if we're gonna accept this proposal based on their projection of 40%, we should do that and then trust them to scale it down based on what the final numbers look like. One thing that makes it a little tricky is it's not exactly linear either. As your populations decline, success rates go down. And so it, it's not perfectly linear. You know, a cut of 10% in permits doesn't necessarily mean harvest will go down 10%. So there's there's some of those kind of things that it's a little complex. I I don't know if I have a, a great recommendation for you other than, you know, mm -hmm. trust us and show up to the show up to the board meeting. And if you feel like we didn't do it right, let them know. And I think when we get to some comments, maybe we could <clears throat> discuss that a little bit more, Matt, on those things. But I think it's a great, a great question. Well, and I just think, just never mind. That's a little bit of comments. Any other questions from from Rec before I turn some time over to one of the public? Do we have any questions for Dax from anyone here? Today, yes. If you could please, you need to come forward and state your name as you do that, though. Smart man, right there. He's gonna. You got to come up, though. This microphone over here on the right, please. There's a, a little switch on that microphone. You got to slide it up. Thank you. All right. Can you hear me? Nothing. It's okay. Go ahead. Yeah, just yeah. All right. So, 
digging in to tag what was saying was allocated per general season unit and actual what was there, I'm finding some big discrepancies. I talked to Will down at the Salt Lake office and he wasn't able to answer the questions of where, why there's the, such a big discrepancy. So like cash per se, there says it was 6,000 tags given and when really there's only like 5,600 tags. Like the Manti was, the Ogden was like a little over 400 tag discrepancy. So like every unit I keep checking, there's anywhere from 400 to 1,000 tag discrepancy of what was actually given. Where, where are you looking at the Three given? The draw odds. The draw odds? Yeah. So um, lifetime licenses, dedicated hunters, permits that are allocated to youth, and surrendered permits that are turned back in or reissued from a previous year. Yeah. So all of those things, that looking at the draw odds is probably not the best place to look to see how many permits we gave. It's actually going to be you know, what got approved by the board. That's how many we send into the drawing. But there are kind of these little cutouts. Like I said, the percentages that are set aside for youth, dedicated hunter, lifetime license holders. So a lot of times, if you look at the draw odds, we gave 6,000 permits on a unit. It might show 5,700 were actually given through the draw because some of those permits were already taken either through dedicated hunters or lifetime license holders and, and some of those other kind of weird exceptions. Yeah, and when you go through the once in a life, I mean, all that stuff, we, as the general public can see, how does the general public come up, add up the numbers to get to these numbers that we're supposedly giving away? Yeah, so, you know, this this rack packet that we put out has the numbers that we're gonna send to licensing when they allocate permits. Okay. Um, but your question is, you're wanting to know like exactly how many go to, I've got, I've got Lindy Varney online, our licensing coordinator. Lindy, can you help me answer this question a little bit? Are you are you there? Are you available? Yeah. So, um, looking at the cash itself, you know, you're looking at we've got our dedicated hunters. We don't show the second and third year um, dedicated hunters that are already taken out of that quota. We got to remove those permits from there. So that's a big thing. And then, like Dak said, we got our lifetime license holders, our youth dedicated hunter, and our youth general season. And some of those draws don't show the people that draw through their second through fifth choice as well. Those are only first choice applicant, you know, that draw on the first choice. So it does show some discrepancy, but it's actually, it's because it's not showing the whole picture. It's too hard to show the whole picture for everything. Um, that's why you're seeing that those numbers different from what was actually approved. And, and per se the cash, there's no second choice tags for the cash. So that kind of like, four, five, six, some of the other units that that does happen, I understand that, but per se the cash, there's no second choice at going through the cash. And yeah, so that one, like you said, you know, um, it's because of the dedicated hunters. That's a lot of the discrepancy. A lot of those dedicated hunters that are in their second and third year, we still have to remove the, those quotas, those, those permit holders from that approved quota. Um, that's, the, that's the big thing that you are missing from that, the cash. So I'm looking at, so we got decade hunters, youth, general, and then the second through third years. Um, that would be, that adds up to all of the offered permits. Okay. We, we verify through this when the draw happens, we verify that the, the permit that is approved through the wildlife board equal the same amount that is, you know, that goes for the draw. And the general season has like four mini draws within it. It's really complicated. Okay. Lindy, I think part of the question too, is there a place that the member of the public can see that whole picture? Um, there is not. We don't show second through, you know, fifth choice on the draw odds. You can look at past dedicated hunter draws to see how many dedicated hunters are in the program. Um, we do some, show that in the hunt planner that there are, you know, this many second and third years. So you just have to go through different places to, to find it all. That uh, Hopefully that I don't know if it answers your question, but a little bit of a definite. Really. <laughs> it, it, you um, know, if, if we <clears throat> are given 5,000 tags on unit and there's still 
300 people that are in the dedicated hunter program that will be hunting there that next year, you know, then we're only going to, we're only going to have 4,700 through the draw yeah. because those ones are already allocated. So yeah, it, it's, we absolutely try our best to follow what the board approves. I mean, that's what we're le legally bound to do. And we try to account for all these other, you know, programs and, and exceptions to the rule when we do that. But, you know, absolutely what we try to send to the draw is what gets approved by the board. Yeah. Let's say it's just, that was one of the units and like the Manti was close to a thousand. So that's just when I started looking through them, that was, that's kind of concerning to the general public when those tags can't be called for that we can see, especially yeah. when you're doing permit recommendations, you're saying you gave 6,000 when really we can only see 5,600. That makes sense. Yeah, that was a good question. Actually, never yeah, thought about yeah, that. Great question. <clears throat> if you have a good idea of how we can display that simply and transparently, I give Lindy a send Lindy an email. So <laughs> we'll put you. In. Yes. <clears throat> All right. Was there any other questions from members of the public that hopefully we'd have a more clear answer for? Yes. Please come forward and please state your name. And it's helpful. It's nice to know where people are coming from as well. John Hanson. I noticed a lot of people here with hearing aids. And I'd like to ask our speaker if you'd put a little gusto into your voice. Some of us can't hear. <laughs> <laughs> Is he? Are you serious? Or? <laughs> I think he's. Okay. <laughs> okay. Usually people tell me I'm too loud, so I can do louder. <laughs> I haven't been accused of being too quiet very often. Exactly. Maybe your head's still in the sand, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, we have no other questions. We will now go to uh, public comment. I only have two cards right now for this agenda item, so if there's any that else that wanted to, I'd ask you to bring them up to Jody at this time. So, my minute. oh, actually, I do want to get public comment. We're actually going to hear first from the how we did with our polls. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. So for this item, we had 33 total votes. Um, 11 strongly agreed, nine somewhat agreed, two neither agreed nor disagree, so neutral. Two somewhat disagreed and nine strongly disagreed for a total um, weighted average of 3.33. Uh, so if you're a three, you're it would be like a neutral. So this is a little above neutral toward just slightly into the um, agreed uh, phase. For those, there were quite a few comments left on this item. Um, I think you guys I'm sure read through all of them, but almost all of them that disagreed were because the cuts were not um, deep enough. Yeah, I don't believe we received a single comment that said that the cuts were too much. In fact, it was overwhelming you know, it's not often that we get that much feedback from the public. It's usually there's not enough permits. And so it was overwhelming the desire from the from the public to to cut permits. So all right. Um so with that we'll now go to the public for for comments. So the first car that I have is Gary Webb. He'll be um representing the CWMU Association and he will have Hi, is he here? I did, there he is. Yeah, you'll have five minutes to, uh, with your comment. Gary Webb, I represent the uh, CWMU Association. I'm a board member there. Um, we support the division's recommendation. Um, on a side note, uh, the CWMU program, we're very concerned as well about the permits. Um, we're, we're very mindful of the impact it's having so much that we've met as a board recently. Uh, we've also reached out to the cooperative wildlife units that are in some of these hard, uh, these impacted areas. We're pleased to learn that, that all of them currently were already managing at a, at a very uh, high mule deer buck tag to acre uh, formula. Um, and many of those in addition are voluntarily cutting permits back this year based on what they're seeing on the ground. And uh, so, Spirit of fairness. Nice. 50 seconds, nice. All right. Um, next, we'll hear from uh, Kevin Norman. 
I should have stated you were next, sorry. Kevin Norman representing Sportsman's for Fish and Wildlife. Um, as you know, we uh, convene as, as a, a fulfillment committee, um, is our membership of SFW, and uh, they support the division's recommendations. There was a couple of uh, exceptions. Um, they wanted to see the uh, Manti be at 8,000 permits, um, and then also on the Oak Creek limited entry, um, that was the division's recommendation of an increase of 11 permits. Um, we were recommending an increase of only five permits. Um, that unit's become pretty special and uh, like a smaller increase. Um, speaking for myself, I'd like to throw in a plug. I get to work with the division often in, in my job, and um, I guess I have complete confidence in what they do and I get to see firsthand the struggles they go through, the um, spot that they always find themselves in and it is between a rock and a hard spot and the amount of work that they went through above and beyond this winter is um, quite phenomenal. Um, I just, as a shout out to the average hunter and the public, I just hope that we can I'll take a deep breath and realize that this winter was exceptional and, and brutal and that we can be careful to jump to conclusions and start pointing fingers that the, the division is passionate. They're hunters, they're, they care, they truly care. And um, I just wanna thank them for all their efforts, this, this, especially this year and, and uh, appreciate everything they do. Thanks. All right. That was the last of the comment cards. I don't believe we have any other on this agenda item. So we'll now turn the time over to, to the rack. I imagine we'll have some comments, but also I may ask that Dak stay, oh, he's right there, stay close by. So Matt, we'll go with you. I'm just going to reiterate my comment from before. I mean, I think we should make a motion to approve this as recommended with the caveat that they're going to adjust this down as more data comes in. I don't think we can really guess at this point. I mean, I think we just need to trust them that they're going to lower these on a sliding scale. Okay. Randy. Why don't you, uh, oh, there you go, couldn't see you. No, you don't need to stand up. I just wanted to be able to look at you when I said, oh. I, and this is sincere. I think this, your presentations, all of them, and I'm not gonna repeat myself, were fantastic. Um, I was very pleasantly surprised by the comments that came in, and a number of people pointed out that the presentations were very clear. Um, I think you and the division did a very good job at explaining why and what um, and where. Um, so I just want to let you know that I, I thought it was fantastic and I completely uh, concur with what Matt's saying on the direction that I think we should go. But thank you. I want to echo what Randy just said. When I listen to your presentations and you answering questions, thank you. Thank you for everything you did this year and your folks. Matt, there's a question. That wasn't a motion that you made at that time, was it? No. I, I was just, well, Matt. Matt. He's, no, I wasn't making a motion. This is the comment period. Well, we'll still. Okay. I didn't think so. I want to double check. He, okay. So, um, so we talked about deer feeding for a minute and all the effort that went into that. Um, I have a lot of friends that really um, put a lot of work into that. And... I, I think it was pretty amazing and it shows the amount of uh, it shows the amount of um, dedication and love that people have for the for the outdoors often in this position we get a lot of emails a lot of comments that just want to tell us everything that the division is doing wrong or what they how things need to happen and there are individuals out there that don't just talk the talk but walk the walk and I I'm probably gonna embarrass him but one of them is here in the room that I think had more to do with with feeding deer this year than anyone. And it was Travis Hobbs from up in Cache County. And he really organized so much of that and put a lot of time and effort into that. And there's others as well. 
you know, that there's too many maybe to mention, but I just, um, I just on behalf of my family, my kids, and myself as a sportsman, thank all of those individuals who took that much time to go out of their way, their own fuel, all their stuff to go out there and feed those animals. And, and they did make a difference. Um, even if they saved one deer, they made a difference. I believe they saved a lot, a lot more and we're grateful. I just wanted to say thank you to him and to all those who, who did that this time. Um, so a couple of things I want to echo the, the same thing there. I think one of the things in the division gets a lot of criticism for a lot of things, but I will say this, um, we're able to pull things off faster than any other state has done. And so when we took look at the feeding study that was done from the time of the idea to implementation, I think was 10 days or less, we put out 54 callers on deer and come up with the entire plan, have it funded, have the callers ready. That's a huge effort, and to be able to pull that off is impressive. Um, to the same token, um, and, and I'll, I'll just say, I mean, I, I appreciate Jayla and Sam are probably so sick of hearing from me about two, three times a week. I, I text them and call them just asking for updates on, on where the deer, deer are at and mortality and, and what it's looking like, and so appreciate the time that they've taken. I think that's one thing that gets lost often. When collar studies are in place, the workload that's on a biologist, if there's a mortality signal that comes, it doesn't matter if they're at their, with their family or at a birthday party or at a soccer game, the mortality signal comes and they have a time limit to get out there and figure it out. And they have sacrificed enough time from their lives, their family, they don't work nine to five and it happens all through this same winter and all the other stuff that's been going on with them. So I think it's impressive in the things they do and most of it isn't recognized. So appreciate that. I do think um, along some of the same lines that we've discussed here with these recommendations, um, based off the predicted survivability when we first made that recommendation, obviously that shifted a little bit. Um, so I don't think it should be a surprise if these recommendations get shifted lower coming into that. Um, but with the available data that's gone into this and what we're looking at, I do think um, all things considered, we probably should err on that side of being conservative with them going into this next year with permit numbers, um, even if that means cutting just a little bit more than we think is gonna put us right there. Um, but just kudos to the division, um, the number of volunteers. I know it's all through the winter, it's, uh, Biologists, everybody at the division, it's like you can't do anything right no matter what you do. Um, feed five deer and then people get mad you didn't feed six. So um, appreciate that work. I think it's, it's, uh, it's, I don't wanna say unprecedented, but what we've seen here in the effects on wildlife. And I think part of it is us being able to track real time with caller data and stuff that we didn't have in the past. It was more of just to drive around and see how many dead deer laying in the snow and take a guess. And now we're having um, more real-time data to come into to play here. And we're learning from everything we're doing. We're, we're actually putting some data points into does feeding work and doesn't it? And we're getting away from the opinion side of it all. And we have comparisons to make versus collared deer that weren't fed and those that are. And this is really the first study of its kind to be able to have that that will show they say about as definitively as we've been able to up to this point, whether or not it really works, how it works, those sorts of things. So um, I think I think we're on the right track with the cuts. Um, it is interesting that um, we see comments of, of wanting more cuts and, and I think uh, most sportsmen's motivations are in the right place, um, but <laughs> It is 2023 and bucks still can't give birth to fawns. So even if they identify as a doe, it won't matter. So it's only one small factor in it. Cutting buck tags can make hunting better. Cutting buck tags doesn't magically grow the population. So we got to get fawns on the ground and make them survive. So. And my comment, I think that's what makes the, the RAC process unique. If, if the division based everything on biology alone, it would be pretty easy. But 
there is a social aspect to everything. And that's one of the joys that we get to deal with is, is trying to find that balance where we're not doing anything that's going to harm the, the deer herd, but also that we try to, to manage, you know, manage hunters and manage people as well. And so I think even though dropping those numbers may not help our deer and there's no, it's no secret. The deer aren't going, next year it's not going to get, it's going to be a process before we get our deer herds back. But I still think, you know, cutting those numbers down can help with some of those, you know, help on the social side of things. But earlier in my question, I, I talked about, I asked the question about why the Morgan Southridge was so, the mortality rate was so much higher than the, the cash and my comment goes back to to the elk we are approximately and correct me are about three if we were to say units four five and six those those units are we about i guess it's a question are we about three thousand elk over objective is that Uh, yes. Jayla Walden, District Bio for Morgan Southridge and East Canyon. This is like in my eyeballs though. Okay. Um, so we're about 3,000 over on Morgan Southridge and 1,000 over on East Canyon right now. Okay. And that where are, uh, sorry, I guess you're not over the cash, but would you know about where we're at on objective with the elk on the cash? Do we have, is, oh, Sam. I'll let Sam answer that one. Uh-huh. Sam Robertson, the Cashinogan District Bi Biologist. Uh, we're at about 1950 on our elk for the cash, and objective is about 2300. So you're actually under objective. Interesting. Okay. And then we've got David Smedley on, who's the biologist for cash. If he's awake, over Chalk Creek, I'm sorry, over Chalk Creek. I don't know if he's paying attention. Do you, David, if you're there, do you know, or what are, where are we at on elk on the objective on the Chalk Creek unit. Can you hear me? Yes, there you are. So we were about, um, we'll be, uh, we're about 600 over on the Chalk Creek. Okay, thank you. All right. So I know we're talking about deer and we're not yet to the, uh, the other agenda items where we'll talk about, about elk, but I make the comment that I think it's no accident and that it that it's directly our our deer herd is is struggling even more in these units. I mean obviously the winter is there, but the reason that the survivability is so much or survival rate is so much lower on these compared to others is we have so many we're over objected on the over objective on elk. And so I think uh my call I know we can cut tags and we can do a lot of things that are that we think are gonna help, but that is the number one thing. If we wanna act and try to do something to save our deer, my opinion is that's where we need to to begin. Um, Matt. I just wanna add on a comment there on your line of thinking that a lot of this is private land and there's limited hunter access. And so you're kind of, I mean, increasing tag numbers by whatever number you decide to do is not necessarily going to increase opportunity because it's mostly private land units. We'll, we'll be getting there in the future. You're, you're exactly right. It, it's pretty hard to, to manage elk on 13%, that roughly 13% private, private ground. And to, so there, there's other ways to do it. And I think there's a lot of, hands that are tied, you know, I mean, I think CWMUs would probably be more willing to help if they are given the tools. And I'd like to find a way that we can with the wildlife board and with everyone find ways to give tools that we can help get these things under, get our elk into objective to help our deer. I've so. got a question for the biologist. Uh, elk and deer feed on different forage. Um, explain to me or just clarify the effect of uh, overpopulation of elk on the uh, deer herd. Yeah, so 
Deer are more browsers where they're gonna eat typically woodier vegetation where elk are more grazers, they're gonna eat more grasses. Although elk have a pretty, uh, a more robust digestive system and are more adaptable in their diet. Mule deer are more specialists. So it, in rough conditions when all that's available is woody feed, you know, elk can transition to woody feed. Elk, elk are a, a pretty hardy species. Um, in, on the summer range, uh, you know, they're gonna be going, especially early in the summer, you know, late spring, early summer, high protein forbs, uh, you know, little weedy plants that are gonna really provide maximum nutrition. Both your elk and your deer are gonna be eating those, especially during lactation, when, when cows and does are trying to get the best nutrition they can for fawns. Measuring direct competition between deer and elk is a pretty tricky thing to do. Um, but, but I think one of the things we've, we've done some analyses and looked at some things, and when you, when you have too many mouths on the landscape, regardless of what you know, different species it might be, it, it, if you're gonna pit elk versus deer, elk are gonna win. They're bigger, they're stronger, they're smellier. You know, they're, they, they're, they're gonna get the best feed. Um, different places have found different things. You know, we did a study on the Book Cliffs unit a couple of years back and looked at colors to see if elk were displacing deer and it didn't seem, it, there was not conclusive evidence that they were, um, but I, I think it can be a little tricky to determine if there's competition, but when you're several thousand elk over objective on a unit, it, it's not hard to imagine that there, there's likely some competition. Uh, there is some dietary overlap, there's some specialization too. It, it's not super black and white. Again, in the cache, the elk are, are about three to four, I can't remember the exact, three to 400 under under a objective and we're at 78% survivability. These other units were that were highly over. I, I would say that those numbers definitely suggest that, that they are affecting our deer numbers. So, um, any other comments? We, we've talked about Matt suggested a motion. I don't know if he's thought about how he might word one or if anyone else might be able to do that. Matt just raised his hand. I mean, I'll make the motion. I think we should accept these numbers as presented with the caveat that they're gonna round them down as more data becomes available between this meeting and the wildlife board meeting. Do we have a, so that's a motion? I second the motion. Emily beat you to it. So we have a motion by, by Matt Clark to accept, is this the, the entire proposal as, as presented, correct? Correct, with the caveat that they're gonna round these numbers down as more data becomes available. Okay, any questions on this? Any discussion? This is assuming the numbers go down, which they will, but. Um, they already understand. have gone down since they already well, have. I, I know, yeah. but it just, that's implicit in the motion. Yeah. So. If we don't have any other questions, I'll call, we'll call for a vote. Um, I'm gonna try to follow this list, so it'll make it easier. So instead of going over, I'm gonna start, Ryan Brown. Yes, in favor. Cannon. Yes. Jamie Butler. Yes. Paul. Yes. Um, Randy. Yes. Emily Jansko. Yes. Matt Clark. Yes. Mike Lauder. Yes. Kevin McLeod. Yeah. Right. Motion passes unanimous. Chair, can I make one comment before we move to the next item? Yes. Just on behalf of our employees, I want to thank the members of the public and the RAC for the comments you made about the work that they do. Um, I don't think we can understate or overstate the, the amount of abuse that they've endured this winter, the comments that they've endured both in person, over the phone, and online. Um, it, has a, it has an impact on one spirit as they do their work every single day. And so... All those days of comments like that, just having a night like this and hearing just a few like you did, I can promise you makes a big impact for them. 
And um, as it relates to the feeding and the volunteer help and the, the extra work it required, if you look at it from a numbers perspective and then the data, it's a, it, is, it might be a small number, but if you look at the feed rows too, um, see the number of deer on a feed row and think about applying the mortality rates to the number of deer you're seeing on that feed row, it's it really, it's a different level of significance. And so um, huge thank you to the volunteers that helped with that. Amongst the, all of the hard work that our people were putting in, believe it or not, it's not the workload that, that tires them out. You can put as much weight on their backs and they'll carry it, they keep doing it. But when the criticism comes in their faces, it's like a headwind and it's that headwind that gets you. And so there's times where we're doing all this feeding and we're building all this camaraderie and these relationships with volunteers that it, it puts that headwind in your, at your back like to work with such good people. So I really can't understate the importance of the relationships we built through the winter. Um, it makes the work meaningful. It makes the work really matter. So thanks for everything everybody offered tonight. Uh, means the world to us. Amen, Ben. I deleted my Instagram account <laughs> last week. <laughs> yeah. I, re I really did. Thank you, Dex. That concludes our fifth agenda. And we're going to move now to agenda item number six, which is once in a lifetime permit recommendations for 2023. Um, Ru Rusty, you don't look like Rusty. Rusty Robinson is at the Desert Bighorn Council meetings in Texas. And so um, between me and the staff here from the region, hopefully we can we can answer any questions you have on on the once in a lifetime recommendations. Um, yeah, the recommendations, again, are just uh, made based on the parameters in the management plan. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, let us know. And between me and the folks here in the region, we'll see if we can if we can answer them for you. Right. Um, this time I'll turn time over. Hopefully everyone had a chance to, to watch this presentation as well. And if you have any questions at this time for, for Dax, if, now would be the time to ask him. Um, I wanted to ask, just talk a little bit about the the mountain goat on, on Ben Loma or on Willard. Um, who are we looking at? Who's looking for Jim? Uh, yeah, I think Jim will help me with this one. I, all right. You're, you're welcome, Jim. It, it, it sounds to me like, I mean, obviously the numbers are way down. I remember being able to look through my backyard and being able, when I lived in far west at any given time, I could take the spotter scope out, pick the goats out all over the place. That That's not happening anymore. Um, I think you guys touched on, it was touched on a little bit, but for that particular unit, what would you say, you know, what the, the main factor is or what we're, think are causing our numbers or herd to decrease so much. Okay, yeah, so I'm Jim Christensen. I'm the Northern Region Wildlife Manager. Uh, so so that Willard Peak herd, I, I think it's a combination of factors. Uh, and and it's kind of the perfect storm that, that all hit at the same time uh, to, to cause that decline. Um, part of it is um, our hunting strategy. The, the, the population was doing so well we were issuing a lot of permits, a lot of either sex permits. Um, it, it's really hard for the, uh, the general hunter to distinguish a billy from a nanny. Sometimes it gets hard for biologists with the trained eye to, to distinguish a billy from a nanny. And so we had, had, a, had pretty high nanny harvest. At the same time, since we had so many animals, uh, we were moving um, nannies and kids off the mountain uh, to, to augment other populations across the state. Um, so we had that at the same time. Right in the mix of all that, um, we had the, the last bad winter where we ended up feeding deer. We, we had similar uh, mortality conditions like we're seeing this year um, where we lost some goats that year. Follow that up with, with drought, um, historic drought. Um, through, through these last couple of years, um, all those combined uh, just hit at the same time. And I think they all all had an effect on, on that herd up in there. Yes. Are you, what's the current mo uh, movement you're seeing there? So we've been, been pretty stable the last couple of years. Uh, we did go up and put some GPS collars on some goats up there uh, to better track 
the, the survival, um, any kind of movements as well. Um, that first year, the, the only harvest or the only mortality was due to a harvest. Um, and then we, we really haven't seen any um, times where we had a lot of, of mortality. Like even this winter, we've only had one of those die. Um, I mean, we, we're, we're getting fewer and fewer collars, collared animals on the landscape now too. Um, but, but the mortalities have, have been pretty well spaced out to where we would kind of expect the natural mortality to be. And so um, the, the other challenge with mountain goats, when they do die, they die in terrible places, just like where they like to live. And they're very inaccessible. Like the one this year, it, it's still unaccessible to, to be able to get up there and, and determine a cause specific uh, event. Any other questions from members of the RAC? Let me just, all right, this time, is there any questions from members of the public that on any, on this agenda item? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and hear the results from the public survey. So on this item, we had 19 total votes. Um, six strongly agree, seven somewhat agree, one neutral, three somewhat disagree, and two strongly disagree for a weighted average of 3.63. Again, uh, three would be neutral and four would be somewhat agree. With that, we have uh, two comment cards. I'm gonna, I'll ask Kevin, Norman to come up first, and then we also representing SFW, and then Cody Reese uh, representing youth hunters. Youth hunters' voice will be on deck. Kevin Norman representing SFW. We support the division's recommendations as presented. Thanks. Cody Reese here uh, on behalf of Youth Hunters Voice. I'm just here today to introduce ourselves as a nonprofit group. Uh, we're here to just established to try to generate the awareness and understanding that our youth are being overlooked and not enough's been done to help them maintain any interest in the outdoors and hunting industry. Although a good amount of progress has been made and you guys and the board have done a lot of things to help out uh, the youth where you can fit in, what you can fit in, um, we're a far cry from where we need to be with the opportunities for our youth in the state of Utah. Um, I understand today we're talking about the tag quotas and management numbers within the state, but it has very little to do with allocations of certain age class of tag holders. So as you're making decisions on the allocations of the animals that are available here in Utah to harvest, please consider whose hands these guys are getting into. Like the hands of the youth are being overlooked. Um, they don't get a fair and honest chance to obtain these permits. Our mission is very simple. We're advocating for the youth to have increased opportunities and meaningful hunting experiences. We're working for the youth to have a voice in the hunting world where they may not otherwise have one. Our recommendations to you for allocating these tag numbers uh, and the allotments is to consider just about six firm bullet points, allocate fair, and equal opportunities for the youth to experience and enjoy multiple hunting experiences in all aspects of hunting. Uh, allocate the general permits and the elk permits like you have for any person under the age of 18 that would like one, not in a draw, but they need permits to be interested. Like this is the future of our industry. Uh, we need to make major adjustments to the bonus point system to create an equal and fair opportunity to all youth hunters where our younger generations are unfairly behind in the system by no fault of their own, simply because of their age. Uh, we need to allocate a minimum of 30% of all limited entry permits accessible with fair lottery for youth hunters, deer, antelope, bear, cougar, elk, all of them. We need to allocate 30% minimum of all CWM permits for available for fair lotteries for youth hunters. Um, just imagine in your heads what that would mean to some CWMU owners that have disgruntled state hunters or even disgruntled hunters of their own that aren't shooting 
big, you know, 350 bull elk, but they could issue these tags to the youth and be able to take an animal that they're extremely happy with. A 12 year old boy, a 13 year old girl. I mean, it would be a big thing. We need to allocate at least 30% of all the once in a lifetime permits for fair lottery for youth hunters. The, they're just out of the game on this. Not their fault, they're just aged out. They weren't here 29, 30 years ago when we started the programs. Uh, we need to simplify the youth mentor program. It's a good step in the right direction, but we feel like it needs to be a uh, hassle-free transfer of any tag from anybody that does draw a tag to any youth, not just a relative, not your son or daughter, to a nephew, a niece, a uh, I mean, a neighbor, a friend, uh, someone that has a special need. It, it can go a lot further than what you've done uh, for the youth mentor program. Uh, we need to follow some other state's lead and make the youth uh, hunting and fishing licenses for free. Yeah, let's charge them for a tag if we need to, but their licenses need to be free. I think we have a budget. We can figure out how to get that done just for our youth. Um, in closing, I just want to say thank you for all you do. I appreciate you guys being here. Um, we're here not to be confrontational, but just to make sure that the youth are getting treated fairly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the RACS. It, it's nice to have another organization and we hope that you'll attend more and, and help us with ways to come up with these things as well. You know, when, it's nice when someone we have ideas and how when we can get help on how to accomplish these things i i think it's, it's a great thing so thank you i think that's that's all our comment cards that we have for right now so i'll turn the time over to the rack right now for any comments on this on this topic if we have no comments i'll entertain a motion Move to accept uh, the recommendations as proposed. So we have a motion to accept as pro as proposed by by Randy Hutchinson. Can we get a sec and a second by Brad Buchanan? Any discussion? We'll call for a vote. Uh, Ryan Brown. Yes. Brad Buchanan. Yes. Jamie Butler. Yes. Paul Chase. Yes. Randy Hutchinson? Yes. Emily Jensko? She has a Okay. Um, Matt Clark? Yes. Mike Lauder? Yes. Kevin McLeod? Yes. And everyone, right? All right. Motion passes unanimously with one stand. I don't know what we'll put on her not being present for this one. Not yeah. present. Okay. All right, we'll go ahead now to the next agenda item, agenda item number seven, elk permit recommendations for 2023. And we have Dax here to, to discuss these. Is there anything that you'd like to state before, apart from what's already been proposed or what we've seen? Well, just to reiterate, the, these recommendations reflect uh, changes to the statewide elk management plan that went through last fall and mm -hmm. I'm happy to answer questions. So I've got one question, if we look on, and this isn't just these ones, but it illustrates that the best, the late archery tags, most of these units are getting four resident, one non-resident. So where does that split come in? So why is the split coming in so low and then so, not at a 90-10? Yeah, so we use standard rounding protocol, I guess. Once we get to five, we typically will give one to a non-resident. So uh, the intent generally is to give 10% of permits to non-residents, but when it's low numbers, um, once we hit five, we usually give a non-resident permit. So where almost all of these hunts were recommending five permits, it, it's a, it's a high, higher percentage split going to non-residents. I don't know if you had any follow-up, any other? I think, um, well, it's not on the list here, but the youth, we're calling it youth any bull, September, the 
Draw. The name of that one is really long. Uh, Should have come up with a different name. Draw. Draw only youth. Any bull hunter's choice. Yeah. Permit or something that, like that. Yeah. It's okay. the September. Any weapon or or yeah. Youth. Any weapon. Any bull. Draw only hunter's choice. So, yeah. So, yes. The September one where they can use a rifle. There we go. Um, so that one's been at 500 permits for quite a long time. Um, with the shifts in the uh, self management plan as well as opening up new units. Um, what is the division's feelings on changing that number? We, we recommended keeping the number at, at 500 and have heard from some folks, some groups that they'd like to see that number go up. Um, you know, I'll be totally honest with you. That's one where maybe we missed it and maybe a little higher number than the 500 is probably a good idea with the additional and full units that we added. So, you know, I think uh, that's not necessarily a bad idea. So, you know, I, that's why I like having this public process, getting feedback from folks, so, you know, that is as close to perfect as we might seem. I'm just kidding. Um, we miss some stuff sometimes, and that's one maybe we missed. And just because my brain cells are old and I forget things, but the late season is an unlimited though, correct? So, yeah, just to be totally clear, in the, on the any bull, general season any bull hunts, um, we, we used to have one rifle season, I'm gonna call the any weapon season a rifle season, um, it, that, that opened usually the first Saturday in October and went for almost two weeks. The change we made split that into two hunts, an early and a late, but they're still during that same time frame, those first couple weeks of October. Uh, during that first season, there's a quota. During the second season, there's no quota, they're unlimited. I thought, and that, so yeah, youth could probably be tweaked a little and, bit, but and, there's an unlimited. And for that. youth, and, and we have a general season youth elk tag, there's two types of youth elk tags. Ugh, this stuff, sometimes it's, there's a lot. There's two types of general season youth elk tags. The one is a draw, uh, where there's a specific quota. If they draw that, it's, it's valid on the any bull units. And they can hunt with any legal weapon, and it's kind of mid-September, coincides with you know really good rut dates for hunting rutting bull elk. That's a draw. Then we have a general season elk tag and the changes in the statewide elk plan last year. Um, those are unlimited for youth. And if a youth purchases a general season youth elk tag, they can hunt all the seasons. So the archery season, the earlier rifle, the later rifle, the muzzleloader season, and they can hunt on any general season elk unit in the state. If it's a spike unit, they need to follow the spike only regulations on that unit. If it's an any bull unit, they need to follow, you know, they can follow any bull regulation. So, there's pretty much maximum flexibility for youth. Unlimited permits to hunt all the seasons on all the units, except for the one draw only season in September. That's where it's hoping to go down that road. Yeah. So did that answer, it's kind of convoluted sometimes, does that answer? But no, that's perfect. Okay. All right, I'm going somewhere again with this. In Northern Utah, and these units that were so highly over objective, can we issue enough permits that will ever be on meet objective on our public ground? Um, you know, right, right now we're talking bull permits and mm -hmm. uh, most of these units are any bull units in the northern part of the state. You know, the cash is limited entry, um, but we've got a lot of any bull units where there's quite a bit of flexibility, unlimited archery permits and unlimited um, bull permits for that second rifle season, that later rifle season there in mid-October. Um, you know, we, we strive to work together with landowners. We have a lot of CWMUs in this region and, and right now we're not making any recommendation with regard to CWMU permits. Um, but it, it takes cooperation to, to manage to these objectives. Okay. Any other questions? We have questions from members of the public here that would like to ask Dax about Ross. Oh, wait, hold on a minute. We do have a question from the Puffed Up Online. Matt, Clark. So just a quick question. In these units in particular, are we having um, depredation requests from private landowners that are not allowing access, or is this a pretty open system? I'll maybe defer to the region to help answer that one. Thanks, Jim.
Yeah, Jim Christensen, wildlife manager. Uh, for the most part, um, the those who are getting elk depredation will get permits and vouchers um, through our depredation program. Um, the, the vouchers are allowing access to um, at, at the landowner's discretion. Um, like I say, the majority of those uh, are getting those. There are, you know, a, a very small percentage um, that that um, will not allow access, but, but the majority will get those those permits. Are those are those cow tags only? Are those either sex tags or no? They're they're antlerless only. Antlerless. Now, Ross. Uh, Ross Worthington. Uh, my question just on that youth, any bull draw. Um, if I understand that they can only hunt if they draw that tag just that season, correct? I think that's right. Okay, I wanted to clarify. I'll have some other comments. So we're saying if they drew that early tag and, and aren't successful, they're not able to continue hunting during the general season, right? I'm 90% sure that's the way it is. I'm just the guy in charge of it, so. <laughs> <laughs> I know that either sex. Lindy, yes. Yeah, so yes, if you draw out for that draw only permit, and Dax did help with that name. I'm putting that out there. But, um, they only can hunt that September season date. They cannot hunt during the general season hunt. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for members of the public? Okay, we'll go to our public comment survey at this time. Stupid email machines, sorry. Okay, we had uh, 21 total votes for this item. Eight were strongly agreed, five somewhat agreed, uh, three neutral, one or four somewhat disagreed and one strongly disagreed uh, for a weighted average of 3.71. So we are trending in the agreed direction across items. Thanks. Okay, now open the time for comments from Oh, uh, go for the public first, right? How did I just forget <laughs> get my order? Yes, from the cup from the public. So we've got a number of cards on this. We'll go with Randy Sessions um, first. He's re he's representing the Farm Farm Bureau, um, and I'll have uh, Cody Reese on deck. For that. I'm Randy Sessions out of Morgan County, and recently our Morgan County Farm Bureau meeting. We had opportunity to to review the state. This this comment kind of touches on what's happened here, but the state uh, wide elk plan revision. And uh, as you look at it, it's an eight year plan with a four year in a review of four years. And you look at the habitat strategies and you go down through them. And the last one, the front page is on drought. You flip the page. There's nothing about a heavy snow season. So our recommendation to the state and what the wildlife board is to maybe reseat this uh, committee once again. They're only, I, I realize DWR is a bureaucracy and you have these schedules you have to stick to. But from what's just happened here in the north, there needs to be a different way of thinking about this. And uh, the habitat has obviously changed. Also in this program, there's population management strategies and stuff like that. Obviously, the discussion here tonight points out that there needs to be a change in the strategies. The CWMUs have to kill cow elk. And as a, personally, I'm a private landowner next to a CWMU, and it, it, it affects us a lot. 
we don't take depredation tags anymore. I get the people that come to hunt on me and I just have them get private land tags. So if they have to, they can go to, over the fence and shoot on the neighbors, but they can't go over the fence and shoot on the CWMU. So our, our recommendation would be that this RAC board recommend to the state wildlife board that the, the uh, statewide committee meet once again to consider two things, the, the weather and ways to encourage the CWMU to hunt more cow elk. Uh, I have a CWMU right next to me. I understand they have not killed a cow elk in the last three years. They're on the agenda tonight to kill some, but we killed eight on our private property. They're permitted to kill eight. That ain't gonna work because I'm on the East Canyon thing where there's a thousand, cow, thousand more elk than they're supposed to be. So the recommendation that Morgan County Farm Bureau would be that the uh, elk committee meet once again to consider these issues that this winter has brought to the to the wildlife. Thank you. Cody Reese again, I just want to thank you for uh, what you're doing for the youth and the elk world here. Um, it goes without saying we've got a good start on what we're doing here. You can obviously tell there's some wiggle room to put some extra elk hunters, especially youth on some private property, uh, hopefully some CWMUs and then also give some youth a fair shot at the once in a lifetime or the uh, elk tags that are the, the premium. So thank you. All right, we'll next hear from Kevin. Oh, do you, I'll need to get your card. Do we have? Also, we're not, but just to clarify, 30 seconds. Um, also, oh, just so I can get your name. We need it for records and we'll let you come up. But So we're gonna go with uh, Kevin Norman right now and then oh, him, Ross Worthington and then we'll go to the last comment card. Kevin Norman representing SFW. We uh, uh, support the division's recommendations um, with one exception. We'd like to see those draw youth any bull permits um, be bumped to 750 instead of 500. Um, as stated, I think there's support from the division on that and it uh, biologically makes sense and there's more units, more opportunity for the youth, and we support that. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Ross Worthington, representing myself again. Um, just along, I've, I've been here over the last few years and made this recommendation before. I'd still love to see it never come to fruition, but I love the idea of increasing the youth any bull tags. I also think where you're over objective, I get they get that unique opportunity to chase elk in that time frame, but I don't understand what the hurt we, we need to allow those kids to hunt all seasons in my opinion. I, I I don't have any skin in the game anymore. All my kids are grown, but my niece last year was the last one we had that, that had the opportunity to hunt that. She loves to archery hunt and had a tag sitting in her pocket that she couldn't go out and chase on the archery. She was able to harvest a great bull during the, the the youth, but again, I've had other situations. My own daughter wasn't able to um, harvest an elk one year, and I just think it would be a great opportunity to let those youth, they're already gonna be out there with their family. We're over objective. What's what's that hurt to, to make that open to all seasons? So thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, now I'm gonna make Sakia. You're close. All right. <laughs> Sakia White, uh, Utah Farm Bureau. I just wanted to make sure that it was clear the previous speaker was just addressing Morgan County Farm okay. Bureau's desires, not on behalf of Utah Farm Bureau as a okay. whole state. That's fair. Thank you. Sorry to make you fill all that out just for that, but no, you're, it's official. It didn't happen without the card. <laughs> Thank you. All right. I believe that's all the com public comment cards that I have at this time. Um, I'll now turn some time over to the rack for comments on this agenda item. Hey, I just want to throw some warm fuzzies at DWR again because I'm living in elk land right now on my farm um, in Wellsville and we have had lots and lots of elk troubles and you guys have been super responsive to remove dead elk, to um, help with lots of issues and I just want to so I couldn't throw too many warm fuzzies the deer way because I'm like, this is the year of the elk for us. So thank you. 
Um, I like the, the recommendations that came through for the elk. Um, I do like that we're easing into the different permit structure um, on the limited entry side and not making too big of a jump until we can kind of start to fill this out for the first few years there. Um, and I do, I like the idea of increase. I don't even know what we're going to call it. The youth limited entry hunt for whatever, you know, it'd be easier if you just give these units numbers instead of names too. But um, I like the idea of increasing that, honestly. Um, it gives the youth an opportunity and a bit of a unique time frame. And I don't know if Lindy's still on there. She can check my numbers, but I think it was 7,600 applicants last year for 450 permits, so about 6% draw odds. That's, That's what correct, was. yeah. Um, so I think there's, I mean, a lot, there's a lot of youth that are gonna put in their entire time from 12 to 17 and never draw that tag. So um, I think we have the ability to, to help that out a little bit without um, having too big of an impact there. And I can't remember what success rates were on that hunt. They weren't extremely high, um, but, um, seems to have not a huge impact on the resource there. But definitely more effective than the general season. Uh, and so what a, here we're talking about being over objective and what a easy way, win-win situation to try to, to try to help with that. So I, I like the idea. I agree. I think with the flexibility in the plan to add 250 permits to the, to the youth elk, I think that's an acceptable ask and pretty easily accepted in my opinion. And it's pretty fair to say just on those that I've known that have drawn that permit, a lot of them are hunting the very areas that we're talking about today that are over objective and they could, so I, I think it's a great idea. Go ahead. I was just gonna make a quick observation for the gentleman um, from Oregon. Uh, the CWM rules are up for review. And I know they've been delayed a little bit because of the last legislative sessions, um, but hopefully you'll see some movement in that regard. I guess I would add for that one as well. Um, when we took the elk plan to the wildlife board, the final approved version of the elk plan, they asked us to come back to do uh, two mid plan reviews, not one review after four years, but we're supposed to come back after the first two to three years and then another one a couple of years after that. So it's something that we will be revisiting sooner than you know waiting for until four years into it, just so, so you know. Those general season, the early draw, you. Uh, once in a youth time, I think Lindy used that phrase before, those early once in a youth time draw, uh, elk permits, success rate on those is is usually, um, it's not a slam dunk. They're not all shooting big bugling six by sixes, um, but it is, it is significantly higher than the general season any bull hunt. So I think we're looking in that 25, 30% success range versus the, the any bull general season um, success range is usually like half that. Other comments or our motion if we have one? Yes. Make a motion that we accept the elk permit recommendations as presented with the exception of increasing the youth limited entry bull hunt to 700, 750 tags. I'll second. I think that was pretty clear on the motion. Any questions or conversation on that? We have a motion by Brad and a second by Matt. Mike, I'm sorry. Looking right at you. <laughs> sorry, Mike. We'll go ahead and call for a vote. We're going to begin with Brian Brown. Yes. Brad Buchanan. Yes. Jamie Butler. Yes. Paul Chase. Yes. Randy Hutchinson. Yes. Mike Lauder. Yes. Kevin McLeod. Yes. And Emily's back. Emily's back. Emily, were you able to hear enough of this conversation that you feel yeah. like you can vote on this? I do, yes. Okay. Yes. So motion passes unanimously. Huh? Did Matt, did I call your name? Nope, but I vote yes. I apologize. <laughs> this online one's throw me off. Yeah. You did call. I called you, Matt. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. All right. 
We're now on to agenda item number eight, antelope permit recommendations for 2023. Dax is here again. All right, as you begin, is there anything else that you'd wanna to add to this or anything that's changed since the presentation? No, it's uh, yeah, we manage for the average age of harvested bucks, about <coughs> two to three year olds. Um, we're meeting or exceeding that on pretty much every antelope unit in the state. Uh, we're recommending permits either st remaining stable or increases on all except a couple units. One of those is the cash rich in this region where we are seeing some, some winter kill on pronghorn. Uh, there's also some kind of concerning disease issues in pronghorn in Western Wyoming. Uh, we haven't documented any of that here yet in Utah, but it's something we're a little concerned about and aware of. Um, so we're recommending a, a, a slight decrease on that cash rich unit as well as the, on the San Rafael um, where long-term drought has caught up to, to pronghorn uh, numbers on that unit. But most of the rest of the state, things are looking pretty pretty positive for pronghorn. Hey, looks like we have a question right now from Matt Clark for you. <clears throat> so most of my reading on the disease issues that Wyoming has had has been in the Pinedale region. Do you expect any crossover of that into Utah? Uh, I hope not. And I don't know if we have, uh, we maybe need to look at migration initiative data and compare state to state and see if we have animals overlapping on winter range. So it's something we're aware of, we're keeping an eye on. We haven't seen it in Utah. I hope it doesn't, but, but it is something that's on our radar. And would you say that antelope has fared better than mule deer or about the same <laughs> this winter? Uh, better. Typically our antelope winter a little bit lower elevation um, uh, th than deer in the northern part of the state. I think really the exception is are probably those those pronghorn that are hanging out there, you know, near Woodruff Randolph, Bear Lake area, where just that valley was so cold and had such snow depths for so long. Most of the rest of the state pronghorn seem to be doing pretty well. I can't recall. Do we? Are there many um, pronghorns that are called? I don't think there are. Are there? We don't have a lot. I do have. I kind of made a mess of my papers here. Let me pull it out. I, I did just mention this briefly in the wildlife board work session yesterday. Um, we don't have nearly as many collar and pronghorn, but uh, we've got collared pronghorn on the box elder, the cache, the north slope, west desert, southwest desert, book, book cliffs, and the plateau unit, and. Uh, the cache is the lowest survival in the state at 73%. All, all the rest of them are in the 90s and above. Um, statewide average, 91% survival on pronghorn. That's what I was looking for. Oh, I guess North Slope is also 78%. So we've got two, 73 on the, on the cache and 78% on the North Slope. So again, those units closest to Wyoming seem to Everything's worse in Wyoming, so the closer you get, the worse. I'm kidding. I love Wyoming. All right. Any other questions? The rack. Do we have any? Seeing none. Is there any questions from the uh, public on this agenda item? We'll go ahead and go to our public feedback. Thank you. For this item, Mr. Chair, we had 11 total votes. Strongly seven. Seven strongly agreed. One, someone agreed, three were neutral, and that's the balance. None, there were no disagree or strongly disagreed. So we have a weighted average of 4.36. Right. It's also a better score than they would have in Wyoming. <laughs> okay. okay, I'm just checking to make sure I... If you have any comment cards on this one. SFW, he's standing up. We'll, Kevin Norman from SFW. Kevin Norman, SFW, we support the division's recommendations. Okay. Don't, I don't believe there's any other comment cards. If I'm missing one, please let me know. All right, we'll go ahead to comments from the, from the rack. More motions. I'll move to accept the proposals as, as presented. We have a motion by Randy. I'll second. And a second by Ryan. Ryan. 
Everyone understands the motion? Go we'll ahead and call for a vote. Um, Ryan Brown. Yes. Brad Buchanan. Yes. Jamie Butler. Yes. Paul Chase. Yes. Randy Hutchinson. Yes. Emily Jensko. Yes. Matt Clark. Yes. Mike Lauder. Yes. Kevin McLeod. Yes. And that is it. Motion passes unanimously. Mr. Chairman, I, I don't uh -oh. want to make too light. You can't of change it after we went ahead. And <laughs> I just I just want to clarify. I don't want to make too light of the situation in Wyoming. Wyoming really is the last <laughs> stronghold for pronghorn in, in North America. And they're seeing devastating uh, mortality in South Central Wyoming and Western Wyoming, you know, 70% mortality on pronghorn herds. So I, I don't want to make too light of that. I also oh. don't want to, you know, be a doom and gloom guy, but, we, we, you know, we care about pronghorn, even even the ones across the border. And it, it is pretty concerning what's happening with pronghorn. This, this winter has been brutal yeah, for pronghorn. We're worse so in Wyoming. So I don't want to make too light of that and make it sound like we don't care. We, we do. So. Matt, did you have a question? I was just going to ask how <clears throat> transmissible this mycoplasma pneumonia they're getting is going to be. How far range right do they think this is going to get? I would. Let's have you get in touch with uh, Dr. Virginia Stout, our, our wildlife veterinarian. And uh, I think uh, I think Dr. Stout can have a good follow up conversation with you on that. I am not the subject matter expert there and ben just sent me a look that says if we talk about wyoming anymore he's gonna throw something at me <laughs> well i'm a veterinarian so that's a great answer <laughs> <laughs> okay uh oh we got some. so sorry sam robertson cash um augen biologist grew up in wyoming <laughs> yeah <laughs> sure. um but I was up in Rich County today and gathered up a few uh, pronghorn that have died and we actually got them into the lab. So we're gonna do some testing on them and see if we get any results. Okay, thank you. How's everyone doing? We good to go to the next agenda item? Do we, anyone need a break or anything? I haven't opened my monster, so I'm good. No pee breaks yet. <laughs> okay. Let's, uh, we'll move on to agenda item number nine. Antler list permit recommendations for 2023. So, again, I asked a question, Dax. Is there anything else from what was apart from what you've already stated in your presentation? I, I don't think so. Let's, let's just jump into it. All right. I've got two questions for you. One, you briefly alluded to a reason for the jump, but I didn't get details or I missed it. I apologize if I did. But on the Ogden unit, um, big jump from 60 to 250. And it's a hair under goal, but it's basically what we're looking for. Why? Why the big jump? I'll, I'll have the region come up and address that. We've made some changes in strategy on how we're going to harvest antlerless elk uh, on that unit. And I'll let uh, Jim from the region talk to that a little bit. Yeah, so we, we made some adjustments to the, the Ogden antlerless elk hunting strategy. Um, <laughs> We're getting a, a lot of elk coming into the southern end of Cache Valley down around the homes. And there, there's areas where with the private lands only permits, uh, you can technically, technically hunt in those areas, even though, you know, maybe somebody shouldn't be. Um, and so we, we discontinued that private lands only permit and then we, we adjusted season dates and permit numbers where we could try to still um, target those elk as they come down in, into those areas in Cache Valley and, and Manaway, um, but not necessarily push them down into the, the home areas um, as much as we have. Um, it seems like the way we have been hunting them, we just kind of pinball those elk back and forth and rather than having them stay up on the mountainside, they stay down in, in the, the more residential um, ag areas. Um, to, to, to address that issue, we'll, we'll use those, those mitigation permits and vouchers um, on, on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, we might need to, to put some weapons restrictions, you know, if, if they're getting down there, um, where we can go some short range weapons, shotguns, um, archery, um, or, or whatever's needed there. Um, 
but then uh, populations are slightly below objective there. Uh, we, we have seen some winter mortality of elk on, on that unit. And so uh, we, we did cut a few permits on that uh, because, of, because of the combination of those reasons. Had a few permits where? Because the permits went up. Oh, they they, they went up. So, um, yeah, just just trying to maintain that harvest, so so we can maintain those populations. Okay, so it's just that increase from sixty to two hundred and fifty is to target those deer that are migrating into South Rich, I think you said, or South Cache. The the elk. The elk. Excuse me. The elk. Yeah. Yep. And, and I guess the, the permit cuts I was talking about were the private lands only. Uh, might as well stay there. Okay. The other quick question, um, I didn't write it down, dang it. Put my glasses on. You want to look? I, can I ask you one while you're looking for that? Go ahead. Um, a lot of attention has been given to the elk in Echo Hennifer area. We see a lot of them on the news. A lot of them not looking all that great. We're also getting a lot of attention, a lot of questions, a lot of, there was a lot of kickback on the late season cow hunts that were taking place in January. Um, I guess that this is gonna just be your opinion. Do you believe those late season hunts have actually helped that maybe we're not, wouldn't see more? Dead elk on the roads there in so, that, in that so, area? Yeah, so part of the reason we run the late season hunts is so we can get some harvest um, as those elk move down or get some increased harvest on those. Um, yeah, we, we would much rather let uh, a hunter harvest an animal rather than, than let it succumb to, to starvation or you know other um, weather related issues or, or feed related issues. That, um, we, we'd, we'd rather let somebody take advantage of that. And how many of those permits are there? Uh, I don't know that off the top of my head. I didn't bring up my yeah. iPad. I, I've got it back there. Which, which one? The, here comes Jayla. I think she's got the answer. Yeah, <sighs> Jayla Walden, uh, District Bio for Morgan Southrich. So there's 275 that are on Morgan Southrich, the late season. So there's like a, a late, late season and then a mid, late season. So they're all late, but they're, there's two different seasons. What are the dates on those two? Um... The one's a December one, and then the other one's a January hunt. It's like December 2nd through December 23rd or 24th. And then the next one starts the day after and goes through the 31st of January. And then we bulk up the permits on the second season because that's usually when there's more success because most of those elk don't move down to the WMA until late, late in the season. Um, this year was an exception because we had really early snowfall. So they moved in early and we had really high success this year. We were right. sitting between both hunts like 80, 81% survive or 81% success. All right. Thanks. Then did you find your, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so it's just on the moose. Um, so the moose numbers are going down uh, according to what I've read and according to the presentation, but we're still giving out nine uh, cow tags. Those are mainly to reduce the number of moose coming into the urban interface. Um, we, we dart and move quite a few um, moose from around homes, and, and the majority of those cow moose hunts are to addressed to that. I was guessing that was it, but I wanted to add yeah. that. Yeah, this will be probably for you, Dax. Um, so a couple of questions. Seen a few comments about um, the antlerless deer hunts. I guess to cut to the chase on my question, how many of those deer are going to die through depredation tags anyway? You know, when we're faced with the decision of um, removing removing does in conflict areas with depredation hunts versus public draw hunts, if there's reasonable access to do it with public draw hunts, we do that. Uh, if there's not, or you know, or we don't have support for a public draw hunt, and we typically try to draw our boundaries pretty specific to to our problem areas, you know, um, a lot of times it's in these situations it's take your pick. Do you want it to be a public draw hunt? Do you want us to do depredation tags, or do you want us to do division removal? But when, when we're recommending doe hunts, nowhere in the state are we recommending doe deer hunts because we're trying to reduce a deer population. 
the only places we recommend doe deer hunts are when we have pretty specific conflicts or issues we're trying to address. Um, and maybe you can just clarify a couple of things. When you look through the antlerless permit recommendations for elk, some of it seems a little inconsistent in increases and decreases from unit to unit. So um, fox elders, 225 over objective, we're decreasing tags by 10. Onsagon is 200 over objective, we're decreasing tags by 30. Um, Manti is 300 under objective. We're increasing tags by 600. It just, what are some, some of these factors coming into why, why is, why do we see the inconsistencies there? Yeah. It, you know, one size fits all doesn't work really good with elk and our, our biologists have, you know, a finger on the pulse. They, they understand some of the nuances and some of the, the details that are going on in these units. And, and they can probably answer specific questions better than I can, but, but I can tell you, you know, they have experience in those units. They, they, they know what's going on and, and can anticipate things. Um, you know, the Manti unit is, has had some big fires on it and that elk population is really productive right now. So even though it's slightly below objective, they've got to get some harvest or else they're going to end up way above objective. And when you get too high and then you have to harvest too many cows, you can start influencing distribution and it can be, so some of these things, you got to stay on top of it or anticipate where you're going to be. I know on the Ponsagant unit with that unit converting to an any bull unit, they're anticipating that probably increased pressure from going from a limited entry elk unit to an any bull unit is probably going to push some elk off the unit. So, you know, there, there's reasons behind these different recommendation, recommendations and you're right, they do look inconsistent sometimes. And uh, it's because we, we trust our local biologists to understand some of these nuances and, and complications that are out there. But it's, it's a fair point. All right. Um, any other questions? Um, it's probably going to be Jim again. <laughs> we'll ask on the Hennifer Echo on that WMA. Have we ever had a higher die off rate of bulls than what we're seeing right now? In your in your recollection, or that you're that you're aware of, from my time here, I I haven't seen it. But um, I've only been the manager for three years um, as a biologist. Prior to that, um, I, I I don't remember seeing it like that. Do you have an idea of the number of deadheads that? And I'm hearing numbers that are visible from the road. I think if we had a few shed hunters, they could tell you exactly where they're at and everything about them. Yeah, it seems unfortunately like, they're probably not there anymore. Yeah. But anyway, and David can help with this one too. But it seems like we've we picked up around sixty deadheads. Okay. All right. Did Jada have something to add to that? So just to clarify too, because I think there's a lot of misconceptions going around is. Um, most of this mortality has all been bulls. Um, I've seen very, very few cows and calves dying. Um, the few that I have seen have actually been over in Morgan and not on the WMA. Don't run off. Have you got any ages back on the bulls that have died? Nope, still pending ages, but we are planning on getting ages on as many of them as possible. Right. Any other questions from members of that? Do you have any questions for members of the, here in the public for the division at this time? Okay, you ready for the public feedback? No. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag one job. So we had a total of 18 votes on this item. Uh, seven were strongly agreed, three somewhat agreed, two neither agreed nor disagree, three somewhat disagreed, and three strongly disagreed for a weighted average that's higher than Wyoming of 3.44. It's the same point restrictions they put on. <laughs> anyway, uh, okay. We'll now go to public comment. Ask the public questions already. Yep, I didn't, we didn't have any. So we're gonna go to public comment right now. I have, currently have two cards here. Um, We'll first ask Randy Sessions. He will be coming up representing himself on this one. Or am I on the right one? This is on number 10, right? Oh, we're on number nine. I apologize. 
we have, no all right. <laughs> we have one comment card. That would be from Kevin Norman and SFW. Kevin Norman representing SFW. Uh, we support the division's recommendations. Um, would like to throw this out there on a personal note. Um, some of these hunt strategy changes, I got to say a heartfelt thank you from me and my family. Um, in my area north of Paradise, I'm in the county, and there's a bunch of elk that come down um, it to winter or in certain winters, and it's become a serious safety hazard. Um, just waiting for the day a kid gets shot standing at the bus stop. So a lot of these hunt strategy changes, huge thanks to Sam and Ben and the crew um, for listening and thinking outside the box um, to, to fix the problem at hand and to assure everyone's safety. It's, it's a, I'll sleep better tonight. Thanks. All right. Is there any comment cards that I may have missed on this agenda item? All right, uh, we'll go to comment from the rack. I'll make a motion that we accept. I'm gonna give one comment though, I guess. So I'm sorry, <laughs> it's helping someone else. I just wanna comment, you know, my comment would be just to, to as we're going through these, to think about the number of, uh, the number of elk that are on those WMAs and and that uh, we're looking so, especially I guess this would be the bulls. And you know what, I'm gonna save my comment. I'm gonna, unless you had something you wanted to add to that. Maybe I was wrong on so I got So I think there, there's a couple points there. Um, seen a few comments coming up about why are we having any doe hunts and those sorts of things. And I think that's part of seeing the bigger picture that there's and we're seeing a little bit of this now with the elk as well. We're getting a bit more surgical in our hunt strategies. And although it can be a little frustrating year to year to see them change all the time, that's probably one of the better things to do for elk so that they don't become habituated to the way we hunt them. So uh, I think it's a, a good move forward. I, I, I like seeing the ability to make the changes year to year that we're seeing because I think it's helping in the big picture when you look at, at all the complexity of each of these. The comment I was gonna, gonna say was just talking, I don't know, the, the late season hunts. You know, we, we got a lot of, I got a lot of our emails, not so much to the form stack, a lot of emails from shed hunters and people are, why are we, we're closing WMAs or we're trying to keep the pressure off the animals and we're having these late season hunts still going on. And I think the purpose of those late season hunts are exactly, did exactly what we were hoping they were doing, helped a little bit with, with the winter of, of helping, you know, meet our objectives and also probably gave some of those animals a little better a little better way to go to leave this earth. So more ethical. Anyway, that's my comment. Right. I'd like to make a motion that we accept it as presented, the proposal. Got a motion by Ryan, accept as presented. We get a second. I'll second. And a second by Brad Buchanan. Any questions or discussion? Call for a vote. Ryan Brown. Yes. Brad Buchanan. Yes. Jamie Butler. Yes. Paul Chase. Yes. Randy Hutchinson. Yes. Emily Jensko. Yes. Matt Clark. Yes. Mike Lauder. Yes. Kevin McLeod. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. All right, on to agenda item number 10. Is everyone good to keep going, I think? Okay, 2023 CWMU antlerless permit recommendations. Um, we'll have Chad Wilson present. We'll give Dax a minute to take a break. I want to move out there. I'd moved in. I'm going to move out and give Chad some space.
Well, uh, all right. I guess we'll begin. Is there anything that you'd like to add to your presentation or anything at this time? Since no, I think we're going to probably have enough questions that we can probably just go straight there. We can get through this one, and we'll have a break after this one. Okay. I said you look grumpy. We should take a break first, but <laughs> okay, we're good. All right, it is getting warmer in here. Though. All right, um, questions in the rack. So um, I'll just hit all of them. Um, well, it's the variances. It's the variances that I want to hit. Okay. And I don't know. And I didn't take a note of this on the distance. I wish. Um, let's start with the North Peak, because you had a great map up there in your presentation. As I recall, there was a really big distance in between that uh, chunk of land that was wanting to be added on. I think it was to the west. I could be wrong on yeah, that. Yeah, so, so the lines that they drew on that map were both under a mile and a half. So one was 1.45, and the other one was 1.36. So okay, be between, between North Peak. Between, yeah, between the CWMU. Yeah, and I can't the, say the name. So just because I... Oh, event, a, the Ventiquin, yeah. On North on North Peaks here, it was about, a, it was under a mile and a half on both of those parcels. And I know you stated that the reason the division was supporting the request for the variance was it was um, posted land. How many permits are we talking for um, the public? on uh, both of these pieces. So the public wasn't getting on either of these pieces at all. And adding these two parcels in wouldn't change the permit numbers on it. So it's, it's just adding additional land. So so potentially, I, I think North Peaks has two elk permits. But anyway, all the public people that could hunt North Peaks now could potentially hunt those two parcels where before nobody on the public was, was getting on those areas. But how many is that? I I would have to look up <laughs> unless the, the operators here, Gary, do you know off ha, how many public hunters do you have on North Peaks? One public, one public elk, how many deer? And one, so so it'd be two hunters. All right. Um, yeah, I, I'll, okay, th that's what I needed. I'll save the rest for a comment. How many other CWMUs have we granted that have ground that is not contiguous? Um, there, there are others. I don't have that number off the top of my head, but there, you, you do see. I would guess eight to ten. The last time I guessed, though, somebody said you said twelve, and I was like, well, then it was probably twelve. So I, I think that's what I remember actually from the CWMU advisory committee. Mike, you were there. Is it, isn't that what happened? They, I said yeah, eight to ten, and somebody it's, said it's 12. like that. But I mean, it's all under review right now. We had some pretty in-depth meetings in February. We're diving into every every aspect of CWMUs. They're up for their new CORs, uh, any that withhold or have in holdings of public land and opportunities, and, and what is the benefit to the public. We we spent I don't know how many hours, Chad, going through this, and, and yet generally when there's a variance granted to from a committee standpoint, if they're already in excess of their acreage they're not just trying to make acreage and there's some distance between the two parcels of land that carries weight. Like if they're in excess of 10,000 acres and they're already an elk CWMU and they're tying in another piece, that's going to be a benefit to the public. We're a little bit more flexible on, on allowing stuff like that. If, if that helps. So, and either one of you, cause I forgot you were on the board. So is that, cause I'll admit, I don't understand why we have the rules. If we're not following the criteria that we set out. Well, so in these two cases, are they already decided? So, so yeah, let me be clear on that too. So the contiguous, if it's non-contiguous, the rule only talks about that to form a CWMU. So like in North Peak's case, they already have a CWMU. It doesn't really speak a lot on when or how and the circumstances to add non-contiguous parcels in, in, or non-contiguous land in those, in those instances. So on that one, um, we are following rule like they they already they're well over their ten thousand acres, um, so so on that one I, I feel comfortable of, of saying you know there there isn't really thing in rule prohibiting this. Um, we did take it through the CWMU advisory committee so there would be transparency and so that it could be looked at thoroughly um, through that lens and it wasn't just the division uh, making making a decision on that. 
Avenaquin, on the other hand, is it's not 10,000 acres. They don't have the ability to get to 10,000 acres. Um, they were granted a variance three, I want to say three years ago-ish, that to, to be an under acreage elk CWMU. So they were an under acreage, they were already an elk CWMU granted through a different variance. This one would push their acreage over 10,000, uh, but whether it's in or not, they're going, they're going to be an elk CWMU because of the variance that they'd already received. And some of the variances come by recommendation of the biologist. You know, maybe they can't get the excess acreage to, to go to the 10,000 acres, but it, it makes all the sense in the world. It's maybe limited access, public opportunity. It solves a lot of problems for the division, and they're just under. That, that carries weight with the committee, too. We review all that stuff, and we look into it, and, if, and it, it makes sense. It's generally the direction we go. Is there any rule, is there anything in place right now that states how far that property needs to be, like vicinity? Or, I mean, the only downside I worry about is if we have 9,000 acres and six miles away, there's 3,000 acres that wasn't going to be in a CWMU, and now all of a sudden we're able to... Yeah, and, and I don't see it going that way. Like, we would look at that 9,000 acres first, and if... Yeah, if it's if it's under acreage and we say, but even if they're over acre, I'm just saying. I mean, somewhere there's got to be a parameter. We're like, yeah. okay, this. I mean, where is it at? Is it one mile? Is it two mile? I. Yeah, we don't we don't have that. We don't have the size, the acreage size either. Um, there there's stuff when the rule opens up that I think we can for sure explore that area, and I think we will explore that that area of, of um, maybe putting some boundaries on what the non contiguous ones look like, but. Yeah, so so right now our, our best option is to take it to the CWMU Advisory Committee, have them hear it, weigh it out, um, and, and help us make that decision. When is the rule coming open again? So it, we can now, essentially. <laughs> I didn't want to say that, but but yeah, it, it's it's up for review starting soon. It seems like last year when we were talking about CWMUs, we had a lot of conversation as Iraq around this idea of contiguous and not contiguous a year ago. The, the majority of that discussion involved uh, public land within the CWB boundaries, as I recall. You know, whether it be SITLA, state trust land, or service, or, or public accessible land within. And we've reviewed, or actually in the process of reviewing those CWMUs now that contain public land, and we've had them before our committee. And and reviewed that. So, Matt, you have a question. Well, if I'm understanding this correctly, <clears throat> right now this additional parcel is unhuntable, and we are deciding whether to make it huntable or not. So, so if you had a permit for the box elder unit, you could hunt it um, if you got permission from the landowner. So, I I don't know how much the landowner is giving permission I, I don't I think it's marked as no trespassing so it'd probably be a trespassing fee or, or something along those lines where if it's part of the CWMU um, the public hunters that draw that CWMU tag would have the potential to hunt there if they chose so I guess I'm trying to get a handle on is anybody hunting this land currently or no I, I would and operators here so he could probably tell me he could probably answer that better but the answer is no with potentially an exception or two if they know if the landowner knew somebody who drew out that they wanted to grant permission the answer would be no would it be something to think about in, in rule. I mean, they're cooperative wildlife management units, cooperative. And I, I think when, and they're a great thing. And when, when they're cooperating and everything, I think for me, it makes it a lot easier to, to give these kind of things. I, I have a lot of faith in our advisory committees. That's why they're there to go, th go through these. Um, so I, I think that's, that's important to, to think about and I don't know. I guess that was a comment. Sorry. <laughs> I do have a question. Would it be 
if we were to try to grant permit, is there a mechanism in place or could there be one in place to where maybe it's, it's not always, but there was something give up. Maybe if, if we accept a, this, maybe one year, they give one extra public tag or anything like that. Is that something that could be? I, I think that would have to go through the rule process and yeah. I, I don't think we could, I'm asking, I don't think we could make a motion to do but that in some tonight. cases we've made that recommendation d depending on what was done for the cwmu if, if there was a big sacrifice to the public in in cases of public land within the boundaries of the cwmu we've asked for an extra public tag or some leniency or some flexibility on their end to to make it all work for everybody <coughs> yeah and that and i think we've done that more with public lands inside rather than mm -hmm. the private lands that are that are bordering um <laughs> I mean, it, it's something that we could explore, but I think at this time to to ask for that, I, I don't know. It, yeah, it's not accessible now. So, so really, I, and I think that's where the CWMU advisory committee came. Was like right now, nobody's hunting it. Um, so you have a chance. You have the choice of like nobody hunts it, or potentially two public draw hunters are able to hunt it. And I think that's where a lot of that decision weighed was. I would rather have two. A potential of two people hunting than nobody. Um. Okay. One last question. Uh, Mike just mentioned it there. So, if the committee is going through and reviewing CWMUs that contain public land, has there been boundary changes to any of them so far? I believe there's been some recommendations on some. Correct. I'm I'm trying to think. I think most of them. But, and, and so I would go back to this is I know the, the topic of this, of the reason why we're doing these in-depth reviews is because, well, they, they hadn't been and, the, and we're, we're talking about mostly accessible public land, right? Um, what I have gone back through through this process is there was a reason why I the public land was included in the beginning. And so from what I've seen, I don't, I don't know that we've, had a recommendation from them to change that. If it we've, is, it's we've denied requests for public land. Yeah, based on boundaries, identifiable boundaries. You know that we've we had several city members approach and ask, if, could the ridge line be the boundary? And there we we denied stuff like that. It was it was what was inside the CWMU is what was acceptable. We didn't allow extra public land if it was accessible to the public. We we didn't allow it to be part of the CWMU. We, we, we run a pretty hard line. It's a pretty diverse committee with <laughs> agricultural interest, CWMU operators sit on this committee. It's it's pretty intense. I mean, we, we spent six or eight hours one evening and then we broke it into two nights and did about six or eight the next night. It It's pretty involved. Yeah. I have a question on something different if I can change the subject for a minute. Um, will you... Uh, Chad, could you, I don't know how quick you can briefly explain the, how the split with antlerless elk permits work, the 90-10 and how that works on allotting permits for CWMUs. Yeah, so really the CWMUs have four choices for their buck or, or bull, so deer and elk permits. Uh, the most popular is the 90-10. If they choose a 90-10 split, they get the private CWMUs get nine tags for their use and one goes to the public. If they choose that, the the public then would get 100% of the antlerless permits. And so that, that's the one that's chosen the most. However, um, at times there can be some benefit for CWMUs to have or that they may just want some antlerless permits as well. Um, so you, there, the other options are 85-15 split. Um, on that, the private twenty-five percent of the antler list would go to the private, and seventy-five percent would go to the public. If they chose an eighty-twenty split. Forty percent go to the private, sixty percent to the public, and the last one that they can have is a seventy-five twenty-five, um, which would be a fifty-fifty on the antler list. And so it's just a tool. Um, it's a, I guess, it, I guess the best way to put this is it's it's a tool for them to get the hunters that can be effective on the CWMUs. Uh, so, so there's probably a little bit of a misconception. I think a lot of people think, oh, it's a CWMU hunt, it's a cow hunt, we're gonna drive down the road, shoot a cow, load it in the truck and be done. 
it, it's not that there might be some CWMUs at some points in time that that happens. Uh, but some of these it's they're they're looking up on the mountain saying, okay, there's, there's your herd of elk right there. And the, the hunter will say, well, I'm, I'm not, it's not worth it for a cow. Right. And so, so we have scenarios like this. And I think these splits were built in there for, um, for them to be able to have some of those permits that are going to their hunters that, that are, they can choose people that, that would be willing to, to put the extra mileage in and, and, and go harvest those. Chad, why don't you just take two seconds and touch upon the requirements of these, these outfitters and the CWMUs get hammered about killing their cows. They're working their tails off guiding these guys to kill these cows because it's a requirement to maintain your COR. And so when they come in front of us, we have their satisfaction uh, survey type stuff. These guys, if they're not killing their cows, they come and they get reviewed. There's, this is a pretty mm -hmm. intense program as far as killing cows. The efforts being made on the part of the CWMU and the oversight committee. Yeah, and it is it is a hard process, but they, a lot of them, even this year, we emphasized it once. I, I, we emphasize it all the time, but I re we really emphasized it again. And we had operators go out and just throw everything at it uh, to try to get their cow harvest. And um, they'd have people that say, well, yeah, that, it's not that important to me. I'm probably just not going to show up. And so we do have, and, and if you see saw this in, in my fall recommendations on the ones that renewed, um, there is a minimum amount to harvest with within the three year COR. Um, so that that is reviewed, and we we ask them to do that that minimal amount. And so for them, they they want to get that harvest so that they can. <laughs> so it's not a, a bad mark when they go to to renew their their CWMU. So. They, they put a lot of effort into it, and it's not always easy. Chad, is there any guidelines on, uh, <clears throat> on cow harvest, <clears throat> excuse me, on the CWMUs and what the CWMU a guide or the CWMU can charge those cow hunters? I, I, I remember reading an email from a guy that said, you know, we've hunted desert rat, and we have to pay a whole lot of money to a, to a guide. Is there any control or... Or is there any any stipulation on that? Yeah, and even on Deseret, they don't have to pay for a guide. They they give some. If you choose to not have a guide, they have some some dates that you can go hunt. Um, if you want a guide, uh, they have a couple of different programs. Um, one is if you go through an orientation class, then it's it's less than if you don't go through an orientation class. So there is an option on that. I don't think we would ever allow a CWMU to say you have to pay for a guide for this hunt. There, there's always going to be an option to not. Um, yeah, and, and it needs, rural states too, that it needs to be equal, not equal, but fair treatment between guided hunts and not. And, and so, yeah, that needs to be a consideration too, is to make sure that there's, there's still equal treatment. And, and I believe I think Deseret's here too. They at least were earlier, so unless they <laughs> decided to leave, but I believe too that the time amount is three days is a minimum, <coughs> and I think they give more than the three days for those guys that are doing it on their own. So I guess I have a couple of questions, and we'll use let's just use Morgan Southridge because that's the topic of the night. But as an example, so. 85% of the private land on the unit is CWMU. If each one is meeting their requirements over the three year period of how many antlerless elk to kill, how do we end up 200% over objective? Are, are we that far off in how much we're asking that we need to kill? I mean, is there something that needs adjusted there? Yeah, something needs to be adjusted. That I, I can say that for sure. Um, and it's tricky now because it, you don't get over you don't get 3000 over overnight. Right. And you're not going to get back to objective overnight as well. And it might be something, I mean, the, the unit plan is coming up for review this, this year. And so it is, it's going to be top priority on that, on that when we talk about it. Um, but, but yeah, when you look at the amount of elk we have and you look at the amount of, of antlerless tags that the CWMUs have, and then what we do on the public, 
the math doesn't add up for it to be decreasing. Um, it probably doesn't add up for it to be staying this, the same. It's If this was an easy fix, it would be fixed, right? Like this, I was biologist up in that area 10 years ago and we were having these conversations. I think one thing that we've seen happen in the past is that we've gone in as a division and said, hey, CWMU, we're over objective. You got to kill all these cow elk. And the CWMUs have been super responsive and said, okay, you got it. We go in. Well, the next thing you know, within three to three, five years, they've killed their resident herd. And now they're, they don't have a very good elk hunt. And so I think part of that is there's hesitancy from CWMUs saying, I get it. Like, I think if you asked every one of the CWMUs, and there's a lot of them here tonight, I think if you asked everyone, do you have too many elk on that unit? I think they'd all say yes. Um, I, I don't think this, this is a, a disagreement. Um, but how, how to get that harvest and how to have those CWMUs still maintain their elk herd on their, on their unit is a little bit trickier than just issuing tags. And when we go back to what we talked about earlier about public hunters, um, sometimes some of them are really good and sometimes some of them don't want to, to move or hike or put forth the effort. And so you kind of get a mixed bag there. And it's that that just is one more layer to add on to, to the difficulties of, of getting the harvest. Well, I think that leads to my next question. I'm just going to say it, and I don't think there is. Are there any other, in it, when units are that far over objective, we know we need to bring them in. Are there any other tools besides just a public draw hunter that we can bring into play to help this situation? I, we're, we're discussing, we've, we've been having meetings with the CWMUs up there and we're, we're trying to discuss and, and figure out what maybe some of those were, would be. Or, or or could be, um, I mean, as of tonight, I mean, we could recommend, and for the last 10 years, we could have recommended and done split recommendations of them killing more amount of cows. Um, not it's when you when you do those recommendations, just because they have more permits doesn't necessarily mean that there's more dead cow elk. Um, it, it's it's just a, a fine line of. of <laughs> of how do you do that? Um, so yeah, I, I, I think the answer is, is we're looking at other things and, and hopefully by this fall, um, we have some answers of, of maybe some outside the box. And I would say hopefully, the, well, to, for me personally, those have to be short term, one time solutions. Like once we get it back to objective, which is, is going to be a hard thing, but once we get it back to objective, we have to we have to go by the rules here, right? We have to we have to play by what we have to work with. Um, no more outside the box, and we've got to hold a line. And it's probably going to be holding a lot more accountability um, on that. So, I, does that answer? Yeah. I had a question for Matt Clark. Yeah, this is Matt Clark. I guess I'm not completely understanding. I mean, are there is there a migration issue here that is in the play? Are there islands or private land that are not hunted that are in the play? I'm, I'm not completely understanding how the CWMUs are gun shy about over harvesting, but still being over objected in the overall unit. Yeah, I, I think it mostly. I don't. I don't think it's a ton of migration, but I, I think most of it is is just wanting. The elk on their CWMU. Uh, um, it's probably the opposite of the problem that we had before CWMUs came around, right? Before CWMUs, they all wanted the elk off of their property. And now with the CWMU program, they all want the elk on their property. They want to have good hunts. They don't want to scare off their resident herd and ruin their hunt. Um, could they harvest some more? Could some of them yeah, I think the answer is yes. I think I think there's room for some extra harvest there. What that amount is, I don't know. I mean, those are the conversations we've been having with them for for the, at least since I was a biologist the last ten years of of how do we how do we get this harvest? I think this winter has brought it to light the importance of of us doing that, and it, it's lit a fire I think under uh, us as the division and at least 
a majority of those CWMUs up there want to, want to try to figure out how do we get to objective and stay there. Um, and maybe it is we build in some incentive programs once we get to objective of if you're a certain amount over objective, then there's not a 90-10 split anymore. You, you choose one of the other splits until, until you're within that percentage of objective. That's just one idea that I'm throwing out off the top of my head, but but I think there's some measures like that we could. So where the, the rules current, you couldn't require that if you wanted to right now. I, I think w we probably could. That could be our recommendation, I think. Like we could have come in and said, our recommendation is a 75-25 split and a 50-50 on antlerless. And, and we could also recommend a whole bunch of extra elk tags. Um, like we said earlier, like that more, more cow tags doesn't necessarily mean more dead elk. Um, and being a cooperative wildlife management unit cooperative, like it, it's a two-way street, like they need to cooperate with what we're trying to do, but we also need to cooperate with them. And, and I think that's what we're trying to do mostly with them is have that spirit of cooperation of like, let's work, let's work this out together. Uh, I've, I've almost been the coordinator over this program for four years and I've just, the, I've been very impressed with CWMU's response when we, when I come to them with any issues, they're, they're very willing and receptive of listening and trying to work together to figure out how we solve this problem. And I think we're there with Unit 4 that they want to solve this. We want to solve it. We've just had a hard winter that has brought it to the forefront. And I, I think we're there of like, it, it needs to be now, not, not in the future. Could you identify, if you were asked, could you identify CWU cooperative wildlife units that are not being cooperative when it comes to cow elk or antlerless elk? It, I'm not going to ask you to do it, but could, is there, have we looked at the net? Do we know who's not, or do you know who's not cooperating and who's not participating in this? Yeah, I mean, there's metrics that we look at, and one would be how many bulls you killed, kill compared to how many cows you kill. Um, cause that, that's one where if you're 3000 over objective and you're killing more bulls and cows, that one like is a, and I, I would just say these are more like red flags, but that'd be a red flag for us. Right. Of, um, you know, if, if you're, how many elk are on your, your, your ground when we do our flights, if it's, if you're, if you've got 800, a thousand elk on your CWMU in the winter time, you probably ought to be able to like to keep up with production on that, if you have 800 or 1,000 elk, to keep up with just the production, let's just say a, a third of them are, are breeding cows. That's, that's 300 elk that you need to harvest. So th there's things like that we look at, but it's more, we're looking at it more big picture. And I, when you get to the nitty gritty of the CWMU and the ease, th this is one of the things I've, I've already committed to do this fall is I'm gonna be out on the ground on CWMUs and I'm going to see what it looks like, what their hunting looks like, um, see which ones it is like, yeah, this is this is tough and see which ones that you're on where it's like, this isn't that tough. Maybe we could get a few more permits. And and I'd, I'd like to get the biologist. I, I know their, their time is precious and it's hard to, to stretch them too, too thin. But but that's the goal this year is to get out on CWMUs. See which ones are hard. See which ones can take more harvest. That's what I was just getting ready to say. They're not all the same. No. Yeah. I mean, they're they're definitely not cookie cutter stuff. The so, public aren't the same. The people that come to hunt your elk, and, and most of them, we have a three year average. Am I right, Chad? Isn't it, don't we look at a three year and then there's the satisfaction deal? Yeah. I mean, we can review a lot of stuff about we we can get a pretty good feel for what a CWMU is doing, and we even have them and come in front of us and say, guys didn't show up to kill elk. Yep. And those tags are allocated to those individuals that don't want to go chase around in the mountains in the snow. So there's so many variables to this that that make it difficult, in my opinion, as I've said on the committee. So yeah, it it, it is. I, like I said earlier, if it was easy, we'd already done it. Like, and the CWMUs would have already done it. But it's just not. It's just not super easy, which I feel like that's a lot of my programs, right? So we have a lot of CWMU operators. I'm. I've been asked to guide a couple of cow hunters a few times. I've done it a time or two. I can think of a lot of things I'd rather do. I'd rather be here than do that. You know, I mean, it's not, I get it. It's, it's not, it, it's not easy. And so I, I think they need to be recognized. 
I mean, in a six hour meeting, <laughs> but um, I, I wish we could find a way here tonight. I'm asking as a rack, how you know, we're talking about cooperative wildlife management, cooperating. I think it's, you got cooperation going between the division. You got cooperation going between the, the landowners or those CWMU operators. It's hard. We've also got the public a, aspect of it. You've got wildlife. There's a lot of people involved in that. And I love to know how to help to get ahead of this because our herds are suffering and I know it's hard, but let's do, I, how do, how do we start doing whatever it is that needs to be done? We can do hard things. Let's, let's start. Yeah. I guess you could ask all of them that are here if they want to volunteer to, I, to take more cow tags this fall. <laughs> but at the same time, well, I, I was thinking that they, they would probably be the ones to give you the, the solution to this problem. Well, and, and to be fair with that, Mike, uh, like we've stated, the, the CW or the elk management unit management plan is due. Um, we've already had internal talks. Every CWMU is going to be invited to have a representative that's a decision maker on that committee. Um, there, it is a majority of the land. That's probably where the, the decision and the, where we have to get the consensus on, on what to do and how to do it. And so they will be part of that committee. So the question would be is doing that this summer, is it too late and do we need to have and, and we'll probably will be looking at additional measures to put in this fall, but can there be more done this fall before the committee meets is probably my question. So I asked the question prior to coming here and uh, I asked how many in Morgan Southridge, how many CWMU or how many cow permits do we, I think it was for that particular unit and I believe there were set 370, is that? I, I, I told you wrong. Okay. I, I re-added it up because and I was going to have Jayla come up because she spent all day doing all this, and now I'm going to just take credit for all of her work. Okay. <laughs> but it, I think it was 300, 393 total CWMU permits. And for the record, 310 of those. That's what I wanted to ask. So Deseret. 310 were Deseret. Yeah. Why are they? I mean, obviously, they're the biggest acreage. I'll be that, but they're not that. Are they that? Is the proportion that much higher? Or they have that many more elk on them than their than their neighbors? Why why are they they're, they're carrying part, the weight of everyone 41% else? Forty one percent of the the total unit. How much? Forty one percent. So they're forty one percent, and they're taking I don't I don't. And they they're usually five percent. Most most of the years they're more than fifty percent of the harvest for the whole for out of the whole unit or just the CW means. She's gonna. Come up. It's better than my memory anyway. <laughs> Off, I no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so you just wanted to know how what percentage of the harvest that Deseret does every year, roughly? Well, I th I think we know. I want to know why. Why are they? Why are they doing the carrying call? the weight of if they're forty percent of the property? I'm grateful for them to do so, that, and I think they're on the right track. Why aren't they, we getting more cooperation from their neighbors? Um. So they actually do about thirty. So this last year they did thirty eight percent. Previous years, it flo floats right around 50%. So they're usually carrying a little bit more of the weight, and that's because somebody else isn't carrying their weight. And it's hard to assign who's carrying their weight versus who isn't because some of these guys that look like maybe they're not carrying their weight, you go up on their seat of a mute, and it's because there's not an easy way to hunt elk or there's not elk on them. And then there's other seat of a mute who just aren't harvesting elk even though they have elk on them. That's a problem. That is part of the problem. How do we fix that? So is there is there a, a land acreage difference? I mean, Deseret's pretty big. So uh, the surrounding CWMUs are they as big in area as and and able to carry the capacity that Deseret does? No, they can't take on as much, but they could take on an increase proportionally to what they their acreage is. But again, you can throw more cow permits, but that doesn't mean the cow hunters are gonna be successful without the effort going into it. So there's not really like a one size fits all solution. It's gotta be individual CWMUs that some of them can take more cow harvest with public hunters. Some of them cannot, and there may need, we, we will need to do other tools to get back down to objective in addition. 
can we be given that parameter when when it comes time for them to get their COR? If we know that they're not participating, that you can bet that's going to stick in my mind. I mean, and it should in our CWM advisory committee as well. That's a Chad answer. Yeah. So that's probably one of the parts that we're kind of missing on this because we have minimum harvest, and that's an agreement between the biologist and them. Um, but we don't have the amount of tags and. So a lot of times that's based off of the tags. So if 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 a CWMU had 20 tags a year, so they have 60, the minimum the harvest would probably be 50. Um, so it, it'd probably be a, a deeper conversation between us and CWMUs of saying, no, I really need you to kill 200. And then you'd see the tags jump up. But like right now, if you reviewed one of the CWMUs for the last three years, they very well could have hit their marks, but they're still potentially not killing as many elk as they could, if that if that makes sense. And one thing we could probably do is I think it's, I think they're supposed to fly this year, but we could look at where those elk are at in the winter time. It's just I don't know. It's it's like it's been said a lot of times, it's just really hard because sometimes you go up there with them and you say, Yeah, this isn't this isn't easy to kill elk here. And I think it will take a lot of boots on the ground being with them during the times of years year that elk could be harvested and making a judgment call that way but it really needs to be a concerted effort we do have the ability up there to even have reciprocal they can they can ask for reciprocal tag so if if one of those units that are higher in elevation a, a snow comes like this year and pushes the elk out they can say hey can we send our hunter down on your on your ground um to kill them and, and we we can do that and that doesn't have to fall through a 501c3 or anything to do those type of reciprocal tags not it, this was uh something we changed in rule a few years back and uh, made made it so we can do that and we've kind of used you know four specifically as the pilot program um could probably throw five and six in there too but but you know it it is a unique area in that you have a whole Lost Creek drainage and almost every side, like it's just CWMUs up there. Mm -hmm. uh, even our other high private lands don't have that amount of acreage and that connection, like almost all of them just seem like they touch each other. Um, so it, yeah, to me, it, it, it just needs to be a concerted effort. And maybe it is like, hey, we're gonna hunt them this day, you hunt them this day and let's push them back and forth to each other and let's get some harvest, but yeah, I, not easy. I had a quick, we had a quick, Matt's been up there for a minute, or do you want to go ahead, Mike, and then Matt, you're this, next. This is a comment more than anything. I think if you let the CWMU operators determine who shoots them, they could shoot way more elk. And I'm not trying to hammer on the public, but a lot of the stories we hear are how difficult the public and the amount of effort that they put in when they come to these CWMUs to hunt elk. Yeah. I think if we let the CWMUs pick the, those that shoot the elk, I think we could solve it pretty quick. Yeah, and I, I would say that's why there are different splits, so they could choose half of them. That was my if question. they chose a different split. They could. And we're talking antlerless right now, too, but I, I think we'd be remiss to say that we probably need more antlered harvest off of these CWMUs, too. Like, Jayla's numbers is what, almost it's, it's almost one-to-one -one bulls to cows, so we probably need just more total elk, antlered and antlerless. We can't do antlered right now, but 86 to 100, so 86 bulls for every 100 cows. Something to to, to think about if they could, uh, well, I don't know if we'd find, <laughs> if there was a way to issue more permits that they could find a way to, to distribute them how they, how they wanted to as far as bull tags go and maybe anyway yeah i hope that when we get to the comment question or well here in a minute to the public we'll have we'll be hearing from some of them i I've, they know better than us and I, I am glad that we have a lot of operators here today because i think there's a lot of misconceptions on and i, I think it them. shows that they're invested in this too yeah. so I, I appreciate them coming out okay matt so just in listening to this conversation, this is mostly a CWMU area, like a CWMU borders all the other CWMUs. How realistic is the division's expectation on 
who can kill elk when. You know, I mean, do we need to like revisit season dates based on migration patterns? Do we need more cooperation between the adjacent CWMUs? Is there a better time to hunt here versus there? I, yeah, I think I think the cooperation between CWMUs and all of them being on the same page and having it be their goal to be at objective is probably the key. As far as season dates go, they have from August 1st to January 31st. So they have they have a full six months that if elk are on them at any point in that time, they can they can have harvest them. So the season dates, um, I we can't we can't give them more time. Um, they have as much time as we we can give them. Um, but it, I think it is just a lot of cooperation of like, and maybe even breaking down the unit of saying we want this many over here and this many here and this many here. And we've got to commit to each other that we're going to make sure the harvest happens and that we stay at that objective. My experience of hunting on CWMUs is they don't want to start the cow hunts at all until they're completely done with their antlered hunts. Do you feel that that contributes to this problem at all? It, it is some, but it goes back to what we were talking about earlier is the reason they don't want to shoot the cows is that the cows are bringing the bulls in and they they want to have successful bull hunts they don't want to chase all the elk off of their property um so it's it's understandable for that but but yeah they do have the ability and and maybe the, maybe it is that they can surgically some of them could surgically take some of those elk off during when they're hunting the bulls um but but yeah it, it's that one's a little bit tricky because it bulls is where it's at for them when my uh, my son had a Deseret tag a couple of years ago, and we were part of a Utah State study where all the hunters had to have GPS transmitters and all the elk had GPS transmitters, and they were looking at how cow hunting pressure pushed animals off. Did that turn out to be a significant problem, pushing the animals off the CWMU? Yeah, and I know I know Randall finished that up, but I don't I don't know that I've heard that so i um i don't know ben or jim if you know what the findings on that were yeah so they they found out um similar to other studies that um yeah elk they they know when they're being pursued it is basically what what it come down to uh their 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 movements increased as they were specifically being targeted and if they were like only hunting the bulls the cows did not move as far but as as the cows were specifically being hunted the cows moved further all right we've had a, a lot of questions and i know you know, considering I think this topic is fairly important, considering it not only affects our cow elk, our, our antlerless elk, but it's affecting deer and a lot of different, there's a lot of parties in the room. I don't know if we I think people are a little tired right now, if it'd be appropriate, we'd, before we go into the questions from the public, if we took a 10 minute break. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I think we could get some more energy in the room a little bit, honestly. I think Mike's going to kill you if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> he just always looks angry. Let's take a 10 minute break. <laughs> you got your shoes off. <laughs>
Uh, get going. Thanks, everyone. Uh, hopefully, everyone got a little. Got it. We were able to. You were able to stretch. Are we good to to begin? Salt Lake. Are we good to begin? Recorders are running. Thank you. Recorder is running. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Um, before our break, we left off. We had just finished. I guess we hadn't finished. Is there? I'm hoping we finish questions from the rack and we can move on to. To I just heard Matthew thinks other. Matt. Sorry, I know you hate me right now. I have one more question for Chad. So it sounds like in thinking about this over the break, the elk are willing to live in places the cow hunters are not willing to go. Is there a mechanism where we could have like an on-call list if you got to like say randomly December 15th and you're under 50%, nobody's wanting to come hunt this. Can you call up additional hunters that are willing to put in additional effort to try to meet these quotas? So have a have an alternate draw list of dedicated, I guess we've already used dedicated hunters in a different area, but an alternate draw list of, I promise I'll go wherever to kill the cow elk. Well, basically, yeah. I mean, people, I mean, I mean, I can see your point. I mean, the point that you've made is that people that are drawing these tags are not willing to put in the effort. And if, if this is the primary problem, can we have an alternate list of people that, so yeah, I'm going to go do that. I'll go up there. I'll hike up there. Yeah, and we try to get that word out in the beginning. And a lot of CWMUs, a lot of them are actually building web pages, and they put on this is a difficult hunt. Um, and if if people are supposed to reach out to the CWMUs to know what type of a hunt it is before they put in, and so so some of that's supposed to be happening where a CWMU can say, look, this isn't this isn't easy. Like you can get an elk, but it's going to take take some effort. Um, I, I, it's something that we could probably explore going in the future. I don't think we could do it at this time. I think it'd probably take some rule changes, um, to be able to do something like that. But I, I think if you ask CWMUs, they would just rather have those at the beginning, not after December 15th. I think they'd, they'd say, well, let's just use that list from the beginning of those that are willing to put in a, a lot of work, but that's pretty subjective too. Like I, so I mean, yeah, it'd take it'd take a real change, and we we can try to keep getting the message out of the difficulty of of the hunt on each one, but it also takes research, and you can't really hold everybody accountable to put in for that. I think there's something similar to that already that could be considered precedent, if you will. These depredation type pools that you put into, and you say within. So many miles of your house, you can respond within three hours or 22 hours or something. So if we could take that and just use that as precedent to build over. Yeah, and and where it's yeah, where it's a little bit difficult is if you if you're giving out CWMU permits, um, you have public hunters already that are there. And so unless all of them have already filled and they're like, hey, we have the ability to fill more, I think we could we could probably do that right now. So if a CWMU Let's say they had 20 permits and they killed their 20, but they're saying, "Hey, I've I've got, I I could kill 50 more. Let's throw together a depredation hunt." I think we could probably do something like that, but it would probably have to be after everybody had a chance to kill to harvest. All right, we're going to move to questions from the public. This time, Travis Hobbs. I, I, you got to come up. I know you love being in front of everyone. Can I ask two questions? Yes. Okay. One's for me and one's for Jayla, though, right? There was your first. Oh, okay. So on the splits, can you tell me, like, what percentage of CWMUs go for the different splits? And, like, how, like you don't have to be exact, but just, like, a rough, like, in your head, like, what... What do you generally the ones that are not at a 90 10 split are on limited entry units where the tags are or more limited already on on the bowl permit so it, i would guess that it's on our general season units is 90. 95 to 100 percent yeah i mean as a businessman i just think it would be insane 
I mean, knowing what a buck and bull's worth, like that would just be crazy to not be in the 90 10 split. So to me, it's like hard to even wonder why we would even offer that. But th that's, but, um, and then just to be clear, operators are penalized right now if a public hunter doesn't come out on their ranch. Like we are literally penalizing them. They get almost a demotion as the rules written if a public hunter doesn't come up and, and take that hunt. Like, no. No, it, we're, we're a little bit more flexible with that. And with the permits you get, there should be, like, I don't think any of them say, give me 60 per permits over three years and we'll kill 60. Like, yeah. so there's a little bit of, of leeway there for um, just circumstances <laughs> I mean, if they, where. If, they, if 10 public hunters, I guess what I'm asking is if 10, 15 public hunters, say 10, seven of them refuse to take a hike up, they get penalized though for them correct that's kind of the the there's pot are. there's potential can i can I, I make one quick comment just to address travis's question yeah when you see the three-year average you don't know that was what happened yeah so on on the committee yeah. as a guy sitting on that committee you take that three-year re review and you look back and you say god you guys missed the boat what happened here and, and it, like you just said, Travis, yeah. it's 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 a case where they didn't show up. It's so, just crazy to me. Like uh, I'm having the hardest time understanding how we would. We haven't been super firm on that. And and the the CW operator I was talking about earlier, I told him I said you keep track of that. And so if he did get called before the CWMU advisory committee, he said he has his notes. Yeah, this year. I offered and offered and eight guys said they didn't even want to come. I couldn't get my harvest because yeah. I'm not getting the response. And, and we, and the committee too, like we, we will listen to that. You don't know. So they do have to show up and tell you that, but, but that'd be another thing I'd say with CWMUs in general is it's good to have that communication with your biologist at, at all times. So like given this year, I've, I've had feedback from a different, a couple different ones. And that's what it is, is like, hey, we're busting our butts. I'm, I'm offering top dollar to guides to come out and guide these. We're, we're throwing out all the bells and whistles, and we have people that are saying, I can't make it. And and I've had multiple CWMUs tell me that. So now I know, I do know that. And when the choice comes to take them to the CWMU advisory committee, it, we're probably not, because I know why they didn't sure. get their harvest. It wasn't from lack of effort. Well, so I'm glad we, to hear that, because that is a giant problem. Like, I, I can't even imagine. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyways. But. Any other questions for for the division from the public? All right, you're sleeping again. We're gonna get the public feedback on the item. I hope no potential voters are watching this. <laughs> I'm sorry. They'd be doing me a life favor. <laughs> okay. So on this item, we had 11 total votes. Six were strongly agreed, two somewhat agreed. Two neutral, one somewhat disagreed, and zero strongly disagreed. So weighted average of 4.18. Oh. I would say most everyone was in favor of, of the proposal as as it was given. All right, we'll uh, now go to public comment. As of right now, I have two on this, and we're going to start with Randy Sessions. It's past his bedtime, so we're gonna. First of all, I would have been as tall as Ben if I hadn't been born in Wyoming and leaned against the wind the first part of my life. <laughs> the second thing is I've had the opportunity to work the last two summers with Haley Wayman up, up my way. She comes at night, she counts the elk. Um, I sit next to a, a CWMU. This last year we had 40 head of elk. This year we had as many as 60 head of elk and I got compensation for my crops. They showed up as early as May. They stay in the river bottoms. They never leave. They, they eat me up. I've done a little bit of math. The CWMU, if they sold out-of-state tags, they would make $9,000. With the hay at $300 a ton, that $9,000 barely, barely covered my crop loss. 
the thing is, like I said earlier, that group has not been killing any cow elk on the project tonight. They're there to kill eight. So I went from 40 to 60 on two years of dry weather. And so I'm not winning. You guys aren't winning because your dollars that need to pay these guys is coming to me to buy hay. And so there needs to be an incentive program. I don't know what it is. If you don't kill cow elk, you will like this. If you don't kill bull elk, next year you don't get as many tags. I mean, if you don't kill cow elk, you don't get as many tags next year to sell to the public. There's got to be an incentive program in it somehow. Now, I put up with public hunters on my place. I'm old. I can't go with them. And I, the trouble is, is I have a CWME next to me. If they crawl over the fence, I, I, I tell them, if you wound one and goes over the fence, do not follow it. Come back, shoot another one another day. I know that would be illegal, but I don't want to put up with the CWMU charging them for trespass. So there's some dynamics here that just need to change. Uh, the first CWMU came next to us about 2006. And it's just the numbers have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger every year. And I'm across the freeway. I'm on the East Canyon deal where there's a thousand head. My plan is to send them to Salt Lake. I'm going home, go to bed. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right. Uh, sorry, Travis Hobbs here. Drug deals going on. So I just want to be clear before I start. I'm not associated with the CWMU. I'm a landowner in Utah, but I am not next one. I don't hunt on them. I, I have, I don't care what they do, but I want to say a few things. It's troubling to me looking at these rules from the outside looking in. I feel like there's got to be some real changes to the CWMU program, especially in this area. Like if these guys are wanting to kill cow elk and we're tying their hands, I think there's got to be something we have to work towards that. And I'm thinking like, why not give them permits? Um, every buck and bull hunter that's already there, let's give them a permit. Let's on a unit that's over objective, let's issue, give them so many permits that they can do with what they want. They can get private hunters in and they can manage. I can't even imagine how hard it would be to get public hunters to do it. But one thing that's troubling to me, is when you're talking a 10 year, like you were mentioning, this has been a problem for 10 years, guys, that's, we got to take care of it. Like, let's come up with, think outside the box. I don't know if it's July hunts. Some states are implementing early hunts. I know there's issues with that, but like, let's look at different ways and give these guys some tools to manage these. I, uh, I've had some disagreements with them in the past and I have some friends that are operators and I know they're, I, I think the CWMU program is vital. I think it's very important, but let's make it work for everybody. I think I think there's a lot of I think there's room for improvement. So that's my thoughts. I hope at least at minimum we can do that recommendation of like let's give every buck and bull hunter. I don't think I don't think there would be anybody that would be opposed to having an extra cow elk tag. Maybe there is. But let's at least do that. And then if a unit's over objective, let's look at giving them. Let's take whatever it's over objective, let's issue a percentage of tags on how much land they operate and just give them to do with what they want until it's back to objective. Those are my thoughts. Thank you. All right. I don't think we have any other comment cards. Well, we're gonna go ahead and go to our rat comment. Matt. If I'm thinking back about eight years ago, the original question was to give somebody a variance on a land separation thing. And I guess my, my heartburn about that, I mean, it sounds like this would be a good deal because this land isn't hunted at all currently, but I'm worried about this coming back to bite us because there's really no parameters on how we make this decision. like is a mile too far is two miles too far um i just i feel like we need more guidance on how to make these decisions yeah, i guess 
I would agree with that. And I also think that's what the advisory committee was there for. So we have to hope that we have the, the right guys on there that can make those decisions. And, uh, but, but I agree there needs, to, but they're having parameters would be something I, I would hate to see, you know, it get out of hand where we added another 4,000 acres and now all of a sudden they have the, I mean, you might get another public permit, but I don't know. I, I just think it needs to be addressed. You know, I, I'm not against this, these, you know, with it being the proximity that they are, but I, I do think that if it's a five mile number or something, we probably ought to, unless we're just gonna let the advisor each time to decide, but I, I feel like some boundaries. I, I really wish I had my notes because I could look back on this. This has been a minute since we looked at it, but but it's not taken lightly. I don't want you guys to think for one second that it hasn't been vetted. We just willy nilly said, hey, a couple miles down the road, no problem. It didn't work that way. So. I trust that. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, and in, in that regard, and I think that's in, in the rack, I think we kind of go back and forth where <laughs> this this balance between having a consistent way we do everything and, but then we need to kind of customize everything. And if you, I mean, you can take that across the board and everything we're doing right here between cutting deer tags in the north end of the state and we're raising them in the south. So it's not always a one size fits all. So when we have things in place like the CWMU committee who can help review that and give us some insight into some of that stuff. I think it's vital to have that additional input there. Um, but as far as this as a whole, um, based off with some of the comments we're here. So, so here's what I think is interesting. This kind of catch 22 is we have so many elk we're over objective on some of these units. Ironically, it's because of the CWMU program that have helped grow the elk herd from what it used to be. We went from being intolerant of elk to being tolerated and wanting them there. So um, there's a lot of benefits to it. And I think it's something that we've talked about at least for the past couple of years is there can still be tweaks to the program there um, in, in helping to kind of push this along, be a bit more successful. And this was, this was something that I remember talking with, with, biologists about this and hadn't really crossed my mind before when you start talking about public hunters and hunter satisfaction on CWMU's success rates, you go back and you think, so, so my son drew a CWMU tag for a cow this year and we went up in about three hours and shot a cow really easily and drove right, right next to the road. <coughs> it was nice, but not all are going to be that way. And think we get into the the mindset that everybody who draws a tag I mean you look at say Deseret they're burning four or five points six points whatever it's up to right now to go hunt a cow and depending on the hunters and who it's going to be you're going to get differing levels of effort that they're willing to put in and that's just the reality of it we see it across the board on general season units as well how we manage that and I think to me that's where it comes into can we build things into the program that give tools to operators in the division when we're over objective that kind of let us free up the, the sideboards a little bit from it's just going to be a 90-10 split and they get all the permits but it all has to be public draw. Sometimes I think we pigeonhole ourselves into not being able to be flexible enough to be successful. This is this is when it's over objective and we're trying to, to balance things out. It's not just on everything across the board. I think there's options there we probably haven't explored enough um, that would that would help that situation go going forward. Travis Travis's comment about the you know giving an opportunity for someone who has a bull or a buck tag on there to have a cow tag. I've been told, I don't know, I can't, that this has been happened in the past, that there have been the ability to give a, cow, a permit or a voucher to someone, let's say, who both bought or drew the, drew the permit. Was that ever, did that ever happen? I, I don't think on CWMUs. I mean, we have, we have them for regular hunts. 
Um, but I don't, I don't think it's been on CWMUs. Am I wrong? I, I, for the record, I think we'd explore it though. I don't know if it happened. Uh, Kobe Jones. Legally. <laughs> Wildly cheap. Um, I don't know if it happened, but there was probably a point in time where it legally could have happened. Um, right now, it is, it's currently against rule, and there would need to be some modifications. And I understand that there needs to be tools to address this issue. We can't just keep doing the same thing we're doing and expecting different results. So it's going to have to be a, a lot of give and take between the seat of Muse and the division. And this year just highlighted the fact that if we don't do something, we run the risk of permanently hurting deer. You know, we, 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 we get focused so much on bucks, bucks come, bucks go. You hunt bucks, you hunt fewer bucks, you hunt, you have good years, bad years, whatever. And deer populations always oscillate. Where a biologist starts to get nervous is when you hit those peaks, you hit weather like we had, you're heading towards a valley. And because of outside factors, in this case, probably too many mouths on the landscape with elk, you recover more slowly and your next peak is a little lower and you trend down, right? You don't have the body condition scores. You don't have the fawn recruitment. You don't have the survival rates. So it, it is a problem. We need extra tools and you probably can't do You, I know you can't do it right now because I know what the rule says. So we need to look at some modifications and tools. I hope these conversations are going to begin that process so where they, you can get those tools. I, I really like the idea. You know, you think of someone who, about having a cow permit with a bull hunter, you know, someone who has drawn a permit on certain CWMUs, burning a lot of points, 20, 22 points invested into it or more. Um, someone who's purchased them to spend a lot of money. Um, and the CWMU operators are trying to provide a, a good experience for all of them. It's hard to let cow hunters go up there in September, into September and October. And then there's no doubt that we start shooting cows and those, those times sending public cow hunters in there, it's going to affect the experience of those people. But same token, if those same hunters have a cow, it's a little easier for the, them to determine to be able to shoot a shoot a cow at the same time with what they know what's going to affect their hunt or not. They could kill a bull and kill a cow right after. Um, I've experienced this helping on the CWMU down in the Southern Utah. You know, you, you know, there's a cow somewhere that's not going to affect your hunt or anyone else on the ranches and, and what an opportunity to take it. I would love to see that tool put in the toolbox, you know, for our managers and for our CWMUs to help meet objectives, find a way to, to do that so that we can be efficient and continue to provide a good good opportunity for everyone. And, and Brad, I never thought about what, what you said is a great comment. We have this problem and it is be, because of our cooperative wildlife management <laughs> units. I mean, they helped us get the elk here. And I think they'd be willing to help us if we can give them the opportunity too. So I, I, when that rule comes and when that happens, I hope, I don't know that there's a, any type of motion that can be made here in our meeting tonight to encourage that, but I hope just having this discussion and conversation right now, when that rule opens, we, these things are gonna be discussed. Um, any other comments? Yeah, I'm just gonna chime in real quick. I'm not gonna get into the rule things because I'm waiting to see. I wanna see what you guys come up with and I'm assuming it's gonna be aggressive and dynamic. Um, <clears throat> but I did wanna address, uh, address the variances real quick. Um, the North Peaks, honestly, doesn't give me any heartburn. I don't like that big space but they already qualified for everything. And I'm gonna massacre the name, the Avicwin Canyon. I don't get it. We're giving them two variances. They didn't qualify for elk to begin with, and now we're looking for a second variance. That doesn't make any sense. Now, I know you're on board and you're the one thing that makes me hesitate in saying that because if everyone else is like you, I just, just like what the board said, but 
I don't get the double variance. We've got rules for a reason. We didn't follow any so of them. Variance take care of and I have no idea who these people are. If they're here, hope I'm not offending you, but that's just the way I see it. With that, this is a question. If this variance was granted, it would actually meet the, it would eliminate the need for the second variance? No, because it still be wouldn't non, be it'd be non contiguous. It's, Oh, but gotcha. Sorry, but the, yeah, the second one is a variance. But I, I guess just to be clear, there isn't a rule saying you can't have non-contiguous land. I mean, the the one variance gives them that for it to be an elk CWMU, but the the second one is like if they were just a deer CWMU, then we could grant that without it going against the rule, um, so to speak. So. And I understand that, I, I do, but this gets back to my point is we have rules. You know, we have parameters that we set up and the only reason this is being considered is because how many years ago we gave them a variance. So it's a variance built upon a variance, technically maybe not a variance, but that's my problem, yeah, with this one. Right. Do we, we, do we feel like with the conversation that we have, we can accomplish everything that everyone wants to in one motion, or do we feel like we need to divide this up at all? Or how, how does the rack feel? Say that again. I'm good with that. We have anyone, is everyone okay? Is there any other comments about the variances? I do entertain a motion specific to, to that. And there's two of them. So let's, let's do it this way. Like I said, I think I'm the only one being cranky, but um, I, I'd make the motion that we address the variances separately. And so I'd make the motion to address North Peak, North Peak and uh, move to accept that as proposed. I got distracted. <laughs> I better open this monster, other monster. So just on the one, you just made. Okay, so we we have a motion to accept the North Peak variance as presented. We have a second. I'll second. And we have a second from Brad. Any discussion on this one? Call for a vote. Ryan Brown. Yes. Brad Buchanan. Yes. Jamie Butler? Yes. Paul Chase? Yes. Randy Hutchinson? Yes. Emily Jensko? Yes. Matt Clark? Yes. Mike Lauder? Yes. <clears throat> Kevin McLeod? Yeah. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. I'll make a second motion on the, if you want to pronounce it, Glen <laughs> Canyon. Um, I would. Uh, I would recommend not accepting that. Uh, that. So I have a motion not to accept the Aveniquin Canyon. Don't know the whole name of the CWMU, but I think everyone knows what we're talking about. So we have a motion to deny that variance. We have a second. Okay, motion dies as lack of a second. Failed. All right. Okay. I'll make the motion that we accept the variance on or approve the variance on. <laughs> now you screwed me up. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> companion. <laughs> okay, we have a motion from Brad. I'll second. And a second from Mike. No other discussion. I'll call for a vote. Brian Brown. Yes. Brad Buchanan. Yes. Jamie Butler. Yes. Paul Chase. Yes. Randy Hutchinson. No. I had to get one no for the day. Emily Jensko. Yes. Matt Clark. Yes. Mike Carter. Yes. And Kevin McLeod. Yes. Motion passes. What is the number here? I haven't had to count yet. One, one with one against. <laughs> and everyone else. <clears throat> So motion passes. Okay, let's continue with the discussion with the same agenda item. 
Huh? Yeah, Randy, let's give you a second to explain, I think. It just what I said earlier, uh, it's a variance upon variance. It doesn't make sense to run business that way. Okay. We got that. Okay. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and discuss the permits. Can I ask one clarifying question? As far as to open up the rule, that, that rule, we're talking all this discussion, all this can take place. The CWNU rule, when is that? Is that open now, right? Or is coming open? So, so yeah, it's due to be reviewed is probably the better way to, to okay. phrase it rather than. So would it be appropriate to have an, a motion to open that for review? Or is that not gonna make a difference? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> we can do what we want. I just, right, yeah. we're wasting our time. That might be for Ben. Do you know the answer? I would say if you want to make a recommendation that the, that the division review it, um, I think that'd be okay at a later time. But we can't, we certainly couldn't. Take we couldn't action. put a timeline on it? I wouldn't, I'd refer. We can put it in our motion and hope the wildlife board would follow, right? Yeah, but I think the recommendation has to come from the division on this one, right? Well, and I'll throw in too, there's some wild cards from the legislators that you really need it that could be thrashed out. So I would be hesitant to put in a tight time. All right. We have Kyle. Kyle, are you still awake? <laughs> and or alive? Uh, just barely on both. Oh, we're in a <laughs> we're in tie. tie. Still, I would have bet he's in his pajamas. <laughs> 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 Kyle Maynard. Uh, One of your lawyers are miserable. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I guess, can you repeat the question? He was asleep. <laughs> <laughs> no, so it sounds like we have a couple different thoughts. So I just wanted to get a, a kind of a single. The CWMU is open for review. The, the uh, what would you call it? The CWMU rules. Um, if Iraq were to make a motion to put a deadline or, or to get them to open that. I mean, know it's up for review, but there's no date or how, could we make a recommendation and put a timeline on that, that it's addressed by next year's hunting season? I, I don't know, or something to that effect. Uh, I mean, I think legally you could put a, a time frame on it, but I would I defer to the vision on making a good rule that it works well. Okay. That help. Yep. Yep. You can go back to sleep. Thanks, man. Thank you. I don't know how you sleep in a suit, but good on you. Years of training. Okay. Any other comments or any thoughts on making a a motion? You're thinking it. Counting on you, Brad. Yeah, I'm looking I at you. I don't really know how to approach this one, but um, I'll make the motion that we approve the antlerless permit recommendations as presented with the addition of. With the, with the request that the division um, brings back proposals for um, more options for harvest on CWMUs outside of the public draw, public draw structure, I should say. I like that. I'm gonna read what you just wrote. So we have a motion by Brad to accept the recommendation as as presented with the request. Yeah. Proposal for CWMUs to to harvest and then Mountain Dew hasn't kicked in yet. With the request, the division bring back a proposal for CWMUs. Uh, for uh, more options for harvest outside of the public okay. draw process. Okay. Yes. Or I guess everything. Oh. OK. 
Okay, sorry. I'm, I'm waiting to see if I read yours. So we have the, the motion by Brad to to accept the re recommendation as presented with the request that the division um, bring back a proposal with more options for CWMUs to harvest outside of the public drop process. Do I have a second? Any comment on it? Do you have a question? Do you want to? Question. So, my concern with that, and I actually like that a lot, but if you go outside the drop process, most of these are prepared to come in. And so, you taking away from Point Creek such an issue, I would hate to limit the options to outside, outside the drop. Okay, well, you can talk to your microphone, please. Yeah. Um, I'd hate to limit limit the options to just outside the draw. If we could um, amend that or change that slightly to where it includes the draw process, because point creep's point creep. I mean, we're, we're gonna die by it. Anything we can do to whittle it down rather than add to it, I, I think would be beneficial, if that makes sense. Can I make a comment on that comment? <laughs> <laughs> It'd require a second draw which would be almost impossible. Well, we're, uh, we're asking for them to so come back with I'm, something, so we're so not. So what I'm trying to say is maybe just eliminate the language of uh, public draw. Our just say, point. look at more options on on take. And not just, not, 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 yeah, yeah. not okay. say to bypass the, the okay. public draw. Can I amend my motion? Yes. Okay. You want me to read how I amended it for you? Yes, I do. <laughs> uh, Motion by Brad Buchanan to approve the antlerless permit recommendations as presented with a request the division bring back a proposal for more options for CWM used to harvest more oak. Yes. I have a second on that motion. I'll second. I have a second from Mike. Any more discussion? Let's call for a vote. Brian Brown. Yes. Brad Buchanan. Yes. Jamie Butler. Yes. Paul Chase. Yes. Randy Hutchinson? Yes. Emily Jansko? Yes. Matt Clark? Sorry, yes. All right. Mike Lauder? Yes. And Kevin McLeod? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. That was a long one, but thank you. All right. <clears throat> Agenda item number 11, CWMU rule amendments. We'll, also, we'll hear from Chad again. Um, anything you'd like to add before we open up to questions? No, let's just go into questions. I have none. This one was really short. So I, I know. Any I don't questions? Know what I'd add. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? Any questions from the public? Oh, you've got it on the screen. We're going to public feedback. <laughs> we have a total 19 votes, 13 strongly agreed, three somewhat agreed, two were neutral, zero somewhat disagreed, and we had one strongly disagreed for a weighted average of 4.42. Right. So there's a lot of <clears throat> positive public feedback on this as well. <clears throat> All right, I don't, let's see. We do have quite a few actually comments on this. Um, Gary, is it all right we start with you? Is the, so we'll start with Gary Webb and then we'll go to Andrew Blomquist on deck and then I think I actually just have those two comments. Gary Webb on behalf of the CWMU Association and we, um, as far as the association goes, we uh, agree with the recommendation from the Division of Wildlife. Thank you. All right. Did I see Andrew? Did he bell? Did he bell? It says right here, buck deer permit allocations and other concern raised during the, the meeting. I'm not sure what, what he means by that, but all right. <clears throat> with that, we'll go to Comments from the rack. To entertain a motion. 
I'd move that we accept it as proposed. I'll second it. All right. So we have a, a motion to accept as pre presented and a second. That was by Randy and a second by Kevin. Any discussion before I call for a vote? All right. Ryan Brown. Yes. Brad Buchanan. Yes. Jamie Butler. Yes. Paul Chase. Yes. Randy Hutchinson. Yes. Emily Jensko. Yes. Matt Clark. Yes. Mike Lauder. Yes. And Kevin McLeod. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. All right. We'll now go to agenda item number 12, big game rules and amendments. Uh, we'll have Dax come back up. I just had a monster, so I'm, I'm ready to go. <laughs> I'm ready to open my we Stay all night. All right. All night. All right. <laughs> Thank you to whoever that was. <laughs> okay. Any questions from, from the rack? All right. Questions from the public? None. Public feedback? 19 total votes, 13 strongly agreed, three somewhat agreed, two neutral, zero disagree, one disagree, weighted average 4.42. Right. So once again, we have public feedback in favor of the proposal. Um, we have no comment cards on this agenda item from, from the public. So any comments from comments or mo a comment? Go ahead. Just a quick comment at all. Oh, I, I love the change to the uh, big game and having to check location. Um, and I don't, law enforcement doesn't need to come up and address it. I think it will be very difficult to enforce, um, but I like that. <coughs> no rules are for the 80% of people that follow them. So I, I really appreciate that change. All right, I got Matt Clark, and then we'll go to Kevin. I guess I have two questions. One is this strongly disagree guy, the same guy every time? <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> And two on the on the uh, meat salvage is that actually a problem that we're trying to solve, or what is what is the rationale for adding that to the rule right now? I, I can answer both of those. Uh, the disagree guy, I think, is my father-in-law, and uh, <laughs> the the meat the meat salvage. Um, you know, that's something that we ju we just needed to have that language in rule. Uh, most hunters are pretty good, but our officers are. Uh, you know, they're tasked sometime with uh, when they do deal with a with bad apple that's not salvaging the meat. Um, you know, we need something in rule to back them up so that we can we can be ethical, we can be responsible with how we hunt. And it, it mirrors very closely language that a lot of other states have in their in their version of the taking big game rule. And so, um, yeah, we just wanted to, to make that official and put it in the rule there. Kevin? Uh, I just wanted to to thank Colby. Uh, Colby has uh, promised me for the last couple of years that that, uh, that go and check where if the animal's been hit would be done. I brought it up a couple of years ago and Dave Beveridge, uh, appreciate you guys working on that and, and getting it through. I think it's a, it, I'd like we said, it's, I, I was in law enforcement for almost 40 years. It's, it's a tough rule, but it's there. So, and I, I, I just really appreciate it. Thanks, you guys. Any other, <clears throat> excuse me, any other comments or motions? And I'll make a motion to accept as presented. I'll second. So I have a motion by <clears throat> Kevin to accept as presented and a second by Ryan Brown. Any discussion on the motion before I call for a vote? Ryan Brown. Yes. Brad Buchanan. Yes. Jamie Butler. Yes. Randy Hutchinson. Oh, sorry, Paul Chase. Yes. Randy Hutchinson. Yes. Emily Jensko. She stepped up. Oh, she stepped up. Okay. Matt Clark. Yes. Mike Lauder. Yes. And Kevin McLeod. Yes. Motion passes unanimously with one not present. Okay. Our final agenda item, seeing that everyone is, most of you are still here, I think we're here to talk about some of these things. 
<clears throat> so we have agenda item number 13, big game rule amendments. Um, this it comes from our technology committee recommends. And we have Derek Ewell here as a wildlife biologist. Um, we'll start with questions from the Iraq for, for Derek. It's uh, Gabe. Gabe, I'm sorry, I knew that. No, Derek's on the agenda. He was the one that presented but last fall. Your name tag probably should have given that away. I apologize. I drew the short straw, so not many biologists carry guns in public. <laughs> <laughs> you might start. It might, yeah. Okay. Um, I guess just a couple points of clarification with the archery definition. In uh, the rule, now I can't find a section. It, it talks about illuminated sight pins. Mm -hmm. so is a sight light? Say that allowed? again. A sight light? Yes, that's that's essentially what that's saying. Yeah, so you can have a light that illuminates your fiber optic pins. Or... We have we have part of it that says no electronics, but we allow other sight lights. Yeah, we talked about that in depth with the committee. Um, most of the committee were bow hunters. Um, well, they hunt everything, but a lot of them were bow hunters. And so that doesn't aid in the take of wildlife. In fact, we feel that, that light actually in the, in the dark, say you're in the dark timber hunting elk and you got a bull coming in, you turn that light on because it's, you think you can shoot after hours. That ain't happening. It's going to blur out that elk. It's really only helpful in the sun um, when it's really bright to identify those. So it didn't really help. Um, in the take of wildlife. It was, most sites come with them. And so it's hard to find a site without one today. Um, one other, prohibit the use of projectiles for which the path can be altered or electronically tracked. So I, assuming this isn't going to include the Bluetooth knocks. Um, so, yeah, so Bluetooth Knox, that was, a, I can't remember what that's called off the top of my head, but that's a new technology. I mean, it's been out for probably, probably four or five years. It's just starting to hit the hit the ground. Um, we feel like the, the, the committee felt like that could be abused um, as Bluetooth technology becomes, what it is now is way above and beyond what it was 10 years ago, and it's gonna continue to improve so, um, you can use that, I, you can send that to somebody else. They can help you find your animal in the future that could be abused. And so we felt like that, that was something to get ahead of. Okay. One last question. Um, prohibiting the use of any type of aircraft or drone to attempt or observe or locate any protected wildlife. Someone who's not a hunter is flying a drone and sees a deer with it. They have now broken the law. If it's during the uh, July 31st through um, January 31st, it I, you tell me how to write that without excluding those people. That, that's the problem with that. If you write it any other way, um, we're open to ideas on how to write that. That's but, I think was part of the discussion when we got into a trail camps is it was more focused on the take or attempt to take a big yeah. game. Yeah, and so, I mean, you got the harassment statement. problem. If someone's going out and videoing a group of elk and they're running down running down the road, I mean, I saw it just the other day. Someone sent me a video of someone in the winter we're having videotaping elk running um, for a long ways. And so that, that'd be harassment. So if you've got someone out there that wants to video wildlife and they're harassing those animals, then that would fall under harassment. And so whether you're for the take or not, if you use that, I mean, you got to be responsible with that. Um, everybody wants to video wildlife, and drones are really fun, but they can, they can be highly abused, um, especially in the winter time, like the winter we're having now. Well, there was a lot of comments on um, use of radios and cell phones. Could you just clarify what you could use radios and cell phones for and what you can't? Yeah, so it's pretty simple. There's a couple of states, well, handful of states that have this. We focused on Montana and Alaska. Um, Montana's rule um, doesn't allow them for the take of, of protected wildlife. Alaska goes one step further and says, 
you can't use them for um, the take of a specific animal. And so we didn't want to, it doesn't make any sense to limit people for like a, a safety thing or, hey, come over here, let's have lunch type thing. Um, or let's meet back at camp or where are you at type type deal. It's more of someone specifically stock or guiding someone in um, that's stalking an animal. So, so Paul, I'm on one side of the ridge and you're on the other side of the ridge and you're coming in and I found a buck for you. And, and I specifically say, Hey, he is, you need to, you need to go to the North. You need to go up 30 feet or whatever. And I guide you into that. That's what this specifically is designed to stop. And so I know when I've used that hunting in my career of a hunter, I don't know if you call it a career. I call it my culture. Cause that's all I am, man. I'm a hunter. Take that away from me and life sucks. <laughs> but, um, when I've had someone guide me in or I've guided someone in, the opportunity for take goes through the roof in my personal experience. And the committee felt that that was a, a kind of across the board thing. It, it really offers you more opportunity to harvest an animal. I agree and I appreciate you taking that on. Yeah, and I think the public, when you read the, the comments online, um, on social media and whatnot, I don't think people really read or listened to the whole you know, the whole rack presentation, the, whether they read it or they watched the YouTube, I just think they were snowballing off each other. Cause I can see myself in that shoe saying, well, they want to take my radio away from me now. Oh, that, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So don't read the comments. That's right. Mike. Uh, Ryan. I have a question just with this on the idea of the use of the word of restricted. How is that as opposed to traditional, primitive, something like that? So the committee, we, we discussed that um, a couple of times at least, a couple of times. And yeah, that can be confusing. Um, but if you go back to, if you say it's primitive, what's a primitive rifle? What's a traditional rifle? And so restricted, in my mind as a law enforcement officer, restricted means, hey, this comes with the whole whole another bag of tricks there's there's something that i need to look into because it's restricting something if i've got this restricted archery tag okay well that now that makes me think i have to start focusing on what's restricted is this not a regular bow can i do i have to look and so that's that's one point on that but it is confusing and you can see from the comments from last year that that was who would have thought archer would have got 90 percent of the attention um but it did and that restricted was part of that so hey, matt, matt clark sorry so i'm hoping you can speak to i didn't really get a clear uh understanding from the comments but there seems to be like this huge misunderstanding in the public on this whole additional restricted class of weapons. I mean, if you look at the public comments and the emails that we get, people seem to be <clears throat> against having these additional restricted seasons. Like they're afraid that they're gonna not be able to use their regular muzzleloader in the regular season. I mean, is this a communication problem? Um, so we're just getting a lot of negative feedback about what is essentially an additional season yeah that is confusing um to a lot of people it has been confusing i think some things that i've heard that i've talked to people about it was it going to be an extra hunt that's going to take more tags away from another hunt or is it going to be its, its own deal or um is this going to be for the general season a lot of people believe that these were taking scopes off a rifle and that's going to be the new any weapon and that's just not the case. And so I think it is a communication problem. Um, this is, I mean, when you're trying to explain to people uh, to limit technology with restricted weapon types, there's gonna be confusion because a lot of people aren't, they're reading comments, they're, they're, not, they're not watching the videos, they're, it's a snowball effect. And so I think it's a really easy concept to, to grasp once you actually listen. Um, and you want to learn what it really is instead of learning why you want to hate it. Go ahead, Randy. <clears throat> I've got a few, but I think they're pretty easy, mostly just clarifications. 
um, into that. One, I'm surprised you didn't define, and if I, miss, if I missed it, I apologize, but I'm surprised you didn't define electronics in the, um, in the language. Was there a reason you did not? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, I don't feel like we felt like we had to. Electronics is, I mean, point at something, I'll tell you if it's electronics, is your, your eyeglasses aren't electronic. Your, what, your, your watch is. Uh, what about the lighted um, pins? The lighted pins, that is that is a little bit of confusion. But again, that was a, I think they didn't aid in the take. And try to find a bow sight without one. And so we've got a lot of guys that would have to go and buy a whole lot of specific equipment to meet that standard if we didn't allow that. And so and we talked about that in the committee quite a bit. We didn't want to incur new costs or a bigger burden um, on our hunters if we didn't have to. Okay, no, and I, I think it's just from my background that I'm surprised it wasn't defined. I think I think down the line you're gonna run into yeah, problems. Yeah, and that could be easily defined. Electronics is one of those things that I don't think would take much effort to, to explain. Okay. Um, Another quick one was you allowed, um, the proposal was to allow cameras on um, bows as long as they're not aiding in the take. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised that wasn't included on shotguns. So it will be allowed on a shotgun for like upland game and all that. I've never, we, I've never personally seen someone, I've been doing this for 18 years, that had a shotgun hunting big game with a camera on it. No, I'm thinking of And so it, this is a, I think it was a consistency thing to try to make it um, consistent across the board with anything that you're gonna be using to hunt a big game that goes bang. You can't have a camera on it. You can't have so it did I miss that in the definitions? I apologize. No, I no, you're right. So archery is the only one that would allow you to have a camera on it. And archery, that's one thing that I see a growing number of public because the bow, you know, with your follow throughs you shoot, you don't have to have the camera on your head. There's, there's not a kick really. I mean, you can get a good flight path with that arrow and get a video. So you see a lot of people doing that. It's usually close shots. And so we didn't want to take that away from people because, again, it didn't aid in the take of wildlife. We didn't feel like a camera on your bow would help you take wildlife, which it would not a rifle, right? But we wanted to make everything that goes bang consistent. So it's easier follow, easier so, read. So where does it clarify you can use it for upland? That's where I was saying maybe I'm. So yeah, this it. is all big game. There's okay. It does it specify big game? Then yeah, I apologize. this is just for I big game. It. All these just technologies just for big game. And then the last thing, um, and this is just to clear. I want to hear you say it to clear to clear it up for the public. On um, e calls, I received um, several feedback on e calls with predators. I know what you're going to say, but I want to hear you say it. Yeah, this is just for big game. I mean. <laughs> This is not going to affect predator calls or anything. And actually, there was five years ago, probably three years ago, I called two investigators. I researched it myself and called two investigators and probably eight officers and asked them, is it illegal to use an electronic call on big game hunts? We all thought it was, but it wasn't. And so it's kind of a hidden secret in Utah. I shouldn't be saying this on YouTube. But, very effective cow. <laughs> but it's very effective. I've used it on a lot of youth hunts to kill cow elk. Very effective. Awesome. Thank you. With the definition of restricted muzzle loaders limited to flint lock and percussion lock, did the committee look at wheel locks, match locks, other types of... Yeah, um... When we were writing the rule with uh, with with the wildlife section and with uh, uh, my chief, um, we talked about that. And at some point when you, I don't know, it could be put in there, right? But the the we're restricting something. So if you want to use something that's less restrictive or that's more restrictive than a, a cap that it is exposed, fully exposed, which means not a 209 primer. I don't think you can have any problems in the state of Utah wanting to use a wheel lock. Or if you want to light a wick and walk around in the mountains and <laughs> go boom, I don't think you're gonna have any problems with that. But we could put that in the rule. That was something that-, that So, so with that reasoning that with the restricted weapons, a person can go to an even more restricted type of weapon 
and not get in trouble. So then can we presume that the use of ad laterals would be legal in Utah after this? No, no, that's not defined. Uh, you definitely not on a muzzle up front. But, but under the umbrella of archery, uh, with that being a precursor to the bow, if the match lock and wheel lock are precursor to it, it's flint It's a locks. good point. That's something that should be discussed. Uh, we we could have dropped the ball and not adding that in there. Um, that's just my take on it and how I see it and how I'd enforce it. And so, but that's a good point. If it doesn't say you can use it, there could be some confusion on if you can use it. So. Gabe, I've got a question, hypothetical or a situation. You and I are hunting together. Um, I'm glassing from one ridge. You're on another. I see that there are elk in the drainage that I'm looking in. You're on the next radio or phone call. Gabe, the elk are in this drainage. Is that legal? I mean, it's not a specific animal. It's a group of animals. Um, if you were to walk me in on those on the, on those animals, then that's where the problem would occur. But if, if me and you were hunting and that scenario happened, that would not be illegal at that point. So, and another scenario is me and you were hunting in the Uinas, which I love to be in. I will never take you to where I hunt, Justin, <laughs> but <laughs> we can hypothetical this. Um, and we're, say we're in the same drainage or different drainages, whatever, we're just hunting. Um, and I hear some elk bugling. And in the UN is that sometimes a rarity, right? You're like, oh man, elk are bugling. Except we're for gonna where you go. Day. This is gonna be a good day. And so I could call you on the radio and say, hey, elk are bugling over here. You wanna come over here and then we'll, we'll go after them. Perfectly legal under this code. So I'm a CWMU operator and I've got cows in a certain area. Same thing, we can call and say, hey, the cows are over here as we're trying to, it's not yeah. gonna matter. Maybe if someone's in a different location and you call them on the radio and say, hey, we've, we've got some elk over on Bean Ridge or whatever you call mm -hmm. it. Um, come over here. Let's meet up and go after them. At that point, it'd be legal. If they came over and you guided them in at that point with a radio to that specific animal. So they've got a cow tag, right? And say there's 50 elk. Um, which elk are they after, right? Well, if you guide them in on that group of elk, and specifically put them on an animal with radio, then that would be, I, I believe that would be really illegal. So, but to get people to rally to come over because you've seen animals, that that's not guiding you in on a specific animal. If that makes no, sense. No, it does. Yeah. Um, the. I guess the other question, the whole reason we have this technology committee, what would you say the number, What what is the main goal? What are we trying to accomplish with, when we put this committee together and you were all there, what was the mission? What were we trying to accomplish? So we were tasked with the wildlife board in 2021, right? I think 2021 um, to put a, a technology committee to look at the effectiveness of technology. Um, and one of the major things was to uh, create more opportunity without creating more harm. So um, it's, a, it's a social thing. Mm -hmm. I, I feel it's a social thing, um, but it has some common sense factors in there as well. Um, a lot of this stuff hasn't been studied. Um, so that, that's a lot of our comments is studying. And I thought back and, and how, how I, I know there's, in fact, someone's in here that has had an email that sent to us and, and I think they'll have an opportunity to comment here. I just, <sighs> I mean, how do you study these things? And how, I don't think there's any way. I, I just think some more common sense and experience tells us these things are right. effective and we're what we're trying to, to accomplish. And so I I like the proposal and I think it's good. Anyway. Create more opportunity without harming the resource any more than it is. Uh, we all want an opportunity to hunt. Technology, you look at technology. Um, so if I'm 44 years old, say, you go 30 years back. I mean, you look at technology 30 years ago and then you come back every 10 years and then look at the new technology and you look at the new technology in the last five years, where are we headed? I mean, we're 10 years ago, if you told me that I had a shot an elk at more than six, seven, 800 yards, I'd have been like, there's no way, there's no way. Today I can do that. A lot of people can do that. and. 
we never thought that was possible before. And with a bow, with a muzzle loader, and I'm shooting out to 400 yards, easy with an off the shelf muzzle loader, off the shelf scope. Um, nothing terribly fancy about it, just going out and figuring out my dope. And so technology is, it's headed into the unknown, but we know it's going there. And so it's our task as a technology community to get ahead of that, to try to get ahead of that um, before it's, before someone says it's too late or, or whatever. Again, it's a social thing, so it depends on who you ask. Do we have any other questions for members of the RAC? Gabe, you've done a good job. That's a comment. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. We're going to go to questions from the public. We have, oh, I missed Matt. I had one on there. Then we'll do that. That's twice, Ross. So if we do this um, primitive weapons thing that we're proposing um, at this meeting, what is the timetable for potentially introducing new primitive weapons hunts? So we wouldn't be able to introduce them in 2023. It would be something that the biologists could have a tool in their bag to say, this unit's struggling or we want to try this. Um, here and so it'd be next year would be the earliest they'd be able to implement that because it's a little too late in the game to be creating new opportunities. All right, we'll get to the comments and then we'll go. All right, we'll go to the public questions. It looks like we have one from from Ross who is here on his anniversary. That was not a wise move. <laughs> My wife is far better than I am, so she supports my hobbies. I actually have two questions, hopefully that's all right. One, just on the electronic things, there's scopes now that are Bluetooth compatible, not a direct code. It doesn't really specify or clarify on that. So if you got one of those scopes that I got in my rangefinder, boom, I hit it, it gives me my dot, and I don't have to do anything. Does, how does that fit into that technology? That, that would be illegal. Anything that your scope, if it communicates with your phone or your rangefinder or with anything else, that's, that would be deemed illegal. That'd be electronic. Okay. The other one, sorry, I love the hypotheticals, right? Not using radios, not talking somebody in. What if you've got somebody going in and they bust an animal? At that point, they can somebody say, hey, they busted, they're gone. What is, how's that going to follow up the time for a situation? Because at that point, you're not taking an animal. It's gone. Hey, come back again. So take, take is not, it, take is pursuing an animal. I mean, it's, it's harvesting an animal, pursuing it, um, going after it. So if you're going after an animal, um, it's a good question. It's a really good question. And it's too late to answer that. So ask that at like 830. <laughs> um, so, and you bust that animal and it runs off. Um, Sorry, that's a, okay. tough, that, that's a tough question. We have Kyle Maynard has a comment. I guess if you if you harvested that animal because someone telling you it's behind you and it's running off and you harvest that animal, then that would be take. That would be. I, I don't understand that. More of my question. Okay. Sorry, that I missed the mic. Which is, it leaves your, your like on an archer, you're done. But then it, yeah, that. Okay. Stop over. Yeah. Yeah, I think the stop's kind of. Is, okay. Kyle, is the question after you successfully harvested and you're looking oh. for for help quartering, or are you? Tried to harvest and and the animal is maybe injured and, and running away. Not even injured. I think he's referring that that someone's going in on it and you recognize that the deer's now left the drainage or wherever you're that and you basically tell them you're wasting your time. Yeah, it's it's not exactly that. So now, hey, hunts over, stocks over, you're done. Move on. You're not you're not pursuing the animal anymore. Right. Uh, I mean, that's a good question because uh, I guess at that point you can't take the animal. It's gone. Um, so, I mean, it's not too much of a concern from, from my point, but, you know, it's still in the realm of falling into this rule and, and getting aid and finding or, or approaching an animal or, or determining where it went. So um, I... In the rule definition, I've got the definition of stock. 
Stalk means when game has been located and the hunter engages in deliberate movements on foot in an effort to harvest the located game. Then, yeah, Gabe, I see what you mean there. I um, I agree. <clears throat> my big, my question. The reason I chimed in is I was just. I uh, misunderstood the question whether or not the harvest had actually occurred. Yeah, I would think once that thing's running off, the harvest is off the table. Yeah. And, and as long as they don't harvest it right there, you know, so that's probably just being a good friend, you know, saying, hey, come get, come have a pet. After you sit and laugh. Let's have a pet, yeah. <laughs> Let him go. All right. <laughs> I think we got another question. Yes. James. Um, as, state, this is, will you state uh, name? My, my name's James Higley. I'm just here representing myself. Um, the question I have is regarding electronic uh, bow sites. And I'm assuming you're talking specifically about a Garmin type site. Garmin or the, the dial types that have a digital readout? Okay, okay, great. So what the basis of your, the, the proposal was to give the animals that's too much of an advantage of, of taking an animal. Is that, is that, is that accurate? Yeah. Um, you're a bow hunter. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? You bet. So what, this might come up in my comments though, too. What's the biggest, <laughs> what's one of the hardest things once you're within range of an animal, what's the thing that busts you the most? Uh, movement or, or scent movement, right? Yep. And so with, uh, with a range finder in your, in your site, you essentially can draw back, depending on how long you can hold your bow. It's different for everybody. I could hold it a lot longer when I was younger. Yeah, yeah I was going to say that. Um, and that animal moves, you're able to range that, right, with that sight? You bet. And continue to range it. So that takes away movement, which we felt that that gives more uh, opportunity to harvest. And, and, and I, I will agree with you, but, but this, this kind of goes to my comment. I, I just I purchased one three months ago, and I laid down a bunch of dough for this yeah. site, uh, and 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 I'm not I'm not suggesting that uh, pity on on me. Uh, that that's not my point. I guess the point is as I rolled my eyes every time I saw one, and it's like oh come on guys, this is this is archery hunting. But what what piqued my curiosity is when when I was talking to a, an archery shop owner, and he was talking to another guy about these these sites, and you don't. You would rather be here than guiding elk, uh, cow elk hunts. I would rather guide cow elk hunts than decide in my bow. Um, I, I I can't stand the process of a multi pin. It's it's frustrating to me. And what what piqued my curiosity was he said you shoot from two spots and you and you're kind of you're kind of dialed in uh, based upon the parameters of your draw weight, your draw length, that weight of your arrow. There's all these technology things that go into to that similar to a slider guide or a slider site. And so um, that, that piqued my curiosity. So I, I investigated it more. And what, I, what, it, what it boils down to me, uh, for me, is that- James, I, I, are you okay to use this as your comment? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm fine. No, I'll, I'll be okay, so. I, I've got three points to make, is that number one, I still have to get close. And number two, if, if because I don't have to rearrange and all that other kind of stuff, I'm gonna be, precise within the range that we're at. And, and then it's gonna be dialed in uh, exact. So that the chance of making a poor shot, uh, those odds have gone down. And then the last thing I would say is that th this electronic bow sight, it's more restrictive than a slider sight because these 90% of the, these sites that are installed on bows right now, you're only gonna get 80 yards out of that site. And that, that's 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 a comment. So if if you and then it will aid in the recovery because it'll take you to the spot where where the deer was or the animal was that you shot. So if if it helps in being more accurate and it helps in putting you on the spot where you're going to start looking for blood and 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 potentially aid in that recovery, I don't know that that that's all bad. That that's just just my my opinion and comment. Thanks. Yeah, yeah we kind of. Mixed all those to, together on comments, but all right. So make sure we're in question period, right? Okay. Um, so, oh, thanks. I'm Cooper Smith. I'm representing myself. 
um, what studies, and maybe there wasn't any, but what scientific studies were done specifically on archery to prove that the take in game has increased since electronic sites were introduced in 2018, five years ago? I, I don't think there's been any studies done on that because technology, it's advancing so fast. So what would you specifically look at something from a year ago that's already advanced or something that's three years ago that's now obsolete. And so it's just, it's a hard thing to study, but I get it. If there was a study out there that could say year and A on that, then that would help. Okay, gotcha. That's all for questions. I'll save the rest for comment. Any other questions? You can pull that up. All right, we're gonna go. <laughs> <laughs> There's no more questions from the public. We're gonna to go to our public feedback. Okay, we had 13 respondents for this item, nine strongly agreed, eight somewhat agreed, one neutral, five somewhat disagreed, and 13 strongly disagreed, including the one disgruntled guy. Whose comments you should actually read if you can, they're inappropriate for me to share. Um, <laughs> the weighted average is 2.86. Um, some of the some of the uh, the feedback has has honestly already been discussed actually with the um, with the uh, <coughs> sites and aid in the take and some of the confusion about uh, the general season muzzle order and so on. Okay, all right. Um, we've got quite a few comment cards on this particular item. Uh, first one that's right in front of me is is Daniel Richens. And then we'd have Tom Land on deck. Cooper in the hole. I'm Daniel Richens here representing multiple CWMUs. Um, and I should have come up and asked you a question, but um, my comment more goes back to uh, the cow hunt, the, the radios and previously given us a tool to, ac to actually harvest these cows. I mean, if that, if we're using radios is off the table now, that's another tool that, you know, we use them all the time in, in walking our cow hunters into cows. And if that's, I would hope that that's something that we look at putting back in our tool bag, even if, if you're over objective and you have to meet certain, you know, trying to get our objective down, like we use them all the time. If they're off the table, then our harvest is even going to go lower than it already is. Um, and then you mentioned a, if you're walking somebody in on an animal, well, what if someone wounds one and we're watching it and it goes away? Can I say, I've got him gut shot laying there, I can walk him in, or that's illegal too? Yeah, that would be take. But that, I mean, you're still pursuing yeah. that animal. And so, that, I, get, I get what you're saying yeah. on that. So, I mean, I just, I think that, you know, I've got six, five brothers. Uh, we all go out hunting general season hunt. My dad's got 33 grandkids. Everybody's packing a radio around, making fun of each other. I mean, we're, I just feel like at some point we're taking so much of the experience away from, you know, the handful of guys that's got an earpiece in and going after to help get them a deer or help get them whatever. I think, I mean, I'd like to see the radios taken off. And and if not for that hunt, take it off for the, for the cow hunts that are over objective that we need to use them to get them, put them back in our toolbox so... And that's just going to hurt us worse on that. That's my opinion. So you, you, uh, you guys use a lot of radios. Yeah, we, we use radios all the time. We used a lot of radios growing up, back when you had the antennas. Remember yeah. that the Radio Shack, yeah, dime pieces. Yeah, every um, grandkid's got a radio hanging around his neck, making fun of the other grandkid, and mm -hmm. that's half the. I mean, there's more, more joking on that hunt. Oh, it's yeah. not so much about killing the deer, walking in somebody on a deer, but. I mean, I don't even know, and then I, I don't know how you're going to enforce this law it's, on private land and everybody using it. And and with me running the CWMU, and I mean, I think it's pretty unethical for me to see a deer that's got shot and not be able to tell the guy where it is to go finish it off. You know, I mean, that, that's, that's my it. opinion. What's so. your radio handle? You've got to have one with that many people. I'm sure, it's not your first name. <laughs> I'm, I'm a bit, I'm the. Patron, big boss. That's my Patron. Patron. <laughs> Patron. There's always a handle. There's always yeah. a handle. 
I think Gabe is junior mint. Are you junior mint? <laughs> What's that? What's your radio handle? Doc. Doc. Or Bowling. Hey. Jolly Rancher. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Tom. I'm Tom Land with Deseret CWMU. Daniel just took 90% of my talking class. First one being the wounded animal deal. You know, that, that's really getting unethical when it comes down to that. You know, you made the comment. Well, we made some of these technology changes, and I couldn't hear what you said because to give more opportunity, is that what you said? I mean, you guys didn't put anything in there about turrets. You started talking about shooting long range and stuff. Somebody having radio and talking somebody in is still pretty tough archery. Shooting an elk or a deer at 1,000 yards, other than learning how to shoot your gun, that may be out of the technology that's talked about as much as as radios but the cow elk harvest i mean that's essential to us to be able to i mean i got 310 cow hunters and they want me to take four or five hundred if i can't do it with radios and the two guys with their oxygen bottles that we're trying to get around to them that's just devastating i can understand okay let's take a technology that's 40 years old 50 years old you talk about walkie talkies that ain't a new technology it's been around forever following montana and alaska you know, we got bigger elk, bigger deer, better hunting than Montana does, I think. But I'm in a it's pretty bad keep place. That. But if we're taking away from antler hunters, I can understand it. It's a technology that maybe we don't want. But for the antlerless, where we're doing it, it isn't a hunt, it's a management tool. We need to look at separating those out. Thanks. <clears throat> All right. And I've got. Uh, Go ahead, and then we'll go from there. Thanks, Cooper Smith, uh, representing myself. You mentioned earlier that we do we didn't do any studies, like scientific studies, about harvest rates and increasing take or anything like that. You guys probably all read my email where I did as much study as I could in the matter with my, you know, lunch break at work. Um, but I looked over the past ten years of, of archery rates across the state of Utah for the general season deer hunt, and in the last five years, so twenty th or sorry the year 2013 to 2018 that's the segment that i took we were at 21.69 percent success rate average across the state um, and then when the garmin was introduced in 2018 i use that as a benchmark because that's what we're comparing is is uh electronics on both sites specifically i expected to see some form of a bump some form of a one percent two percent some form of an increase to show that this particular technology is actually increasing harvest rates Instead, I saw the opposite. We actually declined down to 19.33% when you average it across the five years. So I get it. There's a lot of, uh, it's way more factors than just, just the electronics. But if the electronics in the hands of a hunter was increasing the rates, I would expect to see an increase in harvest rates, even micro percentages. And, and I just didn't see that. So, so I'm hoping that we don't throw around uh, you know, wide sweeping uh, laws and regulations that restrict our already toughest sport or already toughest weapon um, just to protect against the unknown, things that we don't know. And instead, we wait until that technology comes up that does drastically increase the harvest rates and does drastically reduce hunter opportunity and address it at that point in time. But that's, that's really all I'd ask. Thank you. The last two, we have Kevin Norman. And then we'll go to Ross Worthington after that. As you know, last time when Derek brought this through, I was up in arms. But Gabe, you're a lot bigger. You could kick my ass off. So really <laughs> nice. Um, Kevin Norman representing SFW. Um, we support these recommendations. Um, speaking for myself, I actually sat on this committee and and uh, feel really good about where we landed on everything. Um, we put a lot of time, we met multiple, multiple times since last debacle and uh, everything was above board and, and feels good. Um, speaking to a few of these things, um, you know, the, the lens we did try and look at everything through and I think they all check the boxes, um, things we can maybe eliminate or reduce to, um, increase opportunity while maintaining quality. 
and I think all these things check those boxes. Um, I can sympathize with, you know, you guys that just bought a high dollar site. Um, but at some point we have to draw the line and we, and we kind of felt like we didn't want to address every little technology that comes out from now forever. And so that's how we come up with drawing the hard line on some of these things. And, um, Daniel, I know you can still have your radios and your, all the grandkids can still talk trash and have a good time, but when it's time to hunt, it's time to hunt. So I think it, everything landed in a good spot and uh, I was grateful to be a part of that. And thanks for all your efforts, Gabe and Derek and the crew. So thanks. Ross Worthington, just represent myself. Um, first of all, I, like to thank even though I don't know if anybody's really here just the committee I had the opportunity to sit on a different committee and I can just attest to the efforts that go into those to try to find a good balance um, and technology is definitely going to be a, a hot button um, because it's yes while there is some scientifics and some some harvest to it a lot of it is a social aspect to it um, and sometimes I, there's things that there's nothing I'm totally against um, but there's questions where I run into where you can probably say as law enforcement out there, the law abiding citizen is going to follow it. Those aren't the problems. It's you're making, my concern is, are we making criminals out of good, honest, and innocent people with some of these things? And, and again, the committee's taking the time to try to look at that and try to account for all that um, and try to find an equal balance. Um, I think there needs to probably be a little more clarification on certain things and, and get more specific on some of the electronics and some of those things so that somebody doesn't get caught with a, a, a gotcha. But appreciate, again, the committees, honestly, the division, the rack, late night, appreciate everybody's time and sacrifices. And I know you guys get beat up pretty bad and um, unjustifiably so. So appreciate you guys. Thank you. Our last comment card, Travis Hobbs. Thanks, guys. Um, I just wanted to say I thought you guys did a great job on the technology committee, and I, I do wish in a lot of ways that we could maybe look at limiting technology more. I think there's this mix where somewhere technology and opportunity, like to maintain quality, something has to give up. Like we can't keep going down the roads of thousand yard rifles, <coughs> all these crazy technologies that are coming out with archery hunting. Um, somewhere quality is affected. It's hard metric to talk about the quality of animals we see on the landscape right now and how much is that diminished and a lot of the i think a lot of the people that are upset with quality available um i think a lot of things could be i think it could be fixed with uh limits and technology so i think it's good however one concern i have is i think the cwmu operators that made comment may bring up good um we almost look at some of this stuff on uh, when we're trying to control cow elk numbers or like these antlerless harvests, maybe there should be some exemptions on some of these rules where we do, I, maybe it doesn't apply across the board. I don't know how that would ever work, but it does make me wonder if something, there should be some exemption. I know feeding, for instance, I was the biggest, I hated bait. I, I, I can't tell you how much I hate the old rule about allowing bait. I was completely, I. I I, I would fight that till the day I die. However, some of these guys, I know that if they could shoot cow elk on a feed row, it would make a big difference. So there's some things that like there's give and take. Um, and in those situations, I don't know how that would work, but it does make me wonder about that. So thanks. All right. <clears throat> thanks everyone for their, for their comments. Um, we'll now go to the rack for for comments, Brian? I guess I, I'm still a little bit unsure about this idea of, I'm hung up on the restricted aspect of, it says restricted, but then a hunter can choose to use a more restrictive weapon system. Uh, but then when it says um, a person may not use any weapon or device to take big game other than those expressly permitted in this rule. So I feel like that expressly permitted would limit a guy from using some of these other ones, kind of going with what I understood you to say that, well, you can go more restricted, but then a guy's going to say, but it's not expressly permitted, that it feels 
that there's a mismatch there. Yeah, that's a sorry, I'm getting messages from my chief. You're busy telling them. Wyatt, did you want to speak to that? Yeah, I'm happy to. It's Wyatt Bubak, Chief of Enforcement with Division of Wildlife. Um, I think the, the question that was originally posed was restricted muzzleloader and specifically the will lock. I think you mentioned match, uh, a match lock and that, if I understand, if I recall correctly, that is in that definition of a, of a restricted muzzleloader. The will lock is something that the committee didn't discuss, uh, probably because it's a more antiquated version and would be something we're willing to put into that rule um, to clarify, but uh, it would be limited to those types of uh, weapon types, the ones listed in there. Um, but we we could certainly add the will lock type of stuff to, to address that type of a primitive weapon in that restricted muzzleloader. Okay, so Wyatt, while you're on the line, can I just ask you a quick question? I'm sorry, this is Randy. Yeah, um, go ahead, Randy. Would it be for enforcement reasons, would it be practical to put in their language saying a more primitive form of a muzzleloader or whatever that might be? As far as just having that be the definition rather than calling out specific types? Yeah, like leave, leave the wording the way you have it now, but add in or a more primitive um, or restrict, uh, probably primitive is a better word, or a more primitive version of the muzzleloader since the muzzleloader is already defined. Yeah, I think that's something we could discuss further. Um, I hesitate to say yes here just because I w I'd want to make sure that there's not something that would fall through the cracks that I'm not thinking about off the top of my head. Um, but it, it's something we could discuss and, and um, look into a little bit more. Off the top of my head, I can't think of anything that would create pause for me outside of possible, you know, if you have like a, a musket like they used back in the pioneer type days, that, that, that kind of a flared end and if that's an ethical weapon to use that would otherwise be defined or meet the definitions of a muzzleloader. So those are types of things we'd need to explore, uh, but I would not say that's off the table if that's something that wanted to be recommended. So I, I would plant a seed and say maybe try to think along those lines for when it gets to the board. That's that's fair. Who does? Matt. Oh, Matt. Sorry, I missed that. Yeah. So going back to uh, Daniel Richardson's comment, like if we were, how would you, um, how would you try to implement that? I mean, we've been talking about this as kind of an across the board restriction. Would it be fair to make this restriction for antler game hunts and exempt antlerless hunts? How would that work to help with this kind of this Caltech thing and carving out an exception for them? Uh, I don't know, that could be kind of messy because right now we're allowing people to hunt. If you've got a fish lake deer tag and you've got a fish lake cow elk tag and you're in your inside your cow elk unit, you can harvest your cow during your deer hunt. And so that little, little nuances like that could create problems with that. Um, could, could you specify it being an over an objective unit uh, be, and the hunt being used for a management tool. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I, I guess if you're talking about radios, they sound very effective at killing animals, right? Oh, there's no doubt. Yeah, there's no doubt. And so you can kill cow elk without radios to stalk someone in. There's a whole huge group of cow elk. If you're on Deseret, probably sometimes those groups get over three to 500 or more. So moving someone in on an elk like that, I'm on the Johnson CWMU a lot. And I take a lot of kids hunting that I pack on my back that can walk 50 yards, that can't get off a side by side. And we kill elk every time without radios. And so this isn't a make or break thing in my mind. It's it, if we don't allow it, we're still killing cow elk. If we do allow it, we're still killing cow elk. And so 
what can be done. Yeah. I mean, all these things I think could be done. I just don't just, it's just getting there. Go ahead. I'd like to make a comment just about how excited I am at this. This is something ever since we put scopes on muzzle loaders and it felt like really did away and moved our archery, you know, as technology has progressed away from having a traditional or a primitive type hunt, the prospect of recognizing subsets of those groups of weapons and then the potential use of that as a tool to manage our wildlife in the future is incredibly exhilarating and exciting. And I really like this because as I understand it, it's in large regards a win for those people who have the modern inline muzzle loaders. They can still hunt with those with the exception of this issue of electronics on, an, on a compound bow they can still hunt with those weapon systems. So with very minimal taking away, almost nothing like that, we're acknowledging this other subset of those and it just feels very validating, very refreshing, and the prospect of someday having restricted or primitive weapon hunts restored in the state of Utah is really wonderful. And I appreciate, like has been said, everything that the committee has done. Even the definition of the restricted archery of a single stringed bow, you know, I really like that. It's, it's, I'm excited about this and I really hope this passes. Um, I go, man, I've gone, the gamut in my mind going through all of this um, because the discussion can go so far in every way. What's more ethical? What's less ethical? What's more effective at killing animals? Is that more ethical that way? Um, I like most of what's in there. Um, I, when you get to the bottom section on the, on the, memo with it and that what i don't like to see is most of this is pointed towards the take of game until we get to drones and then all of a sudden everybody's illegal and so if, if it's a hunter we understand that this rule exists if it's not people are going to be breaking the law in ignorance they don't even know it exists we already have wildlife harassment laws on the book so if they're harassing wildlife nail them for that but adding another one here so i would rather see verbiage in here directed to the take or attempt to take a big game, if that's what the focus is gonna be. Um, but with with some of this, and and I guess this is in my mind, this is where I go back to this balance of quality, increasing opportunity while pr protecting quality. And I agree with that. We have gotten very effective at taking the cream of the crop. But then you flip this over to an antlerless hunt. It's a population control hunt. That's what we're doing. Um, I'm not sure what quality we're protecting there. If we just want the biggest cows or the fattest or the oldest, um, but that's not, it's not the same purpose as what we see in a limited entry type hunt. And so I don't know that I really agree with the sentiment of, yeah, you can have someone with an archery deer permit and an elk permit on the same unit and it makes it a little bit confusing or ambiguous or whatever that that's already there in the law using radios and so i i don't know that i'm not opposed to the idea of exempting antlerless hunts from the use of radios honestly i, I think we can still try and address really what I, I feel like the purpose of the committee was going towards in trying to protect quality in that form but that's going to be on an antler or a horned game Unless somebody really wants a doe with really big ears, I, I don't know what else quality we're trying to protect there. So. I think maybe a precedent to that would be the hunter orange requirement that you have to wear hunt, uh, hunter orange and, or as long as there's not a center fire rifle hunt happening there to his point about the overlap between buck deer and cow elk, just word it so that there's no 
as long as there's not another hunt happening, as long as you're only hunting for a cow elk, then you can use your two-way radio. I'm thinking most people are gonna end up chiming in on this. Uh, one, let's get it out of the way, this is social. The 90% of this is social. Um, and I agree that there has to be a line drawn in the sand somewhere, there just does. Um, I'm not concerned, I mean, the point of this is hunting. It's hunting, it's not killing. Even if it's a, a, even if we're trying to whittle down cows or does or whatever, it's still a hunt. Um, and that's what I, I'm gonna fall back on. So I, I actually like that part. The only part about the radios that gives me pause is the wounded animal, but I don't know how you get around that. Um, I, I just can't think of a good way to get around that because every animal has been wounded um, if you put that clause in there. And so it will be used for everything. But um, so I, I like it overall. I, I think it's not perfect, but I like it. And I think it has to be established somewhere. And to say these technologies aren't being used because it makes us more efficient killers is silly. Of course it is. We put a scope on our rifles because I can now shoot 800 yards, which I will never do. Um, but that's why we do it. I, I'll be honest, I wish you guys had gone one step further and um, changed this ruling on scopes for muzzleloaders. Muzzleloaders wasn't that long ago. I mean, muzzleloader is a 100-yard weapon, and now it's a four or 500-yard weapon, and those kill rates have gone up. There's no question about it. So I, I, I like it overall. I do have one quick question for you, and I apologize. I d forgot my um, iPad, so I can't read the definition. Um, but with the scope, with everything is self-contained in the scope for a rifle, is the definition clear enough that that will not allow a scopes that have the range finder built into it? Uh, well, to me it is. Uh, electronics is electronics. If it's speaking to anything, um, if it takes a battery other than an illuminated reticle, again, it's hard to find a scope, a high quality scope without an illuminated reticle. Um, so as long as, so that's my concern because those are, those types of scopes are going to come very, very common in the yeah, very they, near future. They, they've come out and they're very, they're starting to get very common. You're right. So, and like I said, and I, I forgot, so I don't know what the definition is on that. Um, that would be my one concern. That would be my one concern of looking at being able to change something yeah, to, with, to stiffen that up a little without bit. Without us, I mean, the only thing that I can think of that, could maybe be better on that is the definition of electronics. Um, but electronics, man, it's got to take a battery and it's communicating with something other than a scope. So um, as a law enforcement thing, it, we'll just have to get used to type of scopes that could that have that capability. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you. I've got a thought. What if? During the, if we had a CWMU, if we're trying to use radios and we feel they're effective and we have CWMUs that are cooperating and trying to kill more elk, if they could, what if we had it to where they could apply for a COR that they could use it for that? That way it's not all the way across the board to everyone, but there's something that could go it through. It could be a variance on a variance. On top of a variance. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's something that we could, it could be, monitor looked at and if we feel it's effective and then they're cooperating but let's help them out i like it if i could make a motion that's what i would say in it so one thing someone asked a question about a turreted scope i know it's going to come up maybe someone's listening that won't ask this in another rack because we got four more but every scope's turreted whether it's exposed or not and so that was the problem with regulating a turreted scope. Or you got a BDC reticle. I mean, I can do that in my muzzleloader. I can go in that and I can tell you which line's 100, which line's 175, which one's 380, you know. Um, and so how, how do you get across that? And so with the turreted scope, those were the, the obstacles that we had to, that we discussed and had to overcome on that one. Um, I remember the last meeting last fall when 
you guys were told to go back to the committee and try and clean things up. And uh, I think you've done that. Uh, I to to speak to Brad's point. Uh, yeah, we could we could get out in the weeds here forever. Uh, what I'd like to do is give a cow elk a radio, and so it can radio its buddy and say the hunters are coming. Uh, I got a hunter over on this ridge. What we've done and what you guys have tried to control, and I think what we need to control, is hunting and make it hunting. Uh, I get that, that we're trying to control cow elk on CWMUs, but I also agree with you, I've hunted Deseret. Uh, the guy they put me with said, Kevin, what are you after? You want an old cow, you want a young cow? I said, I want a trophy cow. And he looked at me, the 20 year old kid, and he said, uh, what do you mean? I said, I want a trophy cow, and that's one right next to the road. We killed one right next to the road. Um, I had three sons with me, uh, two son-in-laws and my son. We all killed elk, we all killed them. We didn't need, need radios other than they did say, we've got elk in this canyon, and I get that. But to, to have to be specifically led to an elk or any other animal just doesn't make sense to me. Uh, none of the other technology, uh, we, we've, none of the technology helps the animal. It's making the hunter more lazy and making it easier for the hunter. And it's about time we change that. And I think you guys have done a great job. I hope we head that direction. I've got a couple more comments. Um, one thing that came to my mind that I, I, and maybe it was from the work session yesterday and just a little bit the irony, um, because I think sometimes when, especially with the technology discussion, we get wrapped up into how much of, a, of an effect is each one of these things having? And the truth is most of them are probably having small effects, but them together in combination, I think is where we see the effect. The flip side of that, and, and this goes back to permit number uh, discussions and everything else is um, at the end of the day, the weather killed more animals this winter than any technology has in the past 20 years. So what we're discussing has an effect. Each one does at a certain extent. Um, I guess what I what I hope we don't have in our mind is we put restrictions on technology and we've saved the herds because that's that's not going to necessarily be the case. So with that in my mind as I think about this there's kind of subsets and so as I'm kind of starting to try and think about motions in different parts. We've got this part about the restricted weapons group, and then we've got kind of the rest of the proposal where we're talking about two-way radios and these different parts that way that where this restricted weapons part doesn't really have a, a lot of immediate bearing on the other the other part of it. So in my mind, there's like a, this pick. subset. So I'm almost thinking we you want to make be, a motion on that, on the, on the restricted weapon. I would like to. Yeah. If we're at that Let's point, we, I, I think we are. I'd like to make a motion that we accept the definitions of restricted weapons with the addition of the word match lock when it talks about muzzle loader equipment. We're in here. Understand that. We have a second. I'll second that. I'm shocked you didn't go further. <laughs> so we have a motion to accept the proposal of restricted weapons with the addition of adding, I don't even know what the will lock, match lock, match lock. to the definition of a restricted
I just want to make sure I got the motion right. That's to state the motion one more time. Or do you have it? The motion to accept the definition of restricted weapons with the addition of the term match lock. Anything, anything else after that? To, to Randy's point of going further, Oh boy. <laughs> let's just <laughs> let's define what that is. Just define. Yeah. So under restricted weapons, we've got what is this line? It says restricted muzzle loader equipment means muzzle loader, and then it says ignition system, which is limited to traditional flint lock, musket cap, or percussion cap, which must be entirely visible. I would insert the words on that line A there match lock as an ignition system as an ignition system okay and then i have something to say during comment okay so we have a motion made by ryan to accept the definition of restricted weapons with the addition of of the term match lock as an ignition system to the definition of restricted muzzle loaders and we have a second by randy all right you have a comment on when you've already okay. well, <laughs> well, just, have, well before we call for a vote do we want to is there any discussion or questions or clarifying questions on the motion just to randy where he says i'm surprised you didn't go further i was i was tempted to go further um you know to gabe's point about nothing in this section prohibits the use of a more restricted weapon system but after hearing was it wyatt yeah his, his kind of his explanation of where you get into that with that conflicting line earlier in the rule of only those listed below, but then if later in that same rule we're saying, and you can use anything else that's not expressly listed here, I couldn't find a way to reconcile those in my mind. So Randy, that's where I left my motion with that. So we're gonna write if I call for a vote. Right here. <clears throat> Brian. Yes. Brad. Yes. Jamie. Yes. Paul. Yes. Randy. Yes. Emily. Yes. Matt. Yes. Mike. Yes. And Kevin. Yes. This motion passes unanimously. <coughs> Need to talk now. We've taken the restricted weapon. Now we'll talk other. Since we're breaking it up a little bit, I actually would like to, to add one, and not to the restricted weapons, so because that part's said and done, I believe. Um, when I installed um, Brad's um, iPad and looked at the definition of this under the rifle with the scope, I, I think it would, it would open up and allow things um, beyond just a traditional uh, scope to be used. So I'd like to make the motion to include an additional restriction on scopes to exclude scopes with any built-in electronic functionalities outside of the illuminated rectangle. That's a motion then. That's a motion. The point of that is to avoid, to eliminate the built-in range finders. It's kind of common, right? Well, it's not common, but they're out there. This is gonna become mm -hmm. very common. That's not restricted the way that it's presented it right now. It doesn't specifically say it, it doesn't range say. Finders. It says no electronics attached, no attached electronics. Yeah, see, so, yeah, so that's my concern when I was reading it. It says no attached electronics. Mm -hmm. Which would I come? The gun, a scope is attached to the gun. Um, any other electronics you want to put on there? So, because right, right now, you, your example was, and maybe my concern's wrong. But your example was, hey, it's, it communicates Bluetooth to my phone or whatever, which is very common for long range shooting right now. But there are very good scopes right now that the range finding is built in within the, the scope itself. And it's going to become more and more common. And that's oh, yeah, my the concern. The Burris Eliminator, the Swarovski, there's, and, there's a couple others. And there's some really good ones hey. coming out that are remark like i want one for prairie dogs um, but, um, hey that's not big game but no it's not big game so it'd be good but that that's my concern i'm afraid the attachments leads too much 
ambigu ambiguity in what is and is not. So that's my logic. And again, so the motion, if you were to say like attached or internal electronics, or how would you have a motion? I just want to make sure that yeah, and I, we recognize the motion and I can call for a second, but will you restate that? I think what I said also excludes scopes with any built in electronic functionalities besides illuminated reticles. Any questions? Yes, in addition to what's already there. Just just adding line C or, or whatever it is. I think that's on line B. Yeah, well. okay, should we call first? Do I have a second on that motion? I'll second that. Okay, I have a motion by Randy and a second by Ryan. <clears throat> so we're all right if I call for a vote on this motion. All right, Ryan. Yes. Brad. Yes. Jamie. Yes. Paul. Yes. Randy. Yes. Emily. Yes. Matt. Yes. Mike. Yes. And Kevin. Yes. This motion passes unanimously. You guys are gonna make a heart of me in the wildlife board meeting yeah. when I try to explain all this. Okay. That's good. I like it. I feel like the southern rack. Okay. <laughs> Uh, any other questions or discussion or other motions? I would make a motion that we accept the remainder of the recommendations as presented. So I have a motion by Kevin to accept the remainder of them of the rule as has been stated. Do I have a second? I'll second it. And I have a second by by Randy. I'm getting tired. I can't remember names. All right. Must be close to midnight. So we have a motion to accept the remainder. A second. Any discussion before I call for a vote? Recognizing that would we would be done. No more talks on radios or anything else. I'll say one quick thing. I don't think we can get better. It's not perfect. I don't like everything in this, but I don't think there's any way to go back and rehash everything that the committee did. So I, I like the compromise. Okay. Everyone, all right, if I call for a vote? Ryan. Yes. Brad. Jamie. Yes. Paul. Yes. Randy. Yes. Emily. Yes. Matt. No. Mike. No. Kevin. Yes. Did you keep track of that? Because I didn't do a very good job of that. So we've got. I think Dan did. Dan, so we've got three against. Yep. Motion passes four to three. Um, I'd like to hear those who voted against, and I'll start with, with Brad to my right. Um, I do like most of what's in here. There's just those few things I'm, I'm still not necessarily on board with the way the two-way radios were presented. I think there could have been a little improvement there. Um, and just some of this verbiage to go across the board that way with drones and other stuff. I think it, it had good intention, but I think the way it's written was, could have been better. For me, it was the bow site. I don't think the bow site increases um, harvest. Um, I've spoke to Kent at length about um, turreted scopes to Randy's benefit, and there's no evidence that, that we're, in, we're, we're shooting any more deer with that than we were without that. So for my, for my, uh, my no is, is, is revolves around the arch. Archery is difficult, and for me, I just didn't think that was enough to. That was the only hang up I had in the whole program, though. I didn't really have too much problem with it. All right. And Matt. Yeah. So, my issues, I guess, I guess I have two issues. One is the wounded game thing. I think we need to be doing everything that we can to um, finish off wounded game. The second issue I have is 
the whole CWMU harvesting cow things. I think there's probably room for a carve out there, and this really doesn't allow for that. Okay, and I misstated that it was actually passed six to three, not four to three. I forgot to count our two online, but either way, the motion passed six to three. Um, <clears throat> so with that, that was our last agenda item. Uh, thank everyone for being here. We at least made it before midnight. Um, I guess we're not done yet. I'm hoping that I'd get a, make a, begin a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion that we adjourn. Everyone in favor, say aye. Aye. Thank you, everyone.